our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner. Welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner. Welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner.
Hello, and welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Please use the Q&A pod or the chat pod to ask questions of the presenters. Type your questions at the bottom of the pod. Time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. If you would like to make the presentation slides full screen, click the outward four arrow button in the upper right corner of the pod containing the slides. To return to normal view, click the inward four arrow button in the upper right corner. So this is all. Welcome to our event. We will get started in just a few minutes. Audio for this event is being provided using your computer speakers. Telephone audio is not being provided for this event. Please ensure your speakers are not muted and you have adjusted your volume accordingly. Welcome everyone to day one of a generic drugs forum, GDF 2024, Regulatory Considerations to Enhance Generic Drug Access. Good day, good afternoon, or good night, depending on where you are. And it is so exciting to see so many of you here in the room here with us and also online. We certainly appreciate your commitment in attending this event from wherever in the globe you may be and overcoming any scheduling challenges you may have had. Please note on the screen the on-site Wi-Fi log information here for those of us in the room. And it would also be available at the registration desk. And I believe you have copies on your individual tables as well. It would help if I hold this right side up. OK, here we go. My name is Brenda Stoddart, and I'm with the Small Business and Industry Assistance Program, fondly known as SBIA, which operates within the Division of Drug Information, which in turn resides in FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research's Office of Communications. It's a great pleasure, along with my colleagues from the offices of Generic Drugs, Pharmaceutical Quality, Compliance, Center Director, and our own SBIA staff, to be with you here today. And added to the excitement, if you're not excited, I'm going to try to make you excited. Added to the excitement is the fact that this is our first hybrid GDF post-COVID. So I appreciate the, you know, we all appreciate the effort you have made to attend this. And it is extremely heartwarming to see everyone here face to face. We entreat you to make the most of this opportunity. Interact with the subject matter experts while they are available. That's, that's one of our primary reasons for having this conference here in hybrid today, so you can have that interaction with our subject matter experts. Learn all that you can learn, submit your questions, and network in person as well as online. And we are also offering YouTube live streaming, so please go ahead and tell your colleagues so they can also attend, should they not be able to be here in person. Here are our learning objectives, and they are our overarching learning objectives, which are applicable to both conference days. And we are extremely pleased to announce that this two-day event 
offers a total of 13.25 contact hours for physicians, pharmacists, and nurses. The CEs are available to all real-time attendees who self-identified as healthcare professionals during the registration process. Now, please note the emphasis on real-time and registration. What this means is that no healthcare professional CEs can be given to those who attend via YouTube or for post-event viewing. And uh, this is something that is required for offering healthcare professional CEs. All faculty are expected to use generic names. If trade names are used, those of several companies should be used rather than only that of a single supporting company. CE faculty speakers are required to disclose to the attendees when products or procedures being discussed are off-label, unlabeled, not FDA approved, and any limitations on the information that is presented. We do have a spectacular lineup of speakers and the planning committee, speakers and CE consultation and accreditation team have nothing to disclose. Participants must attest to their attendance and complete the final activity evaluation via the CE portal, which is ceportal.fda.gov. For multi-day activities such as this, participants must attest to their attendance and complete the faculty evaluation for each day. Final activity evaluations must be completed within two weeks after the activity, and there are no exceptions to that. So in this case, the deadline for this event is April the 25th, that's two weeks from tomorrow. We apologize in advance, but we are unable to make exceptions to that deadline. Pharmacists should note that failure to provide your correct NABP and date of birth information in the required format may result in the loss of a credit for this activity. Your NABP profile number should be the six or seven digit profile number assigned by the CPE monitor and your date birth should be in month, month, date, day format, example 0410. Do not provide the pharmacy license number. Please click the My Account tab and then navigate to Edit Contact Information to verify that your information is correct. Physicians and nurses may then view or print the statement of credit. Pharmacists should log into the CPE monitor six weeks after the last session of the activity to obtain their credit. And please, pharmacists, allow, you know, allow a significant time, at least two or three weeks, to check before contacting us because it is six weeks. To simplify things, each night, SBIA will send one email to all the attendees, uh, registered attendees of that individual event day, and that email would have information on the healthcare professional claim code and also the survey link. I strongly encourage you to complete the evaluations upon receiving that email as we know everybody's busy and you may miss the deadline and we won't be able to help you if you do so. <clears throat> Excuse me, now we're going to do a poll, which um, I try to do each time we have one of these conferences. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the question is, hopefully everybody has had their coffee. The question is, how many SBIA conferences have you attended? <clears throat> Your options are, this is my first one, two to five, six to 10, more than 10. Oh, I attended almost all since they started in 2010. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So uh, as we give the online participants time to participate, let's see in the room. Show of hands, A, this is my first GDF. Higher, 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 let me see, okay. All right, good enough. Uh, two to five. Excellent. And yes, yeah, speakers, you can participate as well. And more hands, right? <clears throat> C, six to 10. All right, we're getting there now. Okay, more than 10. Good, we have some fans. All right, and most since 2010. Scan in the room, nobody. Okay, well, um, you have some ground to make up, so I suggest attending all the others. Um, let's see what the poll results are. Nothing online? Anybody online <laughs> that's been with us more than, than 10 um, since 2010? 
Excellent. Thank you, nine people who answered uh, for being with us since 2010. For, uh, next time you know, guys, be in here. I'll have a, a, a something for you from SBIA, if that's enough of an enticement. All right. So what you're seeing here is that um, as of this morning, we have, we have over 3,500 registrants representing 80 countries. And of these, over 43% self-identified as small businesses. And of those, over 26% report having one to nine employees. Now, these stats, as you could imagine, continue to be extremely reassuring to us at CEBA, at C I want, I'm mixing up all my words, at CEDAR SBIA, as they confirm that we are indeed reaching the small business sector of our audience, and they also validate our mission and the very existence of the SBIA program itself. And what you're seeing here on the screen is a snapshot of our geo map for today's event. And this map always is very exciting, especially at GDF. Um, for it provides a very powerful visual for the impact and extent of our outreach. And moving on to the next slide, here is uh, a slide with our QR codes, SBIA QR codes for social media avenues. It will also be displayed during breaks in case you want to take a snapshot and go directly to a platform. Okay, let's go with some logistics as it applies to everyone. Here is the link for a one-stop shop for answers to your technical questions, for downloading the files, accessing the silver link that we alluded to earlier on to obtain the certificate of attendance and so much more information. For online attendees, this is the same page that you used this morning to access the event. So please bookmark this page if you haven't done so already because most likely you'll be needing it over the two days. If you have any technical questions about this conference, please check there first and you will most likely find the solution. On the one-stop shop page, there, is, there are session evaluation links, that's for the actual sessions, and there's also a final evaluation survey which will be activated this afternoon. And as mentioned previously, the email that we send every day at the end of the um, conference will have that survey link as well, should you miss it during the course of the day. Upon completion of this survey, an attendee can then download a certificate of attendance, which may be used in support of RAPS, SOCRA, ACRP, and SQA, SQA credits. Now, the trick is that once you can, the, the certificate must be downloaded immediately after completing the survey, otherwise you lose that opportunity. Even if you do not want or need a certificate, we ask you to please take a few minutes to complete the survey as your feedback will help guide the design of our future events. Note that both the evaluation and certificate are only available for two weeks, which means that the deadline date is April 25th. That's the same deadline date for submitting your healthcare professional CEs. As a reminder, all these sessions have been recorded. It'll take us a couple of weeks to process the recordings, but you will soon be able to access them from SBIA's page, which I truly and sincerely hope that everyone has big bookmarked already. And that is there on the screen, fda.gov slash SBIA. In the interim, the YouTube link for both days will be posted on the One Stop Shop webpage at the end of the day. For our online attendees, submit your questions on screen uh, using the on-screen link and QR code. Now for our in-person attendees here, here is this uh, on-site Wi-Fi info. It's on your desk this table as well. We are having, we have two mics for when the QA session begins, one on either side of the, of the podium. Please line up to those mics uh, and we're expecting very, uh, very energetic response from the in-house people with your questions. So have your questions there. And as a reminder, please silence your phones. Use the internet sparingly so we can get the best broadband um, quality that we could for those online. Now you're on your own for lunch, but as you know, there are many eating establishments within the area. But today we're also offering a $20 buffet, it's, I think it's an Asian um, cuisine buffet downstairs in the restaurant. 
And if you need more details, please check at, your, at the registration desk. Tomorrow we will have something similar. Um, I think it's a box sandwich lunch, I'm not quite sure. But check at the registration desk. And we have only one hour for lunch. So please you know, um, plan accordingly to be back in time for the afternoon sessions. And then today, at the end, when we finish up today, we will be having a networking gathering at 5 p.m. downstairs in the lobby. So hope to see everyone there. And OK, so let's talk about our upcoming events. These are SBIA uh, hosted events, and many will be um, applicable to this audience. On April 25th, we'll be holding a webinar of facilitating generic drug product development through product-specific guidances. We also have a talk today on product-specific guidances. Then on May 9th, we'll be talking about redesigned pre-submission meetings in Kadu for three, benefits for under submission and approval. On May 16th, we'll talk again in another webinar. We'll have our statistical considerations for pre-marketing risk assessment. On May 29th and 30th, we'll be holding our annual regulatory education for industry, fondly known as READY. And our theme this year is innovation in medical product development. And for those of you who are not familiar with this particular conference, it's an annual conference, which is um, we're having three tracks. Each track is dedicated to that particular center. We have drugs, devices, and biologics. I also call your attention to our Cedar Learn resource, which is fda.gov slash Cedar Learn, which has additional tutorials, uh, not only for industry, but definitely including industry. Here, I want to call your attention to CEDARS uh, enhancing adoption of innovative clinical trial approaches, where CEDARS is gathering information from internal and external stakeholders on the barriers to and facilitators of incorporating innovative clinical trial approaches in drug development. And uh, you still have an opportunity to post your public comment because that deadline date is April the 19th. Uh, you can always uh, scan that QR code and get more information as well. So now is the time for me to acknowledge those individuals who were instrumental in making this event possible. And many are listed here, but there are so many more, as anyone knows, who are, you know, so many people are involved in planning and bringing to, to execution a conference of this magnitude and the number of speakers that we have. So I would like to start with a thanks to OCOM's management, with us, whose support this program would not exist. We have Jane Denton Wiley, who is a OCOM director, Morgan Jerick, a deputy director of OCOM. Then we have my immediate boss, who is Mary Kremsner, the division director, Division of Drug Information, and Catherine Chu, who is the uh, division deputy director, DDI, Division of Drug Information. Then, of course, we'd like to thank Elon Murphy and Mike Kopscher, uh, the directors for the Office of Generic Drug and Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, respectively. We'd also like to thank our keynote speakers, who are uh, Elon Murphy and Susan Rosenkrantz. A big, uh, uh, my personal gratitude to Debbie Cordaro, Tony Schumer, Adam Fisher, Karen Ireland, and they were instrumental, they, uh, not instrumental, they created and designed the agenda and coordinated with all the speakers. And a heartfelt appreciation, of course, to the faculty for your commitment and dedication in sharing their expertise with us all and being here in person over the next two days. Sincere thanks go out also to OCOM, the entire OCOM and our fellow DDIers because they support this program in myriad ways. We also want to thank our support staff, administrative outside there, and also our technical staff here in, in, in the room. Most of all, our acknowledgement and thanks to you, the audience here in person and online, uh, who took time out to attend this event, regardless of the inconvenience of the various time zones. And, and believe me, we do not take this lightly. For without you, the conference would not be possible and definitely would not be the success that it has been throughout the years. And just out of curiosity, um, for those in-house, when was the first generic drugs forum held? I know none of you have been here since 2010, but it was after 2010. Any idea? OGD? 
2013. So that was just after the Kadufa amendments um, were implemented. So we have been doing this annually for a while. Alrighty. I think I'm making good time here. Now I'm sure you're ready for us to launch fully into today's agenda. And as a reminder, all our speaker bios are available on the One Stop Shop website. But for now, I'm honored to introduce our keynote speakers. Our first keynote speaker is Elon Murphy, MD, who serves as the director of the Office of Generic Drugs in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. This office is responsible for the review and approval of abbreviated new drug applications. And OGD's mission is to ensure, through a scientific and regulatory process, that generic drugs are safe and effective for the American public. Dr. Murphy began her career in 2007, and in June 2023, she became the director for the Office of Generic Drugs. Dr. Murphy oversaw the implementation of the generic drug use of fee amendments goals and reviewed management activities. She was instrumental in leading OGD's 2021 through 2022 reorganization and was integral in the creation of the first generic drug global cluster, a collaborative forum for the world's leading regulatory agencies. Our second keynote, Dr. Susan Grosenkrantz, who, is, who serves as the acting deputy director for science in CEDA's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. She is performing this role in addition to serving as the director for the Office of Product Quality One, also within OPQ. Dr. Rosenkrantz has spent more than 20 years, you, you can't believe that if you see her, more than 20 years at the FDA serving in a variety of senior roles, including the acting director for CEDA's Office of Generic Drugs in 2022 to 2023, as well as the deputy director for generic drug chemistry in CEDA's former Office of Pharmaceutical Science. Please, audience, help me welcome our two esteemed keynote speakers. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Captain Stoddard, for SBA's continued support of the generic drug program. On behalf of the Office of Generic Drugs, thank you all for being here today at the 2024 Generic Drug Forum. I'm honored to open this event alongside my colleague, Susan Rosenkrantz from the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Today, you'll hear presentations on resources, best practices, common deficiencies, and opportunities to engage with the agency from pre-ANDA to post-submission um, post activities. Now, before we jump into the many insightful presentations and actionable tips you'll hear from the CEDAR staff today, I'd like to set the stage by providing an overview of what I see as our goal in holding this event, how collaboration and using FDA tools for success can result in increased approvals, the forum is an effort to help applicants submit complete and high quality applications, to maximize the efficiency and utility of each assessment cycle and to reduce the number of assessment cycles, facilitating timely access to safe, effective and high quality generic drugs. Maintaining a collaborative working relationship between FDA, researchers and industry is one way I believe we can accomplish our mission. Discussions like this one will, we will have today play an important role in helping guide and generate new and better ways to support the development of more efficient bioequivalent approaches, advanced analytical tools, and other innovative methods that can lead to more complete ANDAs and more first cycle approvals. For the next few slides, I will talk about some of the people at the heart of these valuable collaborations. First, I like to ground our work and why each of us in the generic drug program knows why the work we do is so important. I'm proud of our We Are OGD campaign, highlighting personal stories from our staff on why they are dedicated to serving the public health mission and particularly the generic drug program. This quote is one of, from one of our staff members. And for me, I do appreciate firsthand that not all brand name drugs of the same class are equally effective or safe for an individual, and that having generics for individual brand name drugs is important. One particular experience comes to mind and years ago, uh, I was hospitalized and you know, during the hospitalization, I was given uh, IV uh, medication. And then after discharge, I was switched to an oral version of that uh, same product. But when I went to my pharmacy, they didn't cover the um, brand name product. And so, you know, 
<laughs> trying to be a little bit, you know, practical, there are other products in the same class, and you know, I was okay with it being switched to something that was covered under my insurance. So that night, you know, after dinner, I took my medication. Uh, but you know, in the middle of the night, I woke up feeling really na nauseated, and that was different from when I was in the hospital. So the next day, I re-challenged myself, said, "Okay, is, is this a you know, a one-time thing, or is this a thing with the medication? Because the medication was the only new thing." And sure enough, the middle of the night, I woke up feeling sick to my stomach. So the third night, I de-challenged myself. Right, I held the medicine, and you know, I felt much better. So then the fourth day, I just paid, you know, for the brand name product out of pocket. And, you know, fortunately for me, you know, I am, I am able to afford that. But, you know, for, I think for a lot of uh, families, that would be a challenge. And, and so just, you know, my personal experience in that, you know, having generic products um, it really can, you know, be, make a difference for individuals. I can tell you what a professional, insightful, and thoughtful group of employees FDA's generic drug program is made of, and I'm excited for you to get to spend the next two days hearing from them. OGD is a high-achieving, resilient group of dedicated professionals. It's really a special place to work because the staff fully embraces our mission of supporting the public health through access to generic drugs. Our current strategic plan focuses on fostering an engaged organizational culture that attracts and retains a highly qualified, talented and diverse workforce empowered to carry out the mission of OGD. We do receive messages of appreciation for the important and insightful work of the various OGD employees that you interact with. Here's a recent example of messages to people who make an approval possible. Similar to the new drug program, we want to ensure that patients are heard. We have a number of opportunities to engage and empower patients for example, there are opportunities to participate in the public meetings and conferences held by FDA, as well as public solicitations for input on the user fee program negotiations. GDUFA research programs support the investigation of generic drug development challenges and help us establish and clarify the scientific framework for ANDA development, submission, and assessments. We have a public meeting each year to help set research priorities. Additionally, we meet with stakeholders on a regular basis throughout negotiations. Per the GDUFA commitment letter, not less frequently than once every month during negotiations with the generic drug industry, the Secretary shall hold discussions with representatives of patient and consumer advocacy groups to continue discussions on the reviews, on the reauthorization, and their suggestion for changes. OGD funds research grants that investigate specific views and concerns from patient perspectives and further identify allowable differences where patient preferences uh, can help set research priorities. Patient contribution spans across all stages and we encourage integrating patient input into generic drug development and decision making. In the translational stage, collecting patient experience with brand drugs can assist developers in creating a more robust development pathway, ensuring product development success. The pre-market stage user experience of proposed generics helps assess the allowable product differences that could impact patient perception and patient's ability to accurately use the drug product, or even further identify potential safety issues or unexpected safety considerations. In the post-market stage, patients are integral for safeguarding the American public by sharing and reporting safety information and drug shortage reporting to secure our supply chain. Next, I would like to talk about our tools for success, which is really what this event is all about. Here's an excerpt from the email from industry that I thought captured the collaboration and tools we're discussing today, as well as the outcomes we're all looking for. They write, the first generic represents years of engagement with FDA, made possible in part thanks to a multitude of tools available through the GUDIFA program, including post-CRL teleconferences to resolve several complex issues and insights provided through GUDIFA science initiatives, all culminating in complex synthetic peptide product approval. The Generic Drug Forum is all about providing actionable advice, so here are some tips from the PREANDA, ANDA, and suitability petition side of things. For product, you know, the first thing is, remember, we have a lot of different meeting types, so request the appropriate meeting. For example, for product development meetings, include specific proposals and questions. Make sure you include sufficient rationale and support for each of your questions. 
avoid questions that are review issues, and then choose the best meeting format for your questions. And in terms of pre-submission meetings, we do offer face-to-face, -face, video, or in-person meetings. These tend to be not question-based, but really are an orientation to your submission. And uh, let uh, and assessors kind of know if there's any unique or new information in the submission. And you want to consider submitting meeting package in the format of a draft presentation. And then we have many resources, and, and some of them are listed there. In terms of and a submission tips, I can't emphasize enough, submit a very clear and thorough cover letter. It can save both you and us a lot of time. Make sure it's very um, clear on what is being submitted. State if the submission includes proposed labeling carve-outs. We strongly recommend the cover letter attachment, especially for unexpected or unsolicited information. If you're including data, submit it to a um, uh, discipline. And then if you're um, you know, submitting a large, complicated submission, having that cover letter and attachment really helps to identify what's in there. And it helps to uh, allow better triaging uh, of your submission. Make sure you respond thoroughly to any sort of um, requests. Monitor any updates. Make sure you know what uh, changes are happening to your RLD, USP, guidances, orange books. And make sure you submit uh, timely lit litigation-related updates. And make sure that you remain in good standing. Recently, we've had a lot of data integrity concerns. Uh, make sure you coordinate uh, DMF changes. And then pay attention to patents. In terms of some uh, GUDUFA 3 enhancements, we do have goal dates for product-specific guidances after a complex product for a new drug application. Our first goal dates uh, hit us in October 2024. Uh, we do have new product-specific guidance meetings. And uh, there's a uh, guidance out there uh, providing more information on that. And then uh, I think people have appreciated that and assessment team members are included in pre-submission meetings. Suitability petitions are a request to submit an ANDA with certain differences from the RLD. Examples are differences in strength or dosage form. The current GDUFA agreement has goal dates associated with suitability petitions as shown. Furthermore, we will prioritize suitability petitions for certain reasons, such as mitigating drug shortage situation or addressing a public health emergency. For FY24, we've had so far 80 submissions. Half of the responses issued uh, have been issued already, and more grant decisions were issued as compared to denials. Now, um, we do have enhanced communications for complex generics. Remember that for before an application is submitted, we do have pre-submission meetings. You can use this when you do new or unique studies for complex generics. And information, uh, information share does help FDA form an assessment team early and coordinate between product development meeting and application assessment. After your application is submitted, we do have, uh, as an example, post scientific, um, com post complete scientific response meetings. After you receive a CR, you can use this uh, when you need to do new and different studies for complex generics and get advice before conducting those studies. The GDUFA Science and Research Program is an essential component of FDA's mission to protect and promote public health. Each fiscal year, multiple sources of public input and experts across the generic industry collaborate to establish science and research priorities that can help expand and accelerate patient access to generic drugs, especially for the most pressing scientific challenges with generic product development. Scientists and clinicians from industry, academia, and FDA then strategically design studies so that the research outcomes enable us to build scientific bridges across the knowledge gaps, which then advance research in those areas. These outcomes are published in an annual report describing the corresponding activities. The outcomes of this research help FDA establish uh, efficient new pathways for pharmaceutical manufacturers to develop generic drugs that were previously challenging or infeasible to develop. Innovative tools enhance the understanding of complex drug interaction and mechanisms, aiding in the development of generics for more intricate formulations. Robust scientific approaches, including analytical techniques and bioequivalent studies, enable accurate assessment of generic drug quality and equivalence. Meanwhile, this field of regulatory science constantly evolves, 
integrating technological advancements and innovative research methodologies to streamline the approval process. Challenging ourselves to continue to push for generic drug access for all kinds of products expands patient access to their medications. And we see this happening right before our eyes within FDA's adaptive and robust generic drug program. Let me highlight just a few of the many results of our FY23 GDUFA science and research. PSGs are a key tool FDA provides. The outcomes from the GDUFA funded research expand our understanding of drug products and often contribute to the development of advanced methods to characterize product quality and performance. FDA's recommendations related to bioequivalence issues and product quality are communicated to the generic industry through continued publication of new and revised PSGs as well as gen uh, general guidances for industry. PSGs help prospective generic applicants understand our expectations, focus their product development, and prepare for ANDA submissions, and mitigate certain risks associated with generic product development. The development of these PSGs also facilitates our assessment of ANDAs for corresponding products once submitted. The recommendations in many of these PSGs would not have been possible without the uh, GDUFA Science and Research Program. In terms of the pre and product development meetings, in addition to forming, informing FDA guidances, GDUFA research also allows us to evaluate whether proposed BE approaches presented to FDA in a pre and product development meeting are likely to be suitable or not. GDUFA research outcomes enable FDA to provide prospective ANDA applicants with timely technical advice that helps them prepare their submissions in a manner compatible with the most current scientific insights and regulatory expectations. We've collaborated for many years now with the Center for Research on Complex Generics to expand our collaboration and communication with industry, help industry develop complex generics and implement FDI scientific insights and help inform the GDUFA research. We've also taken on new efforts and pilots, such as the Model Integrated Evidence Pilot. We also provide information in a variety of ways, including online and in our OGD annual report. We hope you'll continue to keep yourselves informed through your RPM, our public con uh, communications, and events such as this. In fact, as uh, uh, Captain Starter pointed out before, we have uh, other important meetings, workshops, and webinars coming up in the next couple of months. And I hope to see you at the next week's Modified Release Oral Drug Product Workshop. We are grateful to all our collaborators within FDA and at institutions around the world and throughout the global generic drug industry. We are committed to continue providing tools and support as you do the important work of developing generic drugs and getting them to the market. Last year, we had a record number of approvals considering both originals and supplements. We remain confident that our collaborative engagements are the most effective way to bring about access to more generic drugs. Thank you to the dedicated FDA staff who organized the Generic Drugs Forum, especially those in OGD, OPQ, and SBIA. And thank you to the members of the audience participating today. I do hope you find this forum to be informative and insightful. And now I'm honored to pass the mic to Dr. Susan Rosencrantz. Thank you. Thank you, Alon, and good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about key components to ensure pharmaceutical quality. Uh, but before I begin, I want to share with you a motto that we have in my office, and that's everyone deserves confidence in their next dose of medicine, and pharmaceutical quality assures the availability, safety, and efficacy of every dose. From our perspective, pharmaceutical quality is not just one thing. It's an array. At a minimum, it includes quality management, process quality, and product quality, as you can see in the center of the slide. The FDA assesses drug product quality in applications, and we monitor pharmaceuticals in the US market to ensure that each dose 
is safe and effective and free of contamination and defects. This gives patients confidence in every dose they take. Process quality is controlling manufacturing risk to provide a quality drug product from the raw materials to the packaged product. This is what gives manufacturers confidence at every batch they release to the market. The FDA assesses process quality in applications and we monitor and inspect facilities manufacturing for the US market. Then mature quality management on the other hand, uses a performance and patient focus to identify areas of improvement and implement changes accordingly. This is what gives manufacturers confidence that every batch they make will be acceptable to release to the public now or years from now. The Office of Pharmaceutical Quality's mission at the FDA is to ensure that quality medicines are available to the American public and this mission is fueled by two implicit beliefs, that medicine should be of high quality and that medicines should be available. So to start my presentation, I'd like to provide first an explanation of the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, or we refer to it as OPQ. Um, and it's in FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR. Then I'm going to talk about the importance of quality communication and quality innovation in ensuring that quality drugs are available to the American public. So CEDAR established the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality in early 2015 to give the center one quality voice, creating a uniform drug quality program across all sites of manufacture. This means that OPQ oversees domestic and foreign manufacturing and every type of human drug product, including new and generic drugs, biologics and biosimilars, as well as over-the-counter drugs. So OPQ's core functions can be broken down to assessment, inspection, surveillance, policy, and research. And all of these functions work in harmony to provide regulatory oversight across the globe and across the life cycle of drug products. OPQ strategic pillars of collaboration, communication, engagement, and innovation support these core functions. Collaboration strengthens OPQ's culture and relationships with FDA business partners. Communication allows OPQ to elevate awareness and commitment to the importance of pharmaceutical quality. And innovation works to promote the availability of better medicines for the American public, while engagement forges partnerships and connections with public stakeholders. In order to advance our field and the way we work, OPQ recently underwent a, a reorganization. Our new organization structure shown in this slide increases our ability to respond to changes in the evolving workload, complexity of pharmaceutical supply chains and public health emergencies. Currently, I'm serving as OPQ's acting deputy director for science and have five offices reporting to me. That's on the um, right hand side of the slide. And with the reorganization, we created three new assessment offices, the offices of product quality assessment one through three, where staff will focus on the entire life cycle of a drug product from IND to NDA to ANDA to all the post-approval changes after approval. These offices have divisions comprised of both ANDA and NDA units. The offices of product quality assessment one and two focus on product quality assessment for small molecule products. And the office of product quality assessment three focuses on drug substance assessment for both large and small molecule products. The collective goal of these new offices are to improve the life cycle approach to quality assessment, enhance our skills and approaches 
and increase consistency across product types and user fee programs. OPQ research staff from the Office of Testing and Research and the Office of Biotechnology Products have been consolidated into a singular new office, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Research, or OPQR, which you'll see on the left-hand side of the slide, they're highlighted in gold or yellow. And this, what this has done is brought our talented scientific experts together in a single office that will help us, and this helps us foster new collaborations and tackle emerging challenges. Staff in this office will perform drug quality surveillance testing and laboratory-based investigation to support OPQ and CEDAR for public health emergencies. This staff will also provide consults, collaborative research opportunities, and scientific training for FDA's employees. Change is an important part of evolution, and we in OPQ pride ourselves in creating a more agile, connected, and influential organization. I want to emphasize that OPQ's reorganization will have little to no impact on how we interact with industry. OPQ will continue to support the human drug user fee programs, including GADUFA for generics, PADUFA, and BASUFA for biosimilars. We will continue to interact with industry across these programs, and submissions and communications between parties will remain the same. For example, applicants will continue to communicate through the Regulatory Business Process Manager, or RBPM, uh, assigned to their submission. We aim for consistency in industry interactions, creating a smooth and dependable experience for all those involved. So now I'd like to focus on OPQ's quality communication efforts as it relates to the generic drug program. OPQ puts out two public reports on an annual basis. One is our annual report on the state of pharmaceutical quality, which presents key data characterizing drug and manufacturing quality. Some key findings that I'd like to highlight in this report are that the number of surveillance inspections of human drug sites tripled from fiscal year 21 to 22. And Cedar's site catalog has more than 4,800 manufacturing sites, with over 40% in the US. Of these drug manufacturing sites, 40% are in the no application sector, indicating that products manufacture manufactured at those sites are marketed in the US without approved FDA applications. So this sector includes over-the-counter monograph products, marketed unapproved prescription drug products, as well as homeopathic products. The remaining 60% 60 60 of sites manufacture at least one application product, including ANDA, an NDA, and a BLA. Furthermore, CEDAR's product catalog, which is an inventory of all registered products, contains over 140,000 application and non-application products, including more than 12,000 ANDAs, 3,500 NDAs, and 325 BLAs. The second public report uh, is OPQ's newly released annual report, which describes our performance over the year. In 2023, OPQ performed the quality assessment of more than 1,100 pro product applications that were approved or tentatively approved. This includes 118 new drug applications, almost 1,000 generic drug applications, and 29 biologics license applications, including biosimilars. Notably, OPQ supported 55 novel drug approvals, products with new molecules not previously submitted to FDA. And this number includes 17 novel biotechnology products. 
These novel drugs were approved for treating a variety of conditions, including a rare genetic neurological disorder that affects brain development and anemia caused by chronic kidney disease. While all applications submitted under user fee programs are assessed using target timelines, OPQ expedites assessment to address critical public health needs. For example, to address drug shortages and rare or orphan diseases. OPQ performed 359 expedited quality assessments to address drug shortages and 28 priority assessments to address orphan diseases for which there are few, if any, treatment options. Although OPQ is responsible for ensuring that human drugs marketed in the U.S. meet quality standards, collaboration across the FDA is vital. OPQ supported several efforts related to the FDA User Fee Reauthorization Act of 2022, which includes GDUFA 3. We participated in negotiations leading to a commitment letter and developed policy materials, including guidances that you will hear more about from my OPQ colleagues today. OPQ's GDUFA 3 efforts help ensure that the American public has access to safe, effective, and high quality generic drugs, with emphasis placed on high quality communication, submission of high quality applications, and availability of high quality drug products. One example of high quality communication is product specific guidances, or PSGs. As I'm sure you're aware, product-specific guidances describe FDA's current thinking on types of studies suitable to support development and approval of high-quality generics. An example is cyclosporine ophthalmic emulsion. Over time, research developed a strong body of knowledge for this product, which led to not only the PSG publication, but also the approval of the first such generic in 2022. For certain types of generic products, such as cyclosporine and other complex products, the development of a PSG can be challenging. In general, complex products account for roughly one in every four products, with most of them in the non-oral categories. FDA internal labs, including OPQ's new Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Research, have been very active in working with OGD to develop scientific knowledge and evidence to support PSG development. I also want to acknowledge some of our DUFA 3 policies where OPQ collaborated with OGD and others to develop. We've released draft guidance on facility readiness and goal date decisions, pre-submission facility correspondence, and reviews of drug master files in advance of an ANDA submission. These GDUFA 3 documents largely relate to how industry communicates with us and how we communicate with industry. We also released a public manual of policies and procedures, or what we call a map, on assessing reclassification requests for complete response letters with facility-based def deficiencies. This map is also about being transparent and explaining how we make these sometimes difficult decisions. You will hear much more about policies related to generic drugs throughout this event. And in my next few slides, I will cover innovation. I'm gonna focus on a concept needed to handle the rapidly evolving pharmaceutical manufacturing landscape. And that's our initiative related to quality management maturity or QMM. QMM will not be covered elsewhere during this year's forum, so I wanna make sure I highlight how this program is beneficial for improving supply chain quality. QMM aims to encourage drug manufacturers to implement quality management practices that go beyond CGMP requirements. Adopting mature quality management practices supports a more reliable drug supply chain by reducing the occurrence of quality-related failures. It can also improve the ability of establishments to maintain performance during expected and unexpected supply chain disruptions. 
It's important to understand that quality management maturity or QMM is not just one thing. It's actually an umbrella concept and many elements fall underneath it. For example, quality metrics. They're a key aspect of a mature pharmaceutical quality system. But QMM is about much more than any one of these elements and it entered the discussion in full in a 2019 cross-government report on drug shortages. This report identified root causes of drug shortage, shortages and potential enduring solutions. Specifically, it found that the market does not reward manufacturers for a mature quality system that, focus on, that focuses on continuous improvement and early detection of supply chain issues. And one recommended solution was developing a system to incentivize drug manufacturers to invest in achieving QMM at their facilities. Since the publication of this drug shortage report, consensus has been building on the importance of a QMM program. Most notably in fiscal year 23, the Pharmaceutical Science and Clinical Pharmacology Advisory Committee voted unanimously that CEDAR should establish a QMM program to incentivize mature quality management practices. I want to point out that QMM can really be viewed as a rare win-win-win solution, as nearly everyone benefits, patients and consumers, industry, and FDA. It enables patients to have more reliable drug products, providing them more confidence in their next dose. It enables industry to continually improve, and it rewards so-called good actors in the market and it enables the FDA to deploy surveillance and inspection tools more effectively. A cross-functional team to facilitate the development of the QMM rating program has been formed at FDA. And as we continue to build this innovative program, we will engage with stakeholders. Between October and March of 2022, CEDAR worked with third-party contractors who executed two pilot programs aimed at assessing the QMM of drug manufacturing establishments. And as a result, in January 2023, we established a white paper, or, I'm sorry, we published a white paper on the lessons we learned from these pilot programs. Then in August of 2023, CEDAR published another paper shown here in the middle of the slide. This paper outlines the focus areas for developing the protocol to assess the QMM of manufacturing establishments. In the fall of 2023, the FDA solicited comments on CEDAR's QMM program via a public docket, and the feedback received is informing the continued development of this program. And then most recently, as part of our continued public engagement, we announced a voluntary QMM prototype assessment protocol evaluation program. We received 20 requests to participate and have identified the nine participants that we can accommodate. Through this evaluation program, industry participants and FDA QMM assessors can work together to drive proactive, continual improvement in the pharmaceutical industry. In closing, let me share with you some of the quality-related topics you're going to hear about over the next two days. Here's a list of the topics covered by OPQ speakers. And as you listen to all of the presentations during this forum, I ask that you step back and consider for a moment just how much effort goes into developing and re regulating generic drugs. Achieving pharmaceutical quality requires the commitment of regulators and manufacturers. Let's continue working together to assure quality medicines are available to patients. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Rosenkranz and Dr. Murphy for those keynotes uh, presentations and giving us that very pertinent and, and real-time overview of our Office of Generic Drugs, our initiatives, accomplishments, and our Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. We have had a slight change uh, on the published agenda and to, in, to give the presentation of drug shortages and generic drugs, understanding the, which will help us to understand the ongoing reasons for generic drug shortages as well as challenges to the U.S. drug supply. Please help me welcome Johanna Saliba, who is the team leader for drug shortage staff within the Office of the Center Director here at CEDAR. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Captain Stoddart. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today about shortages. Um, and today I will be um, discussing FDA's role in preventing and mitigating drug shortages. Um, and the objectives I, I have here um, is describing FDA's role um, in prevention and also our role as the drug shortage staff um, in CEDAR and also understanding um, the ongoing reasons for drug shortages, as well as new challenges to the U.S. drug supply. Um, our mission is to prevent and mitigate and alleviate drug shortages, and our priority is to ensure that um, patients and providers have access to medications that they need. Uh, just a brief history about the drug shortage uh, program. Uh, it started in 1999, um, actually started with a half an FTE, um, and now we have grown to 15 staff uh, members. And I, I do want to highlight, even though it's 15 staff members, we work with a large group of people within FDA that work on a particular shortage. So it's not, you know, we facilitate the shortage issues, but we work with a huge staff within FDA to address any particular issue. Um, and then also, um, we were elevated into the center director. We were under O&D, First Office of New Drugs, um, but we were elevated to the center director in 2014. Um, I also want to note that there is a separate shortage staff uh, within the Center of Biologics, as well as um, the Center for Devices that handle shortages for biological drugs, as well as um, devices. Uh, we did have a huge increase in shortages in the 2010-2011 period where we had two manufacturers shut down um, and that created a, a large number of shortages for us. And, and right after that, uh, President Obama signed an executive order on reducing drug shortages. And then soon after, we had the um, 2012 FDASIA legislation that required early notification uh, for manufacturers to report to us any disruption. And then recently in 2020, we have the CARES Act, which added notification requirements for API manufacturing and discontinuations and interruptions. Um, the drug shortage staff um, oversees and facilitates the resolution of all drug uh, shortages. And we do this by working with manufacturers on short-term and long-term um, strategies and address actual and potential supplied interruptions. We don't want to just address the immediate issue. We want to work on long-term issue to ensure um, future supplies um, also. Um, we work with various stakeholders to develop a risk-benefit analysis for each specific situation. We are also responsible for distributing information um, on our drug shortage website and we do this by uh, including information about that, that shortage uh, on the website. So we have a lot of resources on our drug shortage website. And we also work with professional organizations such as ASHP. Um, we work really closely with them and they have their own drug shortage website uh, as well as patient advocacy groups. When we share information with, with um, outside groups, we definitely uh, ensure that we do not provide any confidential information um, and, and ensure that that is protected for, for uh, companies that share information with us. Uh, shortage situations can be different and each can present its own challenge. However, the goal is to maintain availability while minimizing risk to patient. 
how does um, the FDA determine if a drug is in shortage? Um, first, I'd like to define, um, this is our definition of a drug shortage, which is a period of time when the demand exceeds the supply of the drug. We prioritize drugs that are life-saving and have the most impact on public health. However, we do work on and address shortages of all drugs. Um, this is a, uh, um, a slide of the supply chain and really it identifies our sources of um, information that we get for of supply and demand information. We have established a relationship with manufacturer, manufacturers as well as professional organizations and advocacy groups. Manufacturers are required to report to us the supply disruption. However, um, uh, demand and inventory uh, production information is voluntary supplied to us by manufacturers as well as um, wholesalers. We also use, um, use IQVIA database, which provide us with sales and market share data. Um, this helps us gain a general picture of the historical burn rate or usage of a drug, as well as most recent market shares for the current product manufacturers. And lastly, we have a public email account, and most recently, um, we have now a drug shortage, a public um, database where um, uh, patients and healthcare providers can report to us um, shortages. And we do, so we do explore and respond to every um, public notification that we receive. And these sources help us gather information and get picture of the supply situation. The notification requirements are, are summarized here. Manufacturers and applicants notify FDA of a permanent discontinuance and also any interruption in the manufacture of such products that will likely lead to a supply disruption. And that now uh, notification is required of uh, similar um, of the API suppliers. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we work with various parties inside and outside the agency. We gather information from outside stakeholders to get a clear picture of the supply situation and overall shortage. Uh, we receive shortage inquiries from the public, which includes um, healthcare providers and patients. Um, and we will investigate um, to determine if a true drug supply issue exists nationally, or it could be sometimes a localized issue. We meet regularly with our international um, partners um, to discuss current shortages. We share with them information on the shortages that we are experiencing, as well as um, uh, letting them know what are we what we are doing about um, to address the shortages. Um, also, we work with them when we are looking for an import to address a shortage within the US. Uh, we work with our international colleagues to identify a source that could um, help with the shortage in the US. Um, we also work with other US agencies, such as Center for Disease Control and DEA, um, on various um, shortage is issues. Um, and then, of course, um, we work with the manufacturers, not only the ones that are experiencing the issue, but also those that are um, could potentially uh, alternate suppliers that could potentially help or assist um, during a shortage situation. We really value the relationship um, we have built with industry and our communications and collaborations are um, very important for us and for our ongoing drug shortage work. Um, once we receive a notification, it is assigned to a, one of our DSS staff member to evaluate the information received and determine if, a drug sh if there is a drug shortage concern. DSS will also coordinate any activities and communication needed to address the shortage concern. If it is confirmed that a shortage exists, um, then we may post information on our website and we'll continue to monitor, monitor um, that particular shortage until um, it is resolved. What can FDA do to help mitigate, prevent, or limit drug shortages? So we, we really work closely with the manufacturer to address any issue or any help that they need assistance with, but ultimately the manufacturer must address the root cause. 
What we can require, as I mentioned now, we have the notification that they are required to um, uh, let us know if there is any potential for a disruption under the uh, 506C of the FDNC Act, as well as discontinuations. And also, um, they are required to notify us of certain quality events or manufacturing changes. But we cannot require a company to make a drug or make more of a drug, and we have no control over their distribution, where the drug goes, to which purchasers, and how it's distributed. Um, we prioritize medically necessary products um, as defined, um, a medically necessary product is defined as, you know, a product that is used to treat um, or prevent a serious disease or medical condition for which there is no other alternative uh, drug available and adequate supply that is judged by a medical staff to, uh, to be an adequate substitute. When we receive a, um, a shortage um, report, we, the first thing we want to do is um, we consult with our review division, the clinical division, to first find out if the drug is medically necessary. And that helps us prioritize our work as well as also make risk-based decisions. Um, we continue to work um, and encourage firms to report to us disruption, um, but we also now are um, encouraging them to report to us um, any increase in demand. Um, and we highlight that in the guidance to industry on notification of supply disru disruption but it's currently, it's currently not a requirement um, for industry to report disruption caused, uh, caused by increased demand. Um, we also expedite review um, of anything that would increase supply, such as additional lines, um, raw material suppliers, and, and we facilitate anything that will help facilitate to help mitigate and prevent a shortage. And we also expedite um, ANDAs um, in the that are in the queue for shortage drugs to increase um, longer term manufacturing capacity and prevent future shortages. These are just you know, highlighting more of the additional tools that we have. Um, first, in, in an emergency si situation, we have an emergency, emergency portal that we can reach out proactively to all of our industry contacts and um, requesting that they let us know if they anticipate any supply issues as a result of the emergency event. If there is a shortage concern for, uh, concern for a particular drug, we do reach out to the other suppliers to let them know of the shortfall, of course, without sharing any confidential information. And, we will, uh, and this will prompt firms to look at their demand and supply. Um, when a potential or actual supply disruption is reported by a manufacturer, we re request information from the manufacturers on anything that would mitigate or prevent a shortage, such as proposal to maintain availability while minimizing risk, um, such as validate, one example is validating a filter to, uh, to remove a particle um, along, and we, we put that in a, a Dear Healthcare Provider letter that is available on our website. Um, and, and that really what is regulatory discretion is the next point here is, is flexibility that gives the agency to maintain availability while minimizing risk to patients. The filter example I just mentioned is one example. However, there are numerous examples of regulatory discretion. And that includes use, use of an unapproved API possibly um, where a firm is working on a new um, uh, supplier. Uh, so that could um, also occur with the regulatory discretion. Um, of course, we um, ask for additional safety controls that can be used such as extra testing, third party oversight, um, extension of expiry uh, dating is another um, uh, thing that we could give regulatory discretion for, um, and that would be for specific lots, and those are the lots that are already in distribution. Um, so that means um, the company will provide us with additional stability data uh, that's submitted to us and reviewed by our um, review reviewers within FDA, and if it's deemed um, adequate, then those lot numbers will be posted on our website with the new um, expiration date. Um, temporary importation is our last resort, um, and that's when we look for um, an outside source um, where the U.S. manufacturers are no longer able to um, 
uh, meet the market demand within the U.S., we look for an um, ex-U.S. source. And um, when that happens, um, and you can see here several of the drugs that we have imported in the past, we also encourage those manufacturers um, of the ex-U.S. product to um, submit an application to FDA, and this way, if they're approved in the U.S., we have an additional source now that we can rely on uh, for future um, supply. Early notification is key to prevention. Um, the increase in early notification and our ongoing work with manufacturers has led to increased number of prevented shortages. The earlier we know, uh, the better chance of preventing a drug shortage. Now, some shortages can endure for months, for years, depending on the precipitating event. And of course, not all shortages can be prevented. Um, there are unanticipated events that can occur, such as public health emergency, um, manufacturing breakdown, and natural disasters. Other manufacturers also may not be able to meet the shortfall. They don't have enough capacity. Um, if a shortage cannot be prevented, we do encourage allocation by companies to evenly distribute supply. We also encourage, uh, but cannot require firms to have safety stocks and to distribute that safety stock inventory via direct distribution during a shortage to minimize hoarding and overbuying. Um, this slide, this is 2022 data. Um, 2023 will be out soon. Um, the majority of the potential um, or actual drug shortages um, that we see is related to quality issues and manufacturing delays. Um, however, however, recently also we have started to see an increased report of um, shortages due to increased demand. Some of our current challenges include, as I mentioned, increase in demand. Um, some of the uh, types of drugs that we're seeing increase in demand, um, uh, the narcotics, the IV fluids, with the weight loss drugs. Um, and also during an example of is even COVID, we've, we saw uh, an increased demand um, where a lot of hospitalized patients and there was a, a high demand for the drugs um, of critical drugs in, within the hospital. Um, just um, also loss of overall market capacity, um, uh, recent bankruptcy that we've had, uh, plant closures. Um, then we have the industry-wide short supply of manufacturing components and commodities, um, filters, glass, um, and stoppers. And then also we, we are seeing new quality-related issues found on inspection. Uh, and of course, as mentioned, impurities such as nitrosamine, that's been an ongoing um, issue also at the, um, that we are working on at the agency as a whole. Um, and also natural disasters, the recent tornado impact that impacted um, the Pfizer North Carolina facility. Um, and of course, the economic issue is that we have lack of market certainty to support investment and continuous improvement. What can industry do to help um, decrease drug shortages? Um, the role of industry is to understand the vul vulnerabilities and frailties of their supply chains. Um, it's important to communicate to us early on if, if there is a potential shortage issue. Provide us with a short-term and a long-term plans or proposals for addressing, preventing shortages while also working to maintain and improve quality. Um, provide us with information that we can post on the website when a shortage is uh, unavoidable, and also work with us uh, at FDA to minimize shutdowns and slowdowns that could lead to shortages, and um, adapt to more mature quality management practices, as mentioned. Um, some additional solutions, um, the risk management plan, and that was um, one that was required um, as part of the CARES Act of 2020, um, where um, there is a guidance that um, will um, have information about what to include in those plans. We want firms to have backup plans if there is a sudden manufacturing failure or demand increase, um, redundancy in manufacturing, um, additional lines, additional uh, manufacturing sites that you have um, as backup when, when there is an issue and more capacity, more overall capacity, um, 
of uh, additional manufacturers making critical drugs. Um, in the past, I've been with shortages for many, many years, but we've had drugs where it had five, six, or even 10 manufacturers, and now we're down to three, two, or even sole source. So that's very important to um, encourage additional manufacturers to come on the market for these vulnerable generic drugs. And then also focus on quality management, maturity, and continuous improvement. Um, I will end with just a quote uh, from Dr. Califf. He said, we have got to fix the core economics if we're going to get this situation fixed. And that's all I have. Um, thank you. This is our um, uh, just some links to our drug shortage notification portal, um, our email, and also our website. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Captain Saliba, for that extra insight into drug shortages. I know we will have lots of questions for the Q&A panel, so prepare your questions, please. We are running a bit early, so we will now break. Please take advantage of this extra few minutes to get your caffeine or whatever you need so we can get lively and get the show running, continuing running. We will be back here promptly at 10.30. Thank you.
Okay, 10.30 a.m. Thank you all very much for coming back. I hope you appreciated that those extra minutes that we had. And let's start for our next session, our next grouping of speakers. We have five speakers for the next sessions, which will take us into the Q&A panel. And I will do my best to do everyone justice. Uh, first, we have our Good Do For Three policy updates presentation. And this will be shared by Dr. Tina Kian, who is the Director of the Division of Regulations and Guidance within the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality at the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Then we have Martha Nguyen. She is the Director of the Division of Policy Development within the Office of Generic Drug Policy at OGD. And um, actually, that was a combination. Um, Dr. Kian and Dr. Nguyen will speak about the Do For Three policy updates. Then the next presentation will be the Do For Three stability, suitability petitions, and that will be shared by Dr. Rosen Pagaduan, Supervisory General Health Scientist of the Division of Filing Review within the Office of Regulatory Operations at OGD, and Arlene Figu Figueroa, at a regulatory council for the division of Leg legal and regulatory support within OGDP at OGD. And the final presentation in this grouping is the overview of the FDA's product specific guidance. I promised you something about PSGs this morning. And our speaker there is Dr. Joe Cotespar. He is the regulatory healthcare, health project manager within Office of Research and Standards at OGD. So please uh, let us start with our first presentation with um, Martha Nguyen. Thank you, Brenda. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Brenda Stoddard mentioned, my name is Martha Nguyen. Together with my friend and colleague, Tina Kiang, we um, are in charge of uh, developing and publishing all of the policy documents to help implement Gadoo for Three. Um, I'm going to start by uh, very briefly describing the types of policy documents that we use. The first one is a guidance for industry. This um, is a document that is intended to describe FDA's current thinking on a particular subject. It contains non-binding recommendations. So if you would like to propose a different way of complying with the existing statutes and regulations uh, for ANDA approval, um, you can do so uh, by contacting us or submitting a justification in your application. We also publish manuals of policies and procedures. These are internal documents that are intended to provide um, additional clarity for FDA staff in implementing these uh, policies and procedures related to, in this case, GDUFA. We make them external so that um, external industry and regulated industry can have a better understanding of the policies uh, and procedures that we use to um, implement uh, GDUFA. They are um, all published on on our website. The guidances themselves will be announced in the Federal Register with a Federal Register notice called a Notice of Availability. We have uh, a number of different ways that we identify the need for GDUFA policy development. The very first and the most important is the GDUFA commitment letter itself. Um, in particular, the Section 9 of the GDUFA commitment letter specifies specific uh, documents that we committed to during negotiations to publish to implement GDUFA. There are many other sections of the GDUFA commitment letter that don't have a specific uh, commitment to publish a document, but we will identify a need for um, additional clarity um, to, to be able to explain better how we're going to implement that particular program provision of GDUFA. In those cases, we will on our own publish a uh, either a guidance or a map or sometimes companion documents that both assist industry and FDA in being able to implement those provisions. The other area of GDUFA policy development is um, existing GDUFA 2 documents that we had published in the last iteration. Um, in that case, we would be updating the existing document to reflect any changes that we had made during the GDUFA 3 negotiation. There are under GDUFA 3 a number of uh, program enhancements that we agree to uh, where there is not 
specific clarity in the GDUFA commitment letter itself, we will choose to publish a guidance or a map to provide greater clarity around our thinking um, and how we intend to implement GDUFA in those instances. And then finally, we heard uh, both from you and from uh, internal stakeholders um, some of the uh, areas where we could um, do things a little bit differently during uh, Good for 3. Those lessons learned do inform our policy development process as well. Um, so now I'm going to uh, introduce a challenge question. And it is, um, can you or can you not make comments to a guidance at any time? Does anyone have a, I, I see some nodding and some shaking. I will tell you that the answer is true. You can comment on any guidance at any time, even if the guidance uh, comment period is closed. We try to do either a 60 or a 90 day comment period for guidances, which allows us to um, close out that uh, part of the policy development process so that we can consider all of those comments when we uh, start finalizing a guidance. But even if the guidance is final or even if the docket has closed, you can still comment on that guidance. You'll go to regulations.gov and um, the comment now button may not be um, live, but you can click on the document and submit a, uh, another comment. I have in my office, and I'm sure that Tina does as well, um, a lead regulatory counsel and a lead project manager that monitors each docket and um, considers those comments, disseminates them to the right subject matter experts internally so that we can very carefully consider your feedback. Next, I will go through the policy documents that we have published to date to implement GDU for three. I organize these documents in order of the uh, different chapters of the commitment letter, the first being uh, the one related to performance goals. These are then subsequently published in or, or ordered here in order of date of publication. The very first document that we published related to performance goals was a Good for Three commitment to publish a, to open a docket to solicit comment on Appendix A of our 2018 amendments guidance. Some of you may know that Appendix A included a list of what we consider to be major deficiencies. If major deficiencies were present, um, it would uh, a longer goal date would be assigned to the review of the amended application once submitted. So this uh, docket was intended to um, solicit additional feedback from regulated industry on uh, the deficiencies where the additional clarity was needed and perhaps where um, there might not be as much agreement on um, the, the nature of the deficiency or the uh, severity of it. We also updated our existing GDUFA 2 guidance on prior approval supplements under GDUFA. Um, this was a um, GDUFA 2 guidance, and um, we made very minor changes to be able to update it for GDUFA 3. We published that, I think, within days of GDUFA 3 starting in October 2022. We also, later that year, published a guidance on failure to respond um, after a CR letter is issued um, under GDUFA. This uh, guidance is intended to assist um, applicants in responding to CR letters and um, to, uh, to reflect our uh, thinking on um, uh, what happens after a CR letter is submitted and um, the types of uh, courses of action that an applicant may have upon receiving a CR letter. The next set of documents that I'll go through are the ones related to program enhancements under GDUFA 3. The first one here was also published at the same time as the PAS guidance I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, and this one is to update an existing GDUFA 2 guidance document on um, post-complete response letter teleconferences between FDA and applicants. Um, and it is, um, the, this type of teleconference is to clarify the deficiencies that were identified in the CR letter. This guidance um, included very minor revisions for GDUFA 3. We also at the same time issued a guidance on um, information requests and discipline review letters. These are uh, which we call IRs and DRLs um, are part of the communication that FDA 
engages in with an applicant during the review of an ANDA. This guidance was updated to include um, additional information reflecting the Goodie for Three commitment letter. I noted earlier that we often will publish a manual of policy and procedure to provide additional details to staff. In this case, we had a guidance and a companion map that both had an outward facing component, the guidance on IRs and DRLs, and an inward facing component, the map on the same topic to provide additional policies and procedures for staff in uh, reviewing and issuing um, IRs and DRLs. Next, we also updated a map that we informally call the Communications with Industry Map. This map uh, has general principles and procedures for communicating uh, the review status of applications with the applicant, consistent with what we committed to under GDUFA 3. And then finally, we published a map on suitability petitions, which describes how FDA will respond to suitability petitions that were submitted by or on behalf of applicants. And this reflects our GDUFA 3 commitments around um, suitability petitions, which was new to the GDUFA program under GDUFA 3. In June 2023, we published the guidance on cover letter attachments. This one is intended to uh, provide for applicants optional attachments that can be used when preparing cover letters to accompany a controlled correspondence or other ANDA submissions, such as original ANDAs and amendments and supplements. Um, these do not uh, replace the uh, recommendations for what should be contained in a cover letter, but are intended to um, provide additional recommendations um, when preparing those documents. We more recently published the amendments and request for final approval to tentatively approved ANDAs. This guidance um, is intended to provide our recommendations and current thinking on um, the timing and the content of amendments to tentatively approved ANDAs. The goal here is to be able to facilitate um, not only timely submission of those requests, um, but, but enough information that allows us to be able to take a final approval action on the earliest lawful um, uh, ANDA approval date. This guidance replaced an existing uh, guidance that we had published previously in 2020. We at the same time also publish a guidance that is a revision to an existing guidance on request for reconsideration at the division level under GDUFA. This one describes the types of um, the, 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 the types of actions related to an ANDA that are, can be um, where we can submit a uh, request for reconsideration. Um, and these uh, go through the division level and um, would be appealed up through the federal, the, the formal dispute resolution process. These, uh, the guidance revision was intended to capture the additional commitments and changes that we agreed to under GDUFA 3. This guidance, it, the next guidance is the post warning letter meetings guidance, and I'm going to defer um, additional description of this guidance to my colleague, Tina. The next set of uh, policy documents are related to implementation of the pre-ANDA program. The first one in this uh, area is around competitive generic therapies. This guidance includes a description of the process that applicants should use when requesting a designation of a CGT and the criteria for the CGT designation. It includes um, some information around uh, the types of actions that FDA would take to expedite a drug application that is designated as a CGT. Um, and the changes that we made to this existing guidance were to include GDUFA 3 uh, program updates. We made similar revisions in the same time frame uh, at the beginning of GDUFA 3 to the formal meetings guidance. This describes the types of meetings that uh, applicants can request when preparing an ANDA for a complex product. 
It includes uh, specifically information on requesting as well as conducting these types of meetings, both the, the pre-submission meetings as well as the mid-cycle uh, review meetings and the post-complete response letter meetings. This was an existing GDUFA 2 guidance that we updated to incorporate GDUFA 3 changes. We had here a companion map called Evaluating Requests for and Conducting Product Development and Pre-Submission Pre-ANDA pre Meetings. These are two of the types of meetings that developers of complex products can avail themselves of. This map contains additional information for staff in, in um, you know, accepting and granting those types of requests. It was made public as a map to increase transparency so that applicants can have a better understanding of what we are looking for when considering these requests. We also published, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, revision to the controlled correspondence guidance. This is the guidance that describes the process by which um, generic drug applicants and their representatives can submit to FDA questions before the submission of an ANDA through what we call a controlled correspondence. The guidance also describes the process for um, our responding to and providing communications about those uh, controls. We published a guidance on PSG meetings between FDA and uh, uh, ANDA applicants. This was a new meeting type, and this guidance was intended to provide additional information on um, those types of re requests for those meetings, what should be included in the meeting package, as well as um, how FDA would consider those requests and the timing around the scheduling and conducting of those meetings. And we also published a more recent version of the controlled correspondence guidance in March of this year. Next, I have a challenge question, which is what type of policy document is an internal document and which one is an external document? Is a guidance an internal document? The answer is that the map is internal to FDA. It is made public to increase transparency. The guidance is intended to be directed at external industry. Um, FDA staff also refer to that as a very important resource. And next, I will turn it over to my friend and colleague, Tina Kiang. So there are also a number of policy documents that were um, developed in OPQ, and some of them were mentioned by Susan earlier today. And so I'll, the first one that I will be talking about is the guidance regarding the review of drug master files in advance of certain ANDAs uh, submissions under GDUFA. Um, this describes when an early assessment of type 2 DMFs, also referred to as the DMF prior assessment, can be reviewed and request, requested and commenced um, by the DMF holder. It provides recommendations to the DMF holder um, regarding when the request can be made. Uh, the request can be made uh, six months prior to the planned submission of certain ANDAs or prior approval supplements. Um, it, the guidance lists the eligibility and the submission requirements for such requests. Uh, we have a number of policy documents with regard to uh, facilities. Um, the first one is called uh, Facility Readiness Goal Date Decisions under GDUFA. Um, it, it incorporates, under, under the GDUFA commitment letter, uh, it was requested that we uh, incorporate how FDA would assess a goal date uh, to a facility if the facility is not considered ready for inspection. Um, if a facility is considered not ready for inspection, um, meaning that it was checked off as uh, not ready for inspection under form, uh, on form uh, 356H, then a goal date of 15 months would be assigned to uh, that uh, impending ANDA. Um, this would allow uh, FDA to focus resources on substantively complete applications uh, with facilities that were ready for inspection. It also um, outlines, uh, for example, if after those, you know, after the 15 months, if the facility is still not ready for inspection, what the new timelines would be. 
The next uh, guidance is regarding the pre-submission of facility information related to prioritized generic drug applications. This was uh, published in December 2022. This is actually a revision of a November 2017 guidance on the same topic. Uh, under the commitment letter, uh, under the GADUFA three negotiations and commitment letter, it was, a it was requested uh, to kind of streamline the information that was previously published in that 2017 guidance. And so in this guidance, uh, it discusses the content, timing, and assessment of what we, the pre-submission uh, facility information, pre-submission pre correspondence, or PFC, for a priority uh, ANDA such that, that the ANDA would be eligible for priority review. Um, we were, we greatly streamlined the type of information and the amount of information that would be necessary to submit uh, for these uh, pre-submission uh, uh, correspondences, um, such that you know, it would uh, reduce the burden, essentially, on, uh, on sponsors uh, submitting ANDAs, in particular, such that uh, a PFC does not look like a, an ANDA light, essentially, on the CMC information. Uh, the next one, again, as previously mentioned by Susan in her presentation, is a map uh, on the assessment of facility-based major to minor uh, classification requests. Um, and so uh, this was published in June 2023, and there was also a minor revision in December 2023. This is, again, an internal policy and procedure um, regarding the assessment requests uh, for facility-based uh, com complete response letter amendments uh, for original and uh, original ANDAs and prior approval supplements. In the GADUFA 3 commitment letter, um, it states that you, we discuss how uh, OPQ and OGD should coordinate these responses and receive and uh, accept these amendments. So when um, these re uh, reclassification requests are received, it out this map outlines how these, uh, these amendments will be coordinated within the agency by OGD and OPQ in order to uh, grant either grant or deny the request. And finally, and I realize that this is specifically a facility one and not uh, for the complete response letter, and I apologize, um, but this is for the post-warning letter uh, meetings under GADUFA, and it talks about um, information for, on the implementation of post-warning letter meetings um, for certain facilities. So it talks about how an eligible facility may request a warning letter meeting um, after, a, a, after, after receiving a warning letter. Within, uh, it, it also makes recommendations regarding, um, you know, the information that would need to be submitted. And the meeting request would be regarding um, the, remedi the, the ongoing remediation efforts by the uh, facility um, in response to CGMP deficiencies in uh, my, the referred warning letter. How to prepare the meeting package, include, including what should be included in the meeting package and the specific questions and responses that the, uh, that the uh, facility intends to provide, and how FDA will conduct those meetings. Uh, finally, we have uh, a document regarding, guidance document regarding user fees. Um, in uh, the GADUFA 3 commitment letter, um, the user fee structure was changed somewhat. Um, and so this is actually a revision of a previous guidance, um, which reflects the changes that occurred in GADUFA th the GADUFA 3 commitment. It explains new fee structures, the types of fees, and which entities are responsible for paying those fees um, under uh, the commitments. Uh, there, while you know a fee guidance is pretty standard and boring, um, there is one notable addition to uh, this to the guidance uh, in response to uh, to fulfilling one of our commitments, and one and that's regarding API excipient mixtures. In this guidance, um, it notes that API, you know, uh, manufacturers of uh, API uh, excipient mixtures are generally required to pay the finished dosage form facility fee. However, there is an exception that's outlined in this guidance, and it's for fee purposes only. So if, uh, when the mixture, the specifically this API excipient mixture is produced, because the API is unstable, 
meaning that it cannot be transported on its own, then uh, a sponsor may request, the API manufacturer may request that the fee be waived. This, uh, when we're talking about uh, unstable and cannot be uh, transported on its own, what we mean is that, uh, when, that mixing the API with an excipient would prevent the loss of one or more critical quality attributes. For example, adding an antioxidant uh, to increase chemical stability of such an API. If a company is claiming that they can uh, take this exception and therefore not pay a fee, they would have to provide a rationale um, that is clearly stated and the data that is supportive of uh, that request. So that, that's all I have, but I do have, uh, you know, I am going to talk a little bit about um, upcoming documents. And so, you know, as, as Martha said, you know, in the GDUFA commitment letter, you know, we do have, a, we do note a number of guidance documents and uh, other documents that we have stated that we are going to, going to publish. But also we are constantly looking at the commitment letter to see, you know, where else in the commitments can we enhance? What, what documents can we revise such that you know, we continue to meet the commitments? And so there are still forthcoming revisions to previously published documents um, to update um, in order to, um, in order to uh, meet the commitments. These typically are you know, what we would call level two revisions, meaning they're minor revisions because the, the general uh, overall policies haven't changed, but there are minor tweaks as a result of the commitments, for example. And because of that, you know, just so you know, uh, level two guidances, when they are published, they don't publish with a notice of availability. And so these things aren't officially announced, but the, keep a watch on them. Make sure that you are looking out for them. Um, and I believe uh, OGD publishes at the end of the year uh, a, a document that, uh, or I believe ORP publishes at the end of the year, or the beginning of the year, um, uh, the documents that are that are on the way. So that's so. Again, we are we are continuing to do our work uh, to fulfill uh, the the Gadufa commitments, and this is just a sampling of already what we've already accomplished. We are also committed, and, and a lot of the guidances that we have uh, shown are draft guidances, and we are extremely committed to making sure that these draft guidances become final. Um, and the reason why is because we want to provide assurance to the industry as well as, you know, to our FDA colleagues as to what our current thinking is um, when we're doing our work. You know, draft guidances are not for implementation. Um, and so, you know, while they are out there and they generally reflect, they, they, they aren't officially implementable. And so finalizing those guidances provides assurance to both FDA and the industry as to what our recommendations are and the consistency with which we apply those recommendations. And finally, you know, in, at the beginning of every year and in July, um, CEDAR publishes what's called the guidance agenda. And this is not just uh, on GDU for three, it's not just on quality, it's about any topic um, related to uh, the work that's being done in CEDAR. Um, and so in using, that using that guidance agenda, you can see what is forthcoming and what is projected uh, to be published in the coming year. Now, that is also to say that's not exclusively what's going to be published um, in the coming year. Um, it is just the minimum of what our goals are. There, there are guidances that are not on that list that will be published, sometimes because there are priorities that come up um, or that you know we unexpectedly finish faster, um, which does happen sometimes. Um, but also to note that what's on that guidance agenda typically is upcoming draft guidances. Um, the only exception is uh, that on that guidance agenda, we will uh, publish what we call immediately effect, in effect guidances as well, which means that it will be the first public notification that, uh, that a guidance on that topic will be published. But typically what's on that uh, guidance agenda is going to be the upcoming draft guidances for the coming year. So, you know, we, we've done a lot of work collectively. Um, you know, between OGD and OPQ, and I value the collaboration that we have between our two offices in getting a lot of this work done. We have done an amazing amount of work in the last two and a half years. 
um, uh, coming out of uh, the GDUFA 3 negotiations and commitments and are looking forward for the next couple of years to continue doing our work to meet the commitments that we have in uh, the GDUFA 3 and moving into GDUFA 4. And so I come to our last challenge question, which is, and it's an easy one because I just talked about it, where can you find out what guidance documents CEDAR is currently working on? And so, again, this is the CEDAR guidance agenda, which was currently updated in 2024. There's, there will be a mid-year update in July of 2024. Um, hopefully, when you get these slides, you will be able to click the hyperlink because this hyperlink here will take you directly to that PDF file. And I've given the next speaker a couple of minutes. So um, we'll welcome up uh, Roseanne and Arlene, who will be speaking about GDUFA 3 suitability petitions. Hello, good morning everyone, and thank you Martha and Tina for that wonderful presentation. Uh, so uh, my colleague Rosie and I today will be talking about GDUFA 3 suitability petitions. On this slide, it's just an overview of what we're going to be talking about today, which is our objective, resources, GDUFA 3, best practices in submitting a suitability petition, as well as common issues and deficiencies that we see when we're reviewing suitability petitions at FDA. So our learning objectives for today is to provide a background refresher on the generic drug user fee amendments commitment letter, also known as CADUFA 3, with regard to reviewing suitability petitions. We're also going to describe the proper format and content of a suitability petition. In addition, we're going to review the requirements for submitting suitability petitions that are triggered by the Pediatric Research Equity Act, also known as PREA. We're also going to list the reasons for denial of a suitability petition, and we're going to identify best practices and tips for submitting a quality suitability petition to FDA. So let's start with the basics. What is a suitability petition? A suitability petition is actually a type of citizen petition. It's a request to submit an abbreviated new drug application that is different from the reference listed drug, the RLD, in one or more of the following ways. Strength, route of administration, dosage form, and change in one active ingredient in a fixed combination drug product, such as a drug product with multiple active ingredients. So what are our GDUFA 3 commitments with regard to suitability petitions? Well, this was brand new under GDUFA 3. FDA has made certain commitments when it comes to suitability petitions for fiscal years 2024 through 2027. Most importantly, we have already started conducting completeness assessments for suitability petitions in this fiscal year. The time frame for completing these completeness assessments is 21 days after the date of petition submission. However, if an information request is issued, as part of the completeness assessment and the petitioner submits a response, FDA will finish the completeness assessment within 21 days after we receive the IR response. So under GDFA 3, we also have the priority of suitability petitions that fit under certain categories. For example, suitability petitions that could mitigate or resolve a drug shortage and prevent future shortages, suitability petitions that address a public health emergency declared by the Secretary of HHS under Section 319 of the PHS Act, petitions that are for a new strength of a parental product that could aid in eliminating waste or mitigating the number of vials needed per dose by addressing deficiencies in patient weight, body size, or age. 
Finally, the prioritization of suitability petitions that fall under subject um, special review programs under the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, also known as PEPFAR. Our next GADU for three slide um, talks about the goals that we've made under GADU for three with regard to completing suitability petitions over the next few fiscal years. So in this fiscal year, FDA is committing to a goal of 50% of submissions within six months after completeness assessment and up to a maximum of 50 suitability petitions completed. By fiscal year 2025, the goal is 70% of submissions within six months after completeness assessment and up to a maximum of 70 suitability petitions completed. By fiscal year 2026, that number rises to 80% of submissions within six months after completeness assessment and up to a maximum of 80 suitability petitions completed. By the end of GADU for three in fiscal year 2027, that number rises to 90% of submissions within six months after completeness assessment and up to a maximum of 90 suitability petitions completed. So now that we've gone over what is a suitability petition and our GADU for three goals, what do you do when you submit a suitability petition to the FDA? Well, as I stated earlier, suitability petitions are a type of citizen petition. So that's really important because petitioners must follow the format that's outlined in 21 CFR 10.30. Additionally, suitability petitions are submitted to our docket's management staff. And I wanna highlight a few things here in this slide because it's important in processing your suitability petitions in a timely manner. Your submissions, your supplemental material, your amendments, and that includes responses to information requests, are related to a specific docket ID, and they should be uploaded using FDA's electronic method for specific electronic submissions via docket ID FDA-23-S-0610. I know that's very specific, but it's very important in preventing any processing delays of your suitability petition. All supplemental or supported material and amendments must also reference the previously assigned docket ID. And there's an example here, including your subject, an amendment to FDA and what your assigned docket ID is. So DMS can process it in compliance with the Code of Federal Regulations. I highly encourage you, if you're gonna submit a suitability petition to the FDA, to refer to instructions on how to upload it and using the instructions that are entitled electronic method for specific electronic submissions to FDA's Division of Dockets Management Staff. So more about submitting a suitability petition. As I mentioned, it is a type of citizen petition. So refer to 21 CFR 10.30, and on that section, there are five sections that a citizen petition must include, which includes a suitability petition and that is action requested, statement of grounds, environmental impact, economic impact, and certification. Additional content specifically for suitability petitions are outlined in 21 CFR 314.93 paragraph D. And that paragraph highlights that it's important to identify a reference listed drug, submit a copy of the currently approved RLD labeling, as well as submit a copy of the proposed labeling. Finally, it's important when you submit your suitability petition to, um, if your request triggers PREA, that you submit your waiver request and a waiver justification. So suitability petitions and PREA. It's important to note that suitability petitions proposing a change in dosage form, route of administration, or a change in active ingredient in a fixed combination drug product do trigger the requirements for pediatric assessments or molecularly targeted pediatric cancer investigations under PREA. These requirements may be waived, but you must submit a waiver request. PREA authorizes FDA to waive the requirement to submit a pediatric assessment based on certain criteria for some or all pediatric age groups. 
So for any suitability petition that requests a change in dosage form, route of administration, or a new ingredient in a fixed combination product, an applicant should provide a request to waive the requirements triggered by PREA. So we really want to refer to you to the guidance that was issued last year on PREA requirements and requesting a waiver. Um, this FDA draft guidance for industry, it has a really long name, <laughs> Pediatric Drug Development Regulatory Considerations Complying with the Pediatric Research Equity Act and Qualifying for Pediatric Exclusivity under the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act. So that guidance replaces a previous guidance and it outlines the criteria for requesting a PREA waiver. I highly recommend reviewing that if your request triggers PREA. So requesting a PREA waiver. To request a waiver, applicants should provide the following, the drug name, applicant name, and drug indication. The age group indicated in the waiver request the statutory reasons for requesting a waiver, including reference to the applicable statutory authority. And finally, evidence that the request meets the statutory reasons for waiver. All relevant scientific clinical justifications for waiver should be included. It's important to note that if we deny your PREA waiver request, your suitability petition will be denied. Now I would like to move on to our challenge question number one before I turn it over to my colleague, Rosie. Which type of change does not trigger the requirements under PREA? Is it A, changes in dosage form, B, changes in route of administration, C, changes in strength, D, changes in one active ingredient in a fixed combination drug product? Any guesses? Well, I hope you're all thinking of C. The correct answer is C, changes in strength. Except for changes in strength, all other requested changes do trigger PREA and require PREA waiver and justification when submitting your suitability petition. Thank you so much. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Rosie, to discuss recommended supplemental information when submitting your suitability petition, as well as best practices. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Arlene. So once again, I'm Rosie Parga-Duan. I'm a supervisory pharmacist in the Division of Filing Review. Um, Arlene just went over the background on suitability petitions, a refresher on the GDUFA 3 commitments, as well as jumping into the requ required content for submitting a suitability petition. So now I'll be transitioning into some supplemental information that's recommended, not required, but it can facilitate the review of your suitability petition. Uh, we did mention that the RLD labeling and proposed labeling is required for a suitability petition, um, but if, you, if available, it is helpful to provide annotated proposed labeling that identifies all the differences between the prescribing information and the RLD labeling. If there is a proposed change in strength, provide a description of the proposed product. For example, the tablet color, shape, size, or any identifying imprint codes. And if available, also provide proposed carton labeling as well as container labels. For petitions requesting a different active ingredient in a fixed combination drug product, provide a description of any differences in clinical safety or efficacy that may be seen with the newly proposed active ingredient compared to the active ingredient in the RLD. Uh, for example, if the new active ingredient has a narrow therapeutic index or if it could give rise to different adverse effects from that of the RLD, those would be important to note. And then verify whether dosing or presentation strength of the overall product will change as a result of the substitution of one of the active ingredients. For petitions requesting a different route of administration or dosage form, submit information on whether the different ROA or dosage form gives rise to a potentially adverse event profile. Going from a tablet to an injection may lead to injection site reactions that are obviously wouldn't exist in the tab tablet formulation, but important to point out. Um, you'll want to include details of what the clinical outcome or impact is if a user were to administer the proposed product through the RLD's intended route of administration. 
Indicate any changes in administration technique or instructions for use. Uh, for example, changes from a tablet to an orally disintegrating tablet should have different administration techniques or instructions that are identified in the proposed labeling. Uh, now I'll move on to reasons for denial of a suitability petition. 21 CFR 31493E outlines the reasons that the FDA may deny a suitability petition, um, starting with some of the more common reasons that we've seen. Um, if during our review, the agency identifies that investigation, investigations must be conducted to show the safety and effectiveness of the drug product, um, then the petition will be denied. For petitions that seek a change to an active ingredient, the drug product that is the subject of the petition uh, must be a fixed combination drug product. It cannot be a single active ingredient drug product um, seeking to change that active ingredient. And then if your petition triggers PREA and a PREA waiver request is denied or not granted, the FDA um, will deny your petition as the proposed product is ineligible for approval in an ANDA. If any of the proposed changes from the listed drug jeopardize the safety or effective use of the product so as to necessitate significant labeling changes to address the newly introduced safety or effectiveness problem, then your petition will be denied. Um, if the FDA determines that the RLD, that's the basis of submission of your petition, has been withdrawn from sale for safety or effectiveness reasons, or this is a big one, if the RLD drug has been voluntarily withdrawn and the agency has not determined that it's been withdrawn for safety or effectiveness reasons, um, that could prolong or deny, uh, result in a denial of your petition. If a drug product is already approved in an NDA for the change that's described in, in your petition, your petition could be denied. So this slide covers uh, the denial reasons listed in 314.93. Um, pertaining to uh, petitions that are proposing changes in an active ingredient for a fixed combination drug product. Um, it's provided here for completeness um, purposes only. Um, you can use it as a reference, but they aren't commonly encountered as um, petitions for fixed combination drug product changes um, of the active ingredient aren't as common. Uh, now jumping into the more interesting part, uh, best practices for submitting a suitability petition. Ensure your amendments are submitted properly. Uh, Arlene went over the guide that shows instructions on how to upload your amendments um, to your docket. Um, you'll wanna ensure that all amendments, so any responses to information requests that are issued during the completeness assessment stage or even thereafter, uh, should be uploaded using the shell docket ID FDA 2013-S0610. And then in your amendment itself, uh, be sure to include a subject line or a title that identifies the document as an amendment, referencing the original docket number that you were assigned. For example, subject, amendment to, FDA, and then your petition number. Does your petition propose a change in dosage form, route of administration, or a change in an active ingredient in a fixed combination drug? If so, make sure you provide your PREA waiver request. Um, Arlene went over the content that's required for a pre waiver request and also referred to the guidance. Um, there's also a link at the end of this presentation to the resource for that guidance. When submitting a petition, make sure you check the orange book. Um, you'll wanna check if an NDA has already been approved for the drug product that's proposed in your petition. If one is already approved, you can go ahead and submit your ANDA referencing that NDA as the basis of submission. Um, if the RLD has, um, that's cited as the, as the basis of submission has been discontinued, you'll wanna make sure that a determination has been made by the agency that the product was not discontinued or withdrawn for reasons of safety or effectiveness reasons. If it has been discontinued and no determination has been made, you may submit a citizen petition um, to seek a determination whether the RLD was withdrawn from sale for reasons of safety or effectiveness reasons. This determination must be made prior to approving a suitability petition relying on a discontinued NDA. And lastly, ensure your petition submission includes a copy of the proposed labeling and a copy of the approved labeling of the reference listed drug. All right. For 
any petitioners that might have any petitions pending that were submitted prior to FY 2024 and you want a GADUFA goal date, there is an option for you. You can withdraw that petition and resubmit that petition and you'll receive a goal date upon completion of a completeness assessment. Lastly, wait for approval of your suitability petition. FDA will refuse to receive an ANDA citing a pending suitability petition or a suitability petition that was denied as that ANDA would lack a legal basis of submission. All right. And challenge question two, which of the following statements is not true? A, a copy of the currently approved RLD labeling and proposed labeling should be included with a suitability petition. B, a suitability petition allows a person to submit a request to change a dosing regimen different from that of a listed drug. C, a suitability petition will be denied if a drug product is approved in an NDA for the change described in the petition. And D, a suitability petition will be denied if the reference listed drug that is the basis of the petition has been voluntarily withdrawn from sale and the agency has not determined whether the withdrawal is for safety or effectiveness reasons. Any guesses? B, I'm hearing B. Correct answer is B. You cannot submit a petition proposing a change in dosing regimen. Uh, the four allow permissible types of changes are changes in strength, dosage form, route of administration, and a single active ingredient in a fixed combination drug product. Uh, again, here are the resources, uh, a couple of the guidances that we mentioned, as well as a link to the map um, on our internal review of suitability petitions. And as a summary, we went over the format and content that's outlined in the regulations. Um, big thing is to provide that waiver request for any petitions that trigger PREA. Uh, remember the instructions for submitting amendments to dockets management staff. Uh, this is important for timely processing of your petition. And then once your suitability petition is approved, you can go ahead and submit your ANDA. Now I'll pass this on to Joe. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for listening to the presentations thus far and listening to this one. So this is going to be the last session before we then we jump into a Q&A. So again, my name is Joseph Kotsibar. I'm a Regulatory Health Project Manager in ORS OGD, and I'll be covering today my presentation on the overview of the FDA Product Specific Guidance Program, otherwise or better known as PSGs. So what we'll, co what we'll cover today is we'll go through the PSG background, We'll talk about the relation to the FDA's ANDA program. We'll cover an overview of the FDA PSG program as a whole, talk through the GADUFA 3 commitments, and talk through public comments and public requests. And then lastly, we'll end with discussing uh, PSG teleconferences or TCONs and other PSG meetings. So to start, we'll start with the basics. What is a product-specific guidance? So this term has been used a few times through the presentations this morning. Um, Product-specific guidances are a great way to start with your generic drug development. So very, very similar to how the FDA publishes general guidances for industry, they also publish these product-specific guidances, which these are going to reflect the FDA's current thinking and expectations on how to develop a generic drug product that is therapeutically equivalent to a specific RLD, or reference listed drug. These guidances, of course, as their names, contain product-specific recommendations to help identify the methods for developing generic drugs and generate the evidence needed to support ANDA approval. They are going to include key science and research outputs. And they're very unique to the generic drug development program. So when we think about establishing bioequivalence for a current drug product, you can't solely rely on PSGs. They're a great resource, and I'll highly recommend them every time. But of course, you need to also look into the regulations in 21 CFR, as well as these other general guidances I just mentioned on the previous slide. All three of these approaches used together 
can really help paint the picture for how to show your product is bioequivalent to the innovator, or RLD. PhDs also play a very unique and integral part in the FDA's ANDA program. So when we think about the pre-ANDA program, there's a few pathways industry can go about um, talking with the FDA or receiving further guidance or recommendations from the FDA. Some of these pathways include the pre-ANDA meetings, which I believe we'll have a presentation on later today, controlled correspondences, otherwise known as CCs, and then my presentation specifically talking about these PSGs. PSGs are often developed based on GDUFA funded research. Once they're developed, they're put published into the public domain space, and then they go under a review process to where the general public, similar to other general guidances, can always comment on these and leave feedback. So this program started back in 2007. The FDA has been publishing these PSGs to provide clear and direct recommendations to ANDA applicants. You can see over time, so this is going back really to almost the beginning of GDUFA, PSGs have generally increased over time, but they show a great variance year to year. As of today, we have 2,186 PSGs posted. And actually, I think there's a typo there. We just posted a standalone PSG last week. So that number is 2,187 PSGs. And we will talk about standalone PSGs here shortly. What I think is impressive, though, 40% of these, or about 40%, are for complex products. This is a high number, in my opinion, because complex products in general require obstacles, both regulatory and scientific, in order to establish bioequivalence. So having 40% of our PSGs for complex generic products, I think, is a pretty good feat for the PSG program. So now focusing on the GDUFA 3 commitments with PSGs. This is one of the biggest drivers, I would say, on when to expect PSGs to be developed. So for non-complex NCE new drug applications, or NDAs, approved on or after October 1st, 2022, that was the start of GDUFA 3, a PSG will be issued for 90% of such NDA products within two years. So what does that really mean? So we are saying that if a drug product is a non-complex product, and it's a NCE, so it's a new chemical entity that is a specific type of new drug application, typically going to be a type 1 approval. For all of these non-complex products, the FDA is committed to having a PSG published within two years of that RLD approval. So while the commitment is only 90%, really we're closer to 100%. I don't believe we actually have missed a Godiva Gold Aid in the past several years. So hopefully this shouldn't be too new um, to the folks listening in today because this is no change from Godiva 2. What's changed, and what's quite a big change, I would say, are for complex products. So complex products approved in NDAs, and I'll stop there because that's the first really big change for the non-complex, it's focused on NCEs only. So this new complex commitment is going to talk about any new drug application that's been approved and considered a complex product. So for these complex NDAs on or after, again, that October 1st, 2022, the start of Good for 3, a PSG will be issued for 50% of such NDAs within two years, 75% within three years. Another way to say that is essentially for any complex NDA approved after that start of the DUFA 3, the FDA is committed to 50% of those within two years. An additional 25% of those products will be published within three years. And then there's going to be a missing 25% that do not get a DUFA commitment. Those are going to be really for products that have um, really challenging and high hurdles for their scientific or regulatory obstacles in order to complete the PSG. Typically, those PSGs are going to need research before bioequivalence recommendation can be established. And then, of course, for any PSGs that were for complex products approved before GDUFA 3, FDA will strive to continue those as quickly as they can. So when we think about the PSG process, it's a very cyclical process in nature. So we'll always have a pool of products we can create PSGs for. 
these PSGs are prioritized for development or revision into batches. They go through the development phase, which can be anywhere from months to years, depending on the complexity of the product. The PSGs will then be published, typically in quarterly batches or sometimes as standalones. And then the guidances will seek public comment, just like any other posted guidance for industry. So you may be asking, what some of the initiating events that would lead to a PSG development? Or how do you prioritize these PSGs to be developed? Those are great questions. So this excerpt here is from the PSG snapshot available on the FDA's website. And here it has a great list of actually um, initiating events, prioritization factors, and data to support the PSG development. So while this is not fully all-inclusive, it's going to cover most of the factors. So some of these initiating events are going to be recently approved NDAs and supplemental NDAs, FDA internal analysis into products without PSGs, any pre and meeting requests, public requests, comments to the PSG docket, which we'll cover here in a couple slides, controlled correspondences or citizens' petitions. Now, how do we prioritize the PSGs into these batches? Well, first and foremost, GDUFA commitment is always going to be at the top of the list. FDA is going to strive to meet those GDUFA commitments laid out in the GDUFA 3 commitment letter. Other than that, though, we do take into other considerations such as stakeholder interest via ANDA submissions, drug availability and accessibility, public requests, and public health priorities. Last but not least, there is data to support PSG development. So we use pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic modeling previous bioequivalent studies, NDA review, pharmacovigilance, and of course, the GDUFA funded research outcomes. So how do we revise our PSGs? So that previous slide was really talking about how are you going to develop a new PSG. However, PSGs will need to be revised at certain times. So again, while this list is not all inclusive, it's going to highlight most of the reasons we would choose to revise a guidance. Some of these include changes to the RLD, such as a labeling update, supplements for a new strength, newly identified safety concerns, consistency with revision to general guidances, citizens' petitions, responses received to the BE comments, new bioequivalence approaches from research, and new knowledge from ANDA assessments and pre-ANDA meetings. We do have categories that list how the PSGs will be revised. So in general, there's critical, in vivo major, and in vitro major, minor, and editorial. And you can see some brief descriptions of how those revisions um, are done on the side there. So when are PSGs published? So we kind of talked about this a little bit on the cycle slide, but new and revised PSGs are published quarterly in four batches a year. And we've gotten really good at the scheduling to where they should be fairly consistent into these four months. So February, May, August, and November are going to be the four months we would typically be posting these batches of guidances. A PSG may be published, though, as a standalone guidance or standalone batch outside the quarterly publications. So again, just like that PSG we posted last week, this would fall into this category as a standalone posting. So a couple of these reasons why we would post a standalone guidance would be to coordinate with a CP response to meet the GDUFA goal date, efficiency in developing PSGs for the same product in the same class. I think I believe this was last done with the topical batch of PSGs that was posted in late 2022, and a level two revision. The FDA is going to issue a notice in the Federal Registrar for every batch and standalone posting except a level two revision. So you may be asking, why not a level two revision? What's special about a level two revision? So first, you kind of have to understand what a level one revision is. So level one revision would be how we typically think about how the PSGs are revised. It's going to describe a change in FDA's earlier interpretation or policy that are more than a minor in nature. A level two PSG revision is going to be strictly typographical errors found in the PSGs. There's never going to be a change in the bioequivalence recommendation or the agency thinking. So 
So for the first time in late 2023, last year, we developed, or developed, we revised three PSGs through this level two revision process. So one of the best resources other than the PSGs themselves is this upcoming PSGs for generic drug product development, otherwise known as the forecast list. This is gonna describe the FDA's plans for all upcoming new and revised PSGs for generic drug products in the next 12 months. What's new with GDUFA 3 is this list includes complex and non-complex products. Overall, this list is going to enhance transparency in the PSG development. What's new with GDUFA 3, we now list month and year on this forecast list. So applicants can have a really good understanding of the month they should expect to see that PSG published. Last but not least, we'll ensure inconsistency in FDA recommendations and decisions following previous iterations of the PSG. So essentially what this means, we always want to list out the exact revision category and reason that the PSG is being revised. This will be very clear, hopefully to industry, what the change is going to reflect. Their forecast list is updated quarterly with each batch posting. So really quick, we can take a quick look at what this forecast list looks like. So again, it's broken down into new and revised PSGs. You can see here a couple things to point out. We have that product complexity, so it's going to clearly indicate if the product is complex or non-complex. And then you can see that planned publication column where we will strive to give the um, closest we can to the month and year of that PSG posting. So just like other general guidances, you can also leave comments on the PSGs. So similar to other pres presenters this morning, um, the, the PSGs do have a special docket. So you can comment on the Federal Registrar notice through the docket number FDA 2007-D0369. The notice will identify a comment period for these recommendations once the PSGs are posted. Comments can be submitted electronically to the docket or by mail. And users can, of course, get help through the assistance um, on the regulations.gov support site. Overall, FDA is going to consider comments on these draft PSGs while revising the guidances. So when we think about public comments, we think about after the PSG is published, that's when industry can leave the comments. Public requests is kind of the opposite. So public requests are going to be submitted through the CEDAR Direct um, NextGen collaboration portal. And it's basically going to be a bioequivalence request for a product that does not have a PSG already. The FDA reviews these requests and takes appropriate action. You can see really since the beginning of GDUFA 2 in 2017, the public requests have significantly decreased. So I think there could be several reasons why we saw such a drastic decrease. Um, one could potentially be just by the number of PSGs we have available. There's less products to send a public request in for. The other, I think, is I think industry has gotten better at looking at the forecast list. Using this forecast list, you can predict and see when PSGs are going to be coming out over the next year. So if you see a PSG that's going to be developed, either new or revised, you may forego submitting the public request because you know it's going to be published soon. So PSGs can be withdrawn. So typically, the PSGs are going to be withdrawn um, when they no longer reflect the FDA's current thinking. I would say this is most commonly due to when the RLD is withdrawn for safety or efficacy. The table shown on this slide is right on that link and right on the FDA's website. It is important to note that when a PSG is reposted, it will be removed from this withdrawn list because that guidance is no longer withdrawn. So last but not least, we'll cover PSG TCONs and PSG meetings. So for PSG TCONs, this is something new that was added with GDUFA 3. It's, this meeting should be used when ANDA applicants can request a PSG TCON at any time during their product development, either pre-submission or post-submission, when FDA publishes a new or revised guidance that introduces a revised recommendation. However, it needs to meet a couple criteria. So the recommendation has to be related to an in vivo BE study. 
in the end, applicant has already commenced that in vivo BE study that may be different from that new PSG recommendation. Prospective and applicants should submit a request for the pre-submission and pre-submission TCON and pre-submission PSG meeting electronically through the CEDAR Direct NextGen Collaboration Portal. Further, an and applicant should submit a request for a post-submission PSG TCON or post-submission PSG meeting electronically through the electronic submissions gateway. In fiscal year 2023, two PSG TCON requests were received and held. So PSG meetings. So you may say, okay, how are, how are these different than PSG TCONs? Well, PSG meetings, either pre-submission or post-submission, can be requested following the PSG TCON if additional discussion is still needed. So this allows a forum for scientific rationale for an approach other than the approach listed in the PSG. A pre-submission PSG meeting will be requested if the ANDA has not been submitted, and a post-submission PSG meeting will be requested if the ANDA has been already submitted. Controlled correspondences is another great pathway for applicants to follow up with the FDA on remaining issues following the PSG TCON. And other pre-ANDA and scientific meetings are also available as an alternative to a PSG meeting. However, the caveat to this is the FDA recommends that applicants do not submit a CC and request for a meeting at the same or around the same time asking those same questions. Unfortunately, last year, FDA did not receive any PSG meeting requests. So a little update on the next SBI webinar. So this was briefly mentioned in the first session. Um, so there is going to be an upcoming SBIA webinar strictly focused on PSGs. So if you thought this presentation was useful or interesting, this webinar would be a great next steps to go and listen to. So it is titled Facilitating Generic Drug Product Development Through PSGs. It's April 25th, 1 to 4 p.m. You can see some of the topics covered. So it will start with a really high level presentation of the PSG program, similar to this presentation, but then really delves into the scientific content recommended in the PSGs. It'll talk through BCS waiver options, the drug device combination section in PSGs, um, consideration factors uh, for bioequivalent studies, and the dissolution methods and database. So last but not least, I do have two challenge questions. So the first one is, what is not one of the factors FDA takes into consideration while prioritizing PSG development or revision? We have ANDA assessment, goal dates, public health priorities, public requests, and drug availability and accessibility. I see some nods. I think it's, so A is the correct answer. So if you selected A, you'd be right. So ANDA assessment goal dates are not one of the prioritization factors. And the last question is, what is a new feature added with the GDUFA 3 commitments for the upcoming PSGs for generic drug product development, otherwise known as the forecast list? Forecasting both new and revised PSGs, forecasting both non-complex and complex PSGs, forecasting specific revision reasons for revised PSGs and updated quarterly with each PSG batch posting. So this is kind of a tricky one. Hopefully everyone selected B, forecasting both non-complex and complex PSGs. So this was just started with GDUFA 3. Prior to GDUFA 3, we only listed complex products on this forecast list. All right, and here are some resources where a lot of this material was taken from. And with that, I'll conclude and we can start the Q&A panel. Turn it over to Brenda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cortez Barr. And let's welcome back our previous speakers for this session, Groupin, and also Dr. Saliba from Drug Shortages. And at this point, I'd like to introduce a, a new member to the panel, Dr. Reynolds Cantav, Senior Regulatory Health Project Manager, Enterprise Project Management Staff from the Office of Quality Assurance in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. All right, 
I don't see anybody at the mics. What's happening? We need to get some questions in house. Anyone has questions in house? <laughs> Let's see if we have any brave souls in house. There we go, sir. Uh, this is an auction. Anyone else on this on this side for questions? Because what we're going to do, we're going to take questions in-house, first mic, second mic, then we're going to go to online questions and start in that um, circle once more. So if you have any questions, please come up to the mic. Bring your laptop. Choose one. OK. No, go, go, go stand wherever you want to stand. <laughs> OK, so let's start. This gentleman was here first, so let's start here. Sir, what's your question? Great. We have one question. One question with multiple parts. No. no. Just, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, primarily a question for the suitability conditions so far, Arlene. of petitions. However, in um, letters that we've received back, there's really been no sort of acknowledgement as to whether the petition was approved or not. So in industry, you're just kind of, you know, sitting there shrugging your shoulders as to whether it's a priority review or not. So it's, it, it's more of a request if that's a consideration that OGE can start to put some language into the uh, completeness assessment uh, letters to communicate whether it was uh, consider a priority review or not. And then the second part of that question is, if you could just sort of um, give me your sort of concept as to what priority review that petition actually means. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you look a little familiar. <laughs> um, so with regard to priority, I. Um, so the commitment letter outlines the categories that are classified um, for petitions that will receive a priority designation. Uh, currently, it does not outline any sort of shortened time frame um, specifically for it, but we do identify whether a petition is priority during the completeness assessment. However, I agree with you, we do not state that um, in the completeness assessment correspondence, um, but that is a great suggestion that I think we can take back. Um, as for the last, could you repeat? Whatever? The latter part was just what does prior to review of the petition actually sort of mean? It's not really defined. Right, so it, it, agree, it isn't defined anywhere. There is no explicit shortened timeline, um, but there are internal measures to prioritize petitions that are identified as priority. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mike, uh, question for Mike, too, please. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for doing this today. We really appreciate it, actually. Uh, Giuseppe Randazza is from AM. We've had requests from members. They were excited to see that this was scheduled in April, so we appreciate you all being here. A um, couple questions, and I'm not sure who can respond. One is... One question, please. One question, two parts. Um, no, fine. One, I, I, one question. Uh, so uh, we one of the recent guides is, and this is a um, combination of uh, drug shortages and policy, it's notifying the FDA of discontinuous or interruption is the specific guidance I'm referring to. Um, it was recently re-released, and there was just some confusion from some of our members as it appeared to be released missing some information within. So this is a content, or excuse me, maybe a process question. It, it removed the sentence specifically when finalized, this guidance will replace the March 2020 guidance. So it appeared to be final, but we believe it was still draft. So I'm not sure you have any yeah. clarity about that specific guidance. Or again, maybe this is just a process question. I'm not sure if you can answer. And I'm not sure who would answer that. Which guidance was it, G? It was, it was the notifying FDA of a discontinuance or interruption in manufacturing of finished product or API under Section 5 of C. So it was the CARES, CARES reporting. Again, and this, this might not, that might have been some process question. Yeah, um, Giuseppe, we can get back to you on yeah. that. I, I don't think it's final, okay. but I, we'll get back to you. Okay, and I'll, I'll send you, I'll actually, I'll send you the reference so it's easier Perfect. for you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Let's go to an online question, please. Right, our first online question is for Johanna and the Drug Shortages Group. Do we have any timelines to notify the agency about permanent discontinuation? Once we submit the permanent discontinuation, can we recommence the manufacturing activity based management plan or market demand? And also, should we inform the agency about plan recommence activity? Yeah, so notification is, you know, it says discontinuation six months in advance or as soon as possible. So we really want to know as soon as, as you know, there is going to be either a discontinuation or um, an issue that would lead to a disruption. And what was the second part of the question? Sure. Um, once we submit the permanent discontinuation, can we recommence the manufacturing activity based management plan? management plan or market demand? And also, should we inform the agency about plan recommence activity? I mean, any information would help us. Um, so I, yeah, I, I would say that you would continue, but any information that you would help us as far as you know, future plans, that, that would be helpful. Is that it? Yep. Thank you. And let's go back to Mike Wan. Your question, please. Hi, uh, mine is about the uh, policy updates related to guidances and maps. Um, and there, and I know there's a guidance agenda published, but is there a docket similar to requesting PSG updates for guidance updates, in particular, the content and format of an ANDA guidance as it relates to drug device combination products, um, and, and that would be also the and filing checklist map. Um, have Could there be information related to drug device combination products? Is there a plan to add that information? So you're both asking for <clears throat> an update on a map and an update on a guidance, and you're asking if there's a docket where you can submit those types of updates. Mm -hmm. I think there is a docket um, for submitting requests for guidances, um, and I can look up that docket number and, and get it to you. <clears throat> okay. On um, maps, those are driven by um, internal agency needs, mm -hmm. so we update those as um, we uh, have the resources and the, the uh, um, impetus to do so. I thought we recently published a, a revision to our uh, ANDA filing map, though. Yes, but, but it doesn't have the information this to your information there. Got it. Okay, okay um, thank also, you. We'll take your feedback. Also, I want to note that typically, if um, even in the generic drug space, um, typically if the guidance or the policy is about uh, drug device combination products, um, it is typically led out of the Office of Combination Products and not out of OBQ or OGD. Um, and so we would obviously be involved in any mm -hmm. guidance development of that type. But if it is directly about combination products, typically the Office of Combination Products has heavy involvement in it as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mike two, please. So this is related to updation in the product specific guidances. So let's consider a product at a different stages. Uh, once is almost ready for the submission, but we are facing a notification which says that the PSG will be updated in the coming months then what to do? That's the first question. Second, for uh, the first, let's answer one question, please. So for the same only, it's the second scenario. <laughs> okay, what, you can, what first question, please. So first question is for the development product, if it is under the, like B study and everything has been completed, but we are getting a notification that PSG will be updated in the coming months. So what be the case? And the, the same way, the product is like a study has been partially completed and it says um, uh, having a PFC submission, not a directly ANDA submission, then what? how to proceed? Should I come again or am I clear? We were, we're waiting for them to confer. Is that something we can address or is it too individual? I think we're not quite sure um, about the second part of your question, so we might ask you to repeat that. But you're saying for the first question, you have already submitted an ANDA or you're still in development? 
so it's like within a one week we are going to submit. It's almost ready to submit. And by update, um, you're talking about an update to the uh, forecast list. Yes. And what kind of update did the PSG revision indicate? It says minor. Minor? Minor, but it says that there could be a deletion of some studies. Deletion of studies. Yeah. So um, often PSGs are revised to include either alternative approaches to the existing uh, BE studies that are recommended in that PSG. Um, there are other times when information is uh, being revised to delete a, a study, in which case you um, would not be expected to conduct that study. Um, okay. Does that help? Yes. OK. Uh, online, please, Nora. So uh, this question is for either Joe or Martha. What is the agency's thinking regarding changes in the PSG for ANDA submissions, which are in the middle of a review cycle, and for products that are already approved? This can affect the ANDA applicant financially and delay the approval. So we'll, we'll answer this in two parts. So the, the first part, I would direct the applicant to potentially use the PSG TCON pathway. So if that in vivo study was already started and on the forecast list, um, let's say that the PSG revision was stated that it was going to be revised for that in vivo study, they potentially would be eligible for that PSG TCON meeting. Um, so that would be kind of the first advice. Um, but secondly, I know Martha wants to add on. Thanks, Joe. Um, as I noted to the um, earlier question, you know that many of the PSG revisions are intended to provide an alternate approach. Our um, research and science program is really identifying uh, different ways to establish equivalents that reduce the burden for applicants in being able to demonstrate bioequivalence. So by and large, our PSG revisions are intended to provide an alternate approach that hopefully is less burdensome for the applicant. Uh, but any revision that we make to the PSG is intended to reflect our current thinking on the most accurate, reproducible, and sensitive approach to establishing BE. And so in the cases where there are critical revisions, and I don't believe that we've made any to date, um, those would be expected to be conducted. <clears throat> if new studies are, are required, those would be uh, expected of uh, both pending and approved applicants. Thank you. Let's go back to mic one, please. Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. Joe. Uh, thank you very much for detailed presentation on the PSGs. So I have a question on one particular product where there is no PSG available, but uh, uh, the review packet available at drugs and uh, drugs at FDA has very detailed, every detail like type of studies, number of studies, then the analyte to be you know, tested. Everything is available in the review packet. Can we use that and uh, go ahead with our B study for uh, the end now. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so if there is no PSG developed, um, the high level answer to that would be yes, you can, but you'd be proceeding at your own risk. So if there was to be a PSG developed, then that could potentially lead to um, you know further meetings needed or a filing issue. Um, if that PSG was going to be developed. If, so, if it's a complex product, you can also request pre-ANDA meetings that would assist with... No, it's, it's not a complex product, uh, but uh, the, the the review packet, you know, at the Drugset FDA is, is very clearly mentions type of studies, the analyte, and the uh, number of studies required, you know, that was approved, that was approved uh, for the RS product. So can we use that or you want us to go with the TCON or at the pre pre and meetings? It's a good question. I, I would say, based on your explanation, safe and sorry would be probably to um, go through the, the, the pre and meetings in order to get that clarification before you submit and if there's a filing issue. Um, yeah, I would, I, would, I would say that would probably be the safest approach here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So we'll do the last question in-house and then one online. So next question in-house, please. Yes, this is for Captain Saliba. Um, a, an RLD that is on the shortage list 
uh, can receive expedited review of a, a, an NDA, a NDA submission um, if it's on the ASHP list, but not on the FDA list. Are those lists ever harmonized? Is there communication? Is there any sort of cross-pollination on that? Yeah, the two lists are serve different purposes. So ASHP um, have their um, website and and they serve you know their their practitioners and to put in information and detail about each product in each NDC, where our um, our website is directed more at you know a shortage of a national level, and if the total market is not being met. So it, it is different. And when we um, expedite um, reviews of, a, of an application, we, um, at the time of submission, if the product is listed on our website, um, then it's, it could likely be expedited, of course, um, while um, meeting um, the ANDA submission and requirements. Yeah, we don't we don't consider that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And our last question for this morning comes from online. Sure. So for Johanna Ray regarding drug shortages, how will FDA provide support for a new ANDA filer for the product which is under shortage? Does FDA reduce review and the review and approval period? And if yes, how much? Yeah, it's similar. So it, the, the application um, is considered for expedite if it's on the shortage list. As far as time frame, that that is really it varies, and it's not something that we can give a time frame for. Okay, thank you all very very much. Thank you to our panelists and our keynote speakers. We will break for lunch now. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are offering a buffet selection downstairs for a flat $20 fee. Uh, we also have our exhibit material here. We encourage you to go and see what the guidance is, maybe of interest to you, get a business card, et cetera, and be back here ready to start at 1 p.m., please. Thank you.
It is beautiful, says the man in the transition glasses, black. Okay, thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, no more. Okay, um, so welcome back everyone. Uh, we're going to do our next grouping of presentations. And we start with the first presentation. I guess we, we passed a lot, okay. Uh, first presentation, an overview of controlled correspondence to do for three updates and a comprehensive analysis of controlled correspondences received by the Office of Bioequivalence. And in this um, particular uh, presentation, it will be shared by, Dr. by Lieutenant Commander Marcia Fields of the Office of Regulatory Operations within the Office of Generic Drugs, and also Dr. Zen Zhang, Master Pharmacologist of the Division of Bioequivalence One in the Office of Bioequivalence at OGD. Then we will have a next presentation, Overview of Quality Control Correspondence, and that will be given by Dr. Jen Anim, Pharmacologist Policy Lead within the Division of Internal Policy and Communications at OPPQ at OPQ. At the end of this, I'm gonna give a test for all the acronyms and see if anybody knows what the acronyms are. After that, we're going to um, launch into a presentation of overview and considerations of pre and uh, scientific meetings under CADUFA 3, and that will be given by Maria Monroy Osorio, Regulatory Health Project Manager within the Office of Research and Standards, ORS, at OGD. And then to round out this grouping, we'll have unveiling the data post-complete response letter, scientific meeting requests under GADUFA 3, and that will be given by Dr. Hiram Patel, Senior Staff Fellow with the Division of Bioequivalence 2 at the Office of Bioequivalence within OGD. So let's welcome our uh, uh, grouping of speakers, with the first speaker being Lieutenant Commander Marcia Fields. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings. Today I have the pleasure of talking with you about updates to GADU 3 as it relates to control con correspondence. As stated, I'm Lieutenant Commander Marcia Fields. So I'd like to orient you with the legend that will be utilized in the presentation. We saw this previously with the suitabil suitability petition presentation, but essentially the um, picture icons on the left correspond to topics on the right. So if you see a three with a circle in it, it represents we're gonna be talking about GADUFA 3, or if you see the um, light bulb, it'll be best practices. All of these will not be used, but just for your reference. So for our objectives, I'll start with defining some terms, and then I will review a couple of types of control correspondence that we often receive. I'll talk about what makes that correspondence valid, and then wrap up with things that may cause the correspondence to not be considered valid. So what is control correspondence? These are your questions related to a specific element of the generic drug product development process that are asked prior to submitting your abbreviated new drug application. With the two types, the first one is level one correspondence and it can be submitted before an ANDA or after a product specific guidance teleconference as we heard previously. It can be submitted after a complete response letter is issued or a tentative approval or even after the ANDA is approved. With level two control correspondence, it must first meet the definition of level one, and then it either requires evaluation of clinical content, requests a covered product authorization, or interdisciplinary collaboration. 
And then lastly, clarification of ambiguity indicates that the agency's original response merits further clarification. If an applicant seeks regulatory or scientific advice, the control correspondence related to the ANDA or supplement may be submitted after the complete response letter. The complete response letter must have been issued after the implementation of GADUFA 3. The control correspondence should include a copy of the complete response letter, and it should reference the specific deficiency. If a product is available in multiple strengths as it relates to inquiries that are related to Q1, Q2 evaluations, the control correspondence should have a maximum of one strength per control correspondence. We also consider different fill volumes, different strengths. So 5 ml, 10 ml, 20 ml fill volumes in one control correspondence would be considered not valid. For formulation review, the maximum of proposed formulation should just be three. Whenever submitting inactive ingredient um, evaluations, please do not submit them in the form of ranges. The formulation description should be adequate, should include adequate details, and it include, should include the salt and hydration forms, the purity grade or type, the function and appropriate units. Control correspondence may be submitted related to a pending ANDA, but it must be related to the following topics. Inquiries regarding development of a new strength or package configuration. Cor correspondence may address deficiencies in a complete response letter or to seek further feedback after a product-specific guidance teleconference. Lastly, the correspondence may be submitted during the ANDA assessment cycle to seek a covered product authorization. So let's talk about some best practices. What should be included in a control correspondence? So please submit the inquiries on a business letterhead. The cover letter containing the inquiry should be dated within seven days of the FDA submission date. We ask that you not forward date the documents. We wanna know where you're located and how to get in contact with you. So include the company name, the title of the sender, street address, email address and phone number, please don't include post office boxes. If an email domain and the applicant or the US agent or the applicant don't match, please explain the relationship with the email domain and how it relates to the company. Foreign companies pursuing a generic drug approval in the US must have a US agent. The letter of authorization validates and explains this relationship. Domestic companies may assign a U.S. agent as well. The U.S. agents for U.S.-based companies should identify the applicant. All submissions must include the reference listed drug serving as the basis of submission. This includes discontinued RLDs and inquiries related to approved ANDAs. Additionally, we want you to include the previous related control correspondence that were accepted for substantive review um, in your submission. Please be sure to submit the original correspondence, the agency's response, any information requests sent by the agency, and the response to those information requests. If you found research through the literature, uh, through literature reviews that would support justification for your inquiry, please include it. We ask that you identify a review discipline. Why do we ask that? Because we want you to give thought to your concise statement of inquiry or inquiries, and the topic should fall under one specific review discipline. If there are requests for information related to more than one review discipline, these questions should be submitted separately. A statement regarding a future submission to the Office of Generic Drugs is to be included, and then obviously your specific questions. So our first challenge question, 
What information should be submitted in a control correspondence? A, it should be submitted with on a cover letter, the cover letter on a business letterhead, including previous control correspondence accepted for substantive review that is related, a statement indicating that control correspondence will lead to a future submission to the Office of Generic Drugs, D, all the above, A, B, and C. Your thoughts? D. <laughs> Common reasons um, regarding control correspondence that's not valid. So the letter of authorization must be dated annually, issued and dated annually. So we would consider expired if it's not within the one year. The Q1, Q2 formulation tables should include the hydration states and grades as expected in the ANDA submissions. If there is no product specific guidance and the question is related to bioequivalent studies, the correspondence will be um, forwarded to um, the product specific, product specific guidance development team, but it's not considered a control correspondence that we that is accepted for substantive review. So it will be gone, it would be forwarded for consideration. As we heard previously, they are prioritized um, based on several factors, but it's not a control. So if you were to submit um, in the future, it wouldn't be one that would be considered related that was accepted for substantive review because we don't consider a valid control. Um, other reasons may include that there's no date on the cover letter, that it's missing contact information, that it's missing the reference listed drug information in the cover letter or in the portal. This illustration shows that the percentage of submissions accepted for review as control correspondence and the percentage of submissions that are not accepted for review or not appropriate to be reviewed as control correspondence have remained consistent over the past five years. And so this, the pie chart says appropriate versus not appropriate. I've been using the term valid versus not valid. Um, so the not appropriate represent the uh, not valid and the appropriate represents the valid. So I'll pause for you to see this slide. And we'll move to our second challenge question. What is one common reason that control correspondence is considered not valid? If there are more than five submissions in one day, if the US agent represents more than one applicant, if the US agent for the US applicant is in the United States, or if the reference standard is selected in the CEDAR NextGen portal instead of the reference listed drug because the RLD is discontinued in the orange book. Thoughts? D, D is the correct answer. And so for all the drugs that have a designated RLD, whether it's uh, in discontinued status or not, it still needs to be referenced in the cover letter and in the portal. The exception to this rule is if there is not an RLD designated for the drug, the RS can be um, selected in that case. So a few of our, our resources, um, I want to direct you to um, first uh, the the draft was uh, December 22, but has recently been finalized. So it should reflect March 2024. The link will take you to the um, most recent um, update of that guidance. The reauthorization of the performance goal is what we call the commitment letter. And so um, these two are the great two, two excellent resources to start with. The next resources are um, our YouTube channel is one of those references. That's the last one. Um, the small business industry and business and industry assistance has a rich listing of uh, playlists that I can uh, recommend that you review to familiarize yourself. Um, with several things. So there's hours and hours of content for your review. In summary, um, we defined control correspondence, gave some key terms, talked about a few different types of control correspondence, provided considerations for what to do and what not to do with those submissions. And before I transition to my colleague, I'd like to leave you with a call to action. 
So what eases the control correspondent submission process? Having a copy of the guidance, the March 2024 edition, the final guidance, knowing what it says, and viewing the content available on the agency's YouTube channel to stay informed. This is a best practice. I turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, Marcia has uh, uh, given a general overview of uh, controlled correspondence. And for the next 10 minutes, I will be sharing uh, a, a analysis of controlled correspondence received by the Office of Bioequivalence. Uh, the learning objectives is, uh, are to describe the main categories of controlled correspondence reviewed by the Office of Bioequivalence and understand the scientific rationale of the agency's responses to questions and the major control uh, categories. Uh, the, generic, uh, the FDA generic program uh, received thousands of controls each year, and these thousands of controls are reviewed by different disciplines. And the uh, uh, review responsibilities of each discipline uh, are described in the guidance for industry controlled correspondence related to generic drug uh, development. Uh, development. Uh, but they are described at a high level. In that guidance, it says uh, OB reviews cont uh, controls containing inquiries related to the planning of BE studies. OB also reviews questions related to the maximum daily exposure of an inactive ingredient. In addition, OB reviews uh, CCs when applicants want to add uh, additional strength to their approved product line and uh, request feedback on whether they should conduct the studies recommended in the product specific guidance for additional strength. You can see if, uh, the first bullet point is described at a high level. So uh, we did an in-house survey of all 903 CCs uh, assigned to Office of Bioequivalence from April 20, 2021 to 20, uh, March 2023 and break them down into different major categories and subcategories. The first major category OB received is a maximum daily uh, exposure of inactive ingredients. We received uh, more than 700 cc's. Uh, scientifically, uh, in general, the proposed, uh, uh, the proposed amount of inactive ingredients is acceptable if uh, its maximum daily exposure does not exceed uh, the maximum daily exposure of the same inactive ingredients uh, in FDA-approved drug product for the similar context of use. In the second major category is retention samples related to in vivo PKBE study and in vitro BE studies. We received 43 controls. And FDA has, uh, FDA has published multiple guidances related to retention samples. The third category is other BE study related questions not covered by number one, number two. So we received 101 CCs. So we further break down this uh, number three into different categories. So for, the, for, that, for those two years, we received 17 uh, controls related to use of a different uh, reference standard other than the one recommended in the orange book. We also received 17 uh, controls uh, related to no approved drug available as the reference standard. We also received multiple controls related to uh, B questions for post-approval changes or for pending ANDAS, and B questions related to alcohol dose dumping, B questions for adding uh, additional strengths, uh, comparative, comparative uh, dissolution testing, and other categories. And for each category, there may be uh, multiple subcategories. In the next two slides, I will be focusing, uh, focusing on the top two uh, categories. Both of these two categories are related to reference standard. Uh, reference standard is uh, um, drug product FDA selects uh, for applicants to use in, in vivo BE studies. Uh, to uh, to support uh, uh, and uh, approval, 
uh, usually, uh, generally, uh, FDA selects RD as RS, but when RD is not available or in the um, or the quantity is very limited in the market, so FDA will designate an, a different uh, approved and uh, as RS if uh, applicable. So we received the controls related to use uh, using an authorized generic as RS when the RD is discontinued and uh, approved and uh, is designated as RS. In this scenario, scientifically authorized generic is the same as uh, RD product. So scientifically, there's no concern for using authorized generic as RS for, uh, for in vivo BE studies. We also received controls related to using the RD as RS. In this scenario, the RD is discontinued or, in, or its, uh, its availability is limited in the market. And another uh, and uh, approved and uh, was uh, uh, is designated as RS, but the applicant already acquired a sufficient amount of RD samples for their in vivo BE studies. In this case, uh, generally, it's uh, scientifically it's also acceptable to use RD as RS. We also received uh, uh, controls related to using another approved and uh, as RS or a different strength from RS, NDA or ANDA as uh, RS. Uh, depending on different scenarios, applicants may or may not use another approved and uh, or a different strength of RS as uh, uh, RS and uh, as uh, RS. So it's case by case for the last two bullet points. Uh, OB also received 17, uh, uh, 17 uh, controls related to no approved drug, uh, no approved drug available as RS. Uh, they, are, they can break down to uh, can be broken down into two categories. First one is to use a different dosage form containing the same drug drug substance as a bridge. The second category is to use two individual drug products as a bridge for fixed those combination products. In both scenarios, uh, the, uh, the OB's uh, scientific rationale for providing uh, uh, control responses is that if NDA applicant, if NDA has conducted BE studies to demonstrate BE among different dosage forms or between two individual drug products and the fixed, uh, fixed dose uh, combination products, we generally allow the applicant to use a uh, different dosage form or individual drug products as a bridge to demonstrate BE. So here's the challenge question. Which of the following CCs controls is not reviewed by the Office of Bioequivalence? A, alcohol dose dumping. B, maximum daily exposure of inactive ingredients. C, user interface of drug device combination products. D, retention sample related to in vivo PKBE and in vitro BE studies. Any thoughts? Yes, C. So user interface of drug device combination products are usually uh, reviewed either by Office of Research and Standards or Office of Safety and uh, uh, Clinical Evaluation, depending on whether it is related to pre and or and submissions. Uh, in summary, OB reviews a wider range of CCs, such as questions related to the planning of BE studies or maximum daily exposure of an inactive ingredients, and understanding the scientific rationale of CC responses can potentially reduce the number of CCs and facilitate generic, generic drug development. And lastly, I, want, I would like to thank my colleagues, Tao, Menina, Bina, and Woodpo uh, for providing, uh, this, uh, pro providing comments on my uh, slides. Yep. Thank you. So. Good afternoon. My name is Jen Anim. I'm with the Office of um, Pharmaceutical Quality, the Office of Policy. I'm going to be referring to Office of Pharmaceutical Quality as OPQ throughout my presentation. 
And I'm sorry, I'm a little congested. I'm getting over a cold, so please pardon me if I sniff here and there. The outline of my presentation this afternoon would be the changes in GDU for three, the types of OPQ controlled correspondence, uh, the different OPQ disciplines that handle control correspondence, the best practices for control correspondence, and frequently asked questions for OPQ controlled correspondence. Our learning objectives this afternoon would be to outline the changes in GDU for three as it pertains to Office of Pharmaceutical Quality uh, Control Correspondences, to describe the types of quality related control correspondences reviewed by OPQ, and provide helpful information for submitting quality related controlled correspondence. Controlled correspondence, um, by definition, is a correspondence from a generic uh, sponsor, generic manufacturer, or sponsor related to generic drug development, um, requesting information regarding chemistry, manufacturing, contr and controls, as well as quality microbiology for generic drugs. With that, we have two levels of controlled correspondences, level one and level two. Level one control correspondences are con control correspondences received prior to an ANDA submission, after a PSG teleconference, after issuance of a complete response letter or tentative approval, after an ANDA approval, and um, after, uh, a control correspondence concerning post-approval submission requirements. Then you move on to level two, which are correspondences related to clinical content, covered product authorization, alternative bioequivalence approaches, and input from another office or center. So with us in uh, OPQ, the only level two kind of control correspondences that we have would be control correspondence that we do respond to would be control correspondences that need an input from another office or center. The time frames for response for controlled correspondence is based on our two levels. Level one control correspondences would be responded within 60 days. Level two controlled correspondences will be responded within 120 days, um, which is most of those would be ones that we would need a consult from another office or center. And then for clarification of ambiguities, we'll respond within 21 days. So what is clarification of ambiguities? Uh, according to our commitment letter, ambiguity in a controlled correspondence means a controlled correspondence response or critical portion of it that merits clarification. Requests to clar clarify ambiguities in FDA's control correspondence should be submitted within seven days of the response. No new questions or rephrasing of questions should be added to the clarification of ambiguities request and no new information should be added either. What is different in GDU for three pertaining to OPQ controlled correspondences? Under the GDU for three, under GDU for three, control correspondence seeking regulatory and or scientific advice after the following can be submitted as a control correspondence. After issuance of a complete response letter, tentative approval, and after an under approval. Previously in GDU for two, these were considered general correspondences. And just to note, response for clarification of ambiguities will be responded within 21 days of request uh, as, opposed, as opposed to 14 days in GDU for two. And also another thing to note is to submit the clarification of ambiguities within seven days of the response from the FDA. OPQ sub disciplines responding to control correspondences. 
within OPQ, there are different offices that respond to controlled correspondences based on this, the topic and the subject matter of the controlled correspondence. Office of Product Quality Assessment 1 and 2 respond to questions pertaining to drug products. Examples of those are formulation, specifications, stability testing, container closure, dissolution, in vivo, and in vitro and in vivo correlation. Office of Products Quality Assessment 3 respond to control correspondences related to drug substance questions. Examples of those, some examples of those would be starting material, polymorphs, new API source, and API sameness. The Office of Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Assessment would answer questions pertaining to manufacturing questions. Uh, example is batch size, manufacturing process, sterile manufacture, bacterial and the toxin specifications. Some of the topics that we received in 2023, and this is a breakdown of it in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. As you can tell, about three quarters of our control correspondences pertain to drug products, of which we received 72%. And then next comes post-approval, which is about 13 and 9% for manufacturing and drug substance, as you can see. Now, the, the, the top 10 quality control correspondence subjects or subtopics in 2023, as it's broken down. The number one is bracketing and matrixing, stability data, packaging, batch size, container closure, microbiology, impurity for drug products, in-use testing, orientation, and then the tenth one would be dissolution. Some submission best practices for controlled correspondence is submitted to OPQ. For pre-submission and post-approval control correspondences, we ask that questions should be submitted separately for each sub-discipline where possible. Example, drug substance, drug products, and manufacturing will not be on the same control correspondence. Each topic would be submitted as a different control correspondence, and this is for sub pre-submission and post-approval control correspondences. When we come to control correspondences pertaining to post-complete response letter, we ask that all quality-related questions should be submitted in a single control correspondence. Include a copy of the CRL, which is the complete response letter, and the reference specific deficiency in your control correspondence. Tips for successful quality-related control correspondence. The first one would be concise and complete questions with appropriate submission information. Number two, to resolve Q1, Q2 formulation issues before submitting the control correspondence. And also before sending, just verify if, the, if a new guidance has been published for the topic where the information in the inquiry can be found. We provided a link for the resources that may be needed. And also refer to the FDA guidance uh, question and answers on quality related control correspondence to determine if an answer has already been posted for what you may be asking in your control correspondence. Questions that cannot be answered in a quality related control correspondence. We listed, a we listed the questions that we cannot answer in control correspondence and they are as follows. Acceptability of a specification, in process control or study plan, acceptability of API overage in a final product, 
impurity clearance approach, adequacy of characterization studies, and proprietary information from the RLD or other applications. External inquiry versus a control correspondence. External inquiries is an out, the agency's outreach program to provide clarification for um, sponsors or drug manufacturers. It is not mandated by any user fees and therefore there's no time restriction on it. Some inquiries sent to the OPQ inquiries mailbox or other agencies' mailboxes may be eligible to be submitted as control correspondences. The FDA will notify the inquirer and request that the question be submitted as a controlled correspondence. <coughs> Some examples of frequently submitted control correspondences to the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. As you could, I don't. If as you could tell from the previous slide with the graph, stability was one of the most popular ones, and this is the um, what the number one question that we do receive in control correspondences pertaining to stability, and it goes, how much stability data is needed for under submission? And the answer that we always give is provide three discrete batches and six months of accelerated data and six months of long-term data at the time of submission for all strengths of all dosage forms. The next one will be packaging of exhibit batches. Number one question there also would be, how many batches should be fully packaged? And the correct answer is one exhibit batch should be completely packaged in marketing presentation. The other two batches can be partially packaged in sufficient quantities to comply with 20, 21 CFR 211.116. And the third one is in regards to API lots. How many API lots can be used for exhibit batches? The answer, a minimum of two lots of the drug substance should be used to manufacture the three primary batches of the drug product. However, for nasal aerosols and nasal sprays, use three different lots of drug substance. So in conclusion, I would like to emphasize on these three points. For control correspondences coming to the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, these provide clear and concise information which is appropriate for your question. Separate the control correspondences for different OPQ subdisciplines, except when it's for a post-CRL control correspondence, and also for, if you have a bioequivalence question, that should also be in a separate CC. For clarification of ambiguity, clarification of ambiguity should be submitted within seven days of the response from the FDA. No new information should be added, and a response will be issued within 21 days. And these are some resources that will be very helpful for sending quality-related control correspondences. Uh, the uh, control correspondences uh, guidance related to ge generic drug development. We have a guidance also for question and ans answers for quality controlled control correspondence. And we just have a, f a, f um, a form, which is a question and answers on quality-related control correspondences. So that's a good one to actually check your question to see, because we do provide questions and then the answers to see if your question has not already been answered. So now it brings us to the challenge questions from this presentation. Question one. 
And they could do for three, which of the following can be submitted as a controlled correspondence? Correspondence seeking regulatory and or scientific advice after issuance of a complete response letter or tentative approval and under approval or D, D all of the above. You want to take a shot at it? Yes. Okay. And then for question two, complete study reports are not appropriate for a control correspondence. True or false? Anybody wants to try? Yes, it's true. Thank you, Thank you very much. Attention. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Maria Monrosorio, and I'm a Regulatory Health Project Manager in the Office of Research and Standards. And today we're going to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to be talking about the pre and scientific meetings under GADUFA 3. Before we begin, let's cover some of the learning objectives from today's talk. The first is to describe the purpose and scope of the pre and product development and pre-submission meetings. The second is to acquire tips for meeting requests and package submissions. And lastly, hopefully this helps you identify which pathway would best work for your generic drug development program. First, let's go over a little bit about background of the pre and program as identified in the GADUFA 3 commitment letter. They are to clarify regulatory expectations early in product development, assist applicants in developing a more complete submission, promote a more efficient and effective and assessment process, all with the goals in mind to reduce the number of assessment cycles required to attain and approval. In order to meet some of these goals, the CADUFA 3 commitment letter lays out the pre and scientific meetings, which are aimed at facilitating communication between FDA and prospective applicants related to complex products and or complicated drug development questions. As part of these scientific meetings, we have the product development meetings, also referred to as PDEVs, and the pre-submission meetings, also referred to as PSUBs. Today, we will cover the more details about these two meetings. However, before we jump into that, I do want to note some additional pre and scientific meetings that are not covered under GADUFA 3, but they may be more suitable to your program needs. The first is the FDA EMA Parallel Scientific Advice Program, otherwise referred to as the PSA meetings. And as you heard this morning, the Model Integrated Evidence, or MIE, industry meeting pilot. These are two additional options that FDA has offered for prospective ANDA applicants to come and talk to us, again, helping meet the goals of the pre ANDA program. I do want to highlight that both of these meetings do have their own individual processes and timelines, and because they are not under GADUFA 3 commitments, they are not subject to the goal dates laid forth in the GADUFA 3 commitment letter. However, I do recommend and refer you to some of these references on the page where you can learn more information about these two meetings. All right, let's jump into the product development meetings. These are designed to be a forum for scientific exchange on specific issues or questions. Some examples can include proposed study design, alternative approaches, or additional study expectations. The goal of this meeting is to receive targeted advice from FDA regarding an ongoing development program. The product development meetings can fall under two different categories for granting situations. That can be the will grant or the may grant situation. First, let's cover the will grant situation. So a product development meeting will be granted if in FDA's judgment, the submitted product development meeting concerns A, a development of complex generic product for which FDA has not issued a product specific guidance, or B, an alternative equivalence evaluation, such as a change in study type for which FDA has issued a PSG. In addition to meeting one of these two, the prospective applicant must submit a complete meeting package to include a data package and specific proposals. We determined that a control correspondence would not adequately address the questions submitted. 
And in our judgment, we believe that a product development meeting would significantly improve ANDA assessment efficiency. So if you fall into all four of these, you would be falling under the will grant situation. We also identify that possibly you may not fall under those and you may fall under the may grant situation. FDA may grant a product development meeting for non-complex products or complex products that do not fall within the will grant dependent on available resources and if an FGA's judgment, it concerns a complex product development issue. The prospective applicant again submits a complete meeting package. A control correspondence would not adequately address the prospective applicant's questions, and the product development meeting would significantly improve ANTA assessment. So if you may not fall under the will grant situation, but you still can fall under all four of these, you may fall under this May grant. I refer you to the FDA guidance for industry formal meetings between FDA and ANTA applicants of complex products under GADUFA for more information. Before we proceed into the pre-submission meetings, I want to cover point number three. A control correspondence response would not adequately address your prospective applicant's questions. So you may be asking yourself, should I submit a control correspondence or should I submit a product development meeting? As has been mentioned in the previous two talks, control correspondences are better suited for single or small group of closely related questions. Some of the questions you ask may fall outside of the product development scope or not fall within that will or may grant situation. And if your response falls within a level one CC, you will get a response within 60 days. If it falls under the level two, you will receive a response within 120 days. For the product development meeting, if you're kind of going through your analysis, you determine that you do fall under the Swill or May Grant situation. You have multiple or multidisciplinary questions that present new information, data, or certain questions that may not be suitable for a control correspondence. Then I recommend you follow the product development pathway. Responses for product development meetings will be received within 120 days. And one recommendation we have is not to submit the same questions through a CC and a PDEV around the same time frame. Switching gears, let's cover the pre-submission meetings. So the pre-sub meetings under GADUFA 3 commitment letter have been redesigned. So this is a new type of, new type of meeting versus what was identified in GADUFA 2. The PISA meetings under GADUFA 3 are aimed at an opportunity for you as the applicant to present unique or novel data or information that will be included in your ANDA submission. And you will have the ability to receive FDA feedback on the ANDA submission, including items or information that we believe should be clarified before you actually submit your application. As part of this redesign, the PISA meetings under GADUFA 3 are not question-based meetings, and FDA will not provide a substantiative assessment of summary data or full study reports at this meeting. So again, PSUBs are aimed at the ability for you to present to us your unique or novel data or information. We also recommend that these be submitted within six to eight months before your anticipated ANTA submission. In order to be eligible for a PISA meeting, FDA will grant a PISA meeting if the applicant was granted a product development meeting for the same complex generic product, or FDA believes in its sole discretion that the PISA meeting will improve assessment efficiency. I do wanna highlight that even if you were granted a product development meeting for the same complex generic product, if your package submission for the PISA does not meet the scope of the PISA meeting, your meeting may be denied. Additionally, if you did not have a product development meeting, you may still submit a PISA meeting. Regardless of that, you will simply need to explain why you believe a PISA meeting will be beneficial. We do recommend if you do have questions on your, on your ANDA generic development program, that you seek our input via the product development meeting prior to submitting the request for the PISA. And as a general note, submitting or not submitting a piece of meeting will not prejudice the receipt of assessment of an ANDA. So as part of these two meetings, we have different types of meeting formats. For product development and product submission meetings, we can you can request meetings as an in-person face-to-face meeting. That is where core staff will participate in person at FDA's White Oak campus. And you may also have additional attendees participating virtually. That is where we would get into that hybrid meeting format. Alternatively, you can request a video conference where FDA and applicant attendees will participate from various remote locations via video connection with audio and visual communication and presentation materials may be projected throughout the meeting.
I do want to note that the GDUFA 3 commitment letter does give you the option to submit a teleconference. However, due to the scientific nature of these meetings, FDA will upgrade you to a video conference. And for the product development meetings only, you do have the option to receive a written response only, where you will be receiving a written response to the questions that you have submitted. And we may also grant these as written response only when the meeting is granted beyond the scope of the commitment letter. Before we proceed, let's get into challenge question number one. As a prospective applicant, you wish to submit a pre and meeting to present unique or novel data or information in your upcoming ANDA submission. Which type of meeting should you submit? A product development meeting or a pre-submission meeting? Guesses? If you answered B, a pre-submission meeting, that would be correct. Again, these are designed to give you the opportunity to present to FDA unique or novel data or information in your upcoming ANDA. So some, some of the con contents that go into submitting these packages, right? So both for product development and PSUP, you will have an overlap of items that must be included in both types of packages, and these are displayed here on the screen. I refer to you again to the FDA guidance for industry formal meetings between FDA and ANDA applicants of complex products under GDUFA for more details on what must be included in both of these submissions. For the product development meeting specifically, be sure to request the meeting format, which can be a face-to-face, -face, a video conference, or a written response only. And if you are requesting a face-to-face -face or a video conference, be sure to include the proposed agenda items, as well as dates that may not work for your company. And here is the meat of the PDEV meetings, a list of questions that are clearly numbered and grouped by discipline for discussions. For each question, be sure to include a brief explanation of the context, purpose, and justification with sufficient rationale or data to support the discussion. These are the questions that will be answered in your meeting as well as discussed if you have a face-to-face or video conference. For the PSUB, similarly, make sure you request the meeting format. This can be a face-to-face -face or a video conference. Whether or not a PDEV meeting was previously granted to you, be sure to include the event IDs and summary of advice if you did have a PDEV meeting. As I mentioned, you may still submit a PSUB without having had a PDEV meeting, but you need to provide an explanation of why a PSUB should be granted and the estimated timeline for when the ANDA will be submitted. Now we get into some of the really important things for the piece of meeting package, and that is the unique or novel data or information that you are including as part of your ANDA submission. This can be formulations, key studies, and the interrelationship of the data and information in an ANDA. So this is what will determine what will be discussed during your piece of meeting. And in order to help you facilitate how to structure this, this can actually be submitted in the form of a draft meeting presentation. Here are some items to include, but you can also include additional items if you would like. We refer you to Appendix B of the guidance that I've been mentioning, as it does provide additional information, as well as a template that you may utilize as you're structuring your package. So some final tips on your meeting package, make sure you review all applicable guidance and standards before submission. At the end of my talk, I have a references slide with additional references that may be beneficial to you. For product development meetings, be sure to ask the specific questions and specific with sufficient justification and avoid asking questions pertaining to assessment issues as those fall outside of the scope of the pre and program. For PSUBs, do not include specific questions. As I mentioned, the PSUBs are not question-based meetings, and do not request a teleconference or written response, as those are not eligible formats for PSUBs. So let's look at a little bit of the meeting timeline and some of the changes that have been noted within the DUFA 3. For the product development meeting, no changes were identified in that your grant denied decision will still be within 14 days of the FDA receipt date, and your meeting would be conducted within 120 days of the FDA grant date. For the PISA meetings, this is where things have changed. The grant denied decision is within 30 days of the FDA receipt date, and the reason that this is 30 days instead of the previous 14 is because during this time, we will identify the ANDA assessors reviewing your packages, as well as give you um, additional input for items that, will be that we recommend you include within your meeting presentation, and that would be included within the grant letter. And then the actual meeting would be conducted within 60 days, so it's a much more shorter time frame than the product development meetings.
For both types of meetings, if you have a face-to-face -face or a video conference, you will receive preliminary written comments no later than five days before the meeting. Both meetings will be 60 minutes, and the meeting minutes will be issued within 30 days. For product development meetings that are granted as written response only, the final written response will be issued within 120 days. You will receive a written grant or denied decision, and these are some examples of why the meetings may be denied. The product is not a complex product, the request is premature for the stage of product development, or the meeting package is incomplete or inadequate information was provided. Again, these are simply examples. If your meeting is denied as part of your denial letter, FDA will indicate why the meeting was denied, as well as some tips for a pathway forward for you. If your meeting was granted, the identified FDA staff will, ident will assess your meeting package. If for product development meetings we have additional questions, we may issue you an information request and that can be sent at any point during the meeting time frame. For PSA meetings, we do not anticipate issuing any IRs simply because as part of the grant letter, we have already identified additional topics that we believe you should include in your final presentation. The preliminary comments. So these vary depending on what type of meeting you've been granted. If you are granted a product development meeting, the preliminary responses are, the, are FDA's preliminary response to the questions submitted in the meeting package. Upon receipt of these, you have the option to submit a revised agenda. That is, you feel that some of the questions that you've asked have already been answered and you don't need to discuss them at the external meeting. You have the ability to submit presentation materials as well to align with that revised agenda. Or if you feel that the preliminary responses adequately address your questions, you may cancel the meeting altogether. And you have the ability to change from a face-to-face -to, -face to a video conference. For PSEPs, the preliminary comments may request additional information for you to include in your final presentation, or it may simply indicate no further comment. We do ask that you submit your final presentation, which will be utilized during the external meeting 48 hours before the scheduled meeting, as that will help guide the discussion. It is very important. One big difference here is that the preliminary comments for a PSA meeting should not result in a cancellation of that meeting. So your meeting date has come. If you have a product development meeting, the meeting will follow your updated agenda and the discussion should focus on clarifying questions on the agency's preliminary comments. Please note that FDA will not address or comment on any new data or questions not presented in the original meeting package. For the piece of meetings, the meeting will follow your final presentation submitted and during which FDA will provide feedback on the items or information that we believe should be further clarified before your actual ANDA submission. Following the meeting, you as the applicant have the ability to submit a meeting summary of your understanding of the discussion seven calendar days after the meeting is held and the FDA meeting minutes will be issued within 30 calendar days after the meeting and the, these FDA issued meeting minutes are considered the official record of the meeting. If upon receipt of the meeting minutes, you have a dispute of the way the discussion was recorded, you may submit a dispute of meeting minutes within 10 days of calendar receipt by contacting your POC. If FDA determines that the meeting minutes accurately and sufficiently reflect the meeting discussion, the POC will convey this information to you. However, if after discussion, FDA deems it necessary to change the official meeting minutes, the changes would be documented in an addendum. If after all this, you still have additional questions or you have further clarification questions that remain, we recommend that you submit a control correspondence or a new meeting request as appropriate based on the type of questions that you still have. Challenge question number two. For product development meetings, what options do you, as the prospective applicant, have following receipt of the preliminary comments? You may submit a revised agenda and presentation materials at least 48 hours before your scheduled meeting. B, cancel the meeting altogether if the responses adequately address your questions. Or C, change from a face-to-face -face meeting to a video conference. Or D, all of the above. If you answer D, that is correct. As the applicant, you have these options.
Before I conclude my talk today, I do want to highlight this FDA SBI webinar, which was mentioned early this morning. It is on pre and pre submission meeting requests, benefits for and submission and approval, which will be a virtual webinar that is held on May 9th. I highly recommend if you have any questions about the P subs or would like more information of why a P sub may be beneficial to you, I recommend you register for this webinar as you will hopefully be able to get those questions answered. Here are the resources that I mentioned. I recommend, again, look, take a look at these if you're determining which pathway you want to follow, as well as as you're creating your package. And that concludes my talk today. I will be back at the Q&A if you have any additional questions, and I will pass it over to the next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hiran Patel uh, in Division of Bioequivalence 2 in OB within OGD. First of all, I would like to thank SPIA Organizing Committee for having me and Dr. Stodat for the nice introduction. As we heard multiple presentation on a pre and space as well as the control correspondence, in today's talk, I will be talking about the post-complete response later, scientific meeting request under GADUFA 3, and I will share some of the case studies. Uh, with that, I would before going into my presentation, I have the following disclaimer. This pre presentation reflects my views and should not be construed to represent FTS views or policy. Let's begin with the learning objective. Uh, the learning objective for my today's talks are to provide a brief overview of post-complete response later scientific meeting request under GADUFA 3. In my talk, I will use the abbreviated form CRL for the complete response later and MRs for the meeting request. I'll walk you through some of the historical information and case studies using this avenue, and I will conclude my presentation with take home message and do's and don'ts using to effectively use this avenue. I'll start with the background, and the purpose of a post CRL scientific MR is to provide a scientific advice to the applicant on possible approaches to address deficiency communicated in a CRL to establish bioequivalence. So the question may arise that which applications are qualified to utilize this platform, and I will break it down in two ways. The current thinking is if the drug product is complex and meet one of the criteria listed in the GADUFA 3 commitment later, then it is most likely that the MR is granted. Those four criteria include a new equivalent study needed to establish, uh, address the deficiency communicated in a CRL, or an approach that is different from that submitted in ANDA, or a new competitive use human factor study, or a new approach to demonstrate sameness of complex active pharmaceutical ingredient, or API. Alternatively, if the agency determined that the question asked in the meeting request raises the issue that are based address via this meeting process, and it will be beneficial to both applicant and the agency in terms of utilization of the resources, it falls under a category which I would call it a may grant situation and certain meeting requests can be or may be granted under with FDS discretion. So as I mentioned, some of the criteria listed in the commitment later, if it does not meet those criteria, then the meeting request is most likely denied. In addition, if the question asked in the meeting request is is more appropriate and effectively effective to be addressed via the control correspondence pathway, there are more chances that the meeting request can be denied. Incomplete, incomplete meeting package could be another possible reason for the denial of the meeting request. I understand this is very broad term, so what is called a complete meeting package? Ideally, the complete meeting package include but not limited to the list of questions and their relevant criteria listed in the GADUFA 3 commitment later. It is extremely helpful to provide a supporting rational or data as applicable for that, for that drug product. In addition, it is helpful to provide supporting information about the drug product, for example, complex or non-complex. As Dr. Murphy mentioned in the morning presentation, it is extremely helpful that the cover letter should clearly identify that this request is related to the post-CRL scientific MR. So I hope this provides a brief overview about 
a complete meeting package, and it should vary based on application to application. With that, I would like to provide some additional remark. As mentioned in the general guidance for industry, it is not a prerequisite to have a prior product development meeting for a respective ANDA to be eligible to request a post-CRL scientific meeting. In addition, prior post-CRL clarification teleconference to seek only clarification concerning deficiency identified in a CRL would not impact the eligibility to submit a post-CRL scientific meeting. If there are additional questions after post-CRL scientific meeting, there are two possible avenues. The applicant may submit a control correspondence, or if it meets the criteria, they can also submit another post-CRL scientific meeting to seek the additional feedback. I would like to emphasize that the same questions should not be asked at multiple avenue, which you also heard in the previous presentation. With that, I would like to provide a brief overview on the general timeline. This timeline applies to the ANDAs in a complete response status that meet the eligibility requirement for post-CRL scientific MR. On the day agency received the post-CRL scientific MR is considered as day zero. Within 14 days of the receipt of MR, the agency will issue the decision to grant or deny the meeting request. In the case of denial, denial later with justification should be issued to the applicant. If it is granted, the grant later will include a goal date for the return response or a meeting date, preliminary FTA attendee, and format of meeting into, in the, to the applicant. If the meeting is granted as a written response, within 90 days after the meeting request is granted, the agency will communicate the written response to the applicant. However, if the MR is granted as meeting, then within 85 days after the meeting request is granted or around five days prior to the meeting, agency intends to uh, issue a preliminary response to the applicant in preparation of the meeting. If the preliminary response is satisfactory to the applicant and there are no any additional discussion items, then applicant may submit a request to cancel the meeting. Alternatively, there will be a face-to-face -face or video conference. As you heard in the previous presentation, Garufa 3 commitment letter do indicate about the teleconference option. However, due to the nature of this meeting, agency encouraged to utilize the face-to-face -face and video conference to have a productive discussion on a scientific issue. It is also encouraged to submit updated agenda, list of follow-up or clarification question, and any proposed presentation material no later than 48 hours prior to the meeting. Once the meeting is held within 30 days, the agency will issue a final official meeting minutes to the applicant. If a due date falls on a weekend or a federal holiday, it will be moved to the preceding business day. So far, I have talked about the information from the Garufa 3 commitment letter and the information in the general guidance. Now, I will provide the information on the historical data using this avenue. As you may aware that the agency recently introduced the, a new platform that is post-CRL scientific uh, MR starting from October 2022. Within the first 16 months, the agency received a total of 25 post-CRL scientific MR. Out of those, 20 MRs were for the complex products, while five meeting requests for the non-complex product. A total of 17 MRs were granted, while eight were denied. As we can see in the chart, 18 applicants utilized this platform, and the blue color indicates the number of granted meeting, while orange color indicate the number of denied meeting for each of them. This slide further provides the breakdown of number of post-CRL scientific MR by route of administration and doses form. The inner circle represents the route of administration, which include topical, oral, injection, inhalation, subcutaneous, transdermal, and nasal and the outer circle represent the doses form for each of the route, administ route of administration along with the number of post-CRL scientific MR received for each of them. 
The take home message from this slide that this platform has been widely used for a range of doses form with different route of administration for generic drug product. Now let's take a closer look on the incoming application. Out of 17 MR requests, 16 were for the complex product and one meeting was for the non-complex product. As I mentioned earlier, some of the meeting requests were granted as it was for the complex product and met one of the criteria listed in the commitment later. Uh, in, in this regard, I have a further breakdown on number of post-CRL received for each of those criteria, which include criteria A, B, and D. However, in certain situations, the meeting request was granted with FTS discretion. In this regard, the meeting request asks a question related to alternative approach or having a multiple question and complex issue which require intra and inter office collaboration. There was an instance where there was a non-complex product. However, it met one of the criteria listed in the GADUFA 3 commitment later. So this is about the granted, uh, granted MRs, and I'm gonna talk about the denied meeting now. Out of the eight denied meetings, five meet MRs were for the complex products and three were for the non-complex product. The most common reason for the denial of the meeting request where the question asked in the meeting request were outside the scope and they were more appropriate or suitable for the control correspondence pathway. There was an instance where the same question were asked at the multiple avenue uh, and which resulted in a denial of the meeting. Now let's look at the distribution of the data of the incoming uh, granted, um, excuse me, granted meeting request. Majority of the time, uh, the meeting requests were granted as requested. However, with FTS discretion, it is determined on a case-by-case -case basis. In this regard, around 35% of the meeting requests were granted as a written response, while remaining around 65% of the meeting were granted as meeting. The further breakdown of those 65% meeting include 35% meeting requests were as video conference, 18% as face-to-face -face meeting and 12% as teleconference. As you can see, uh, the face-to-face -face meeting uh, is only 18% because the agency resumed the face-to-face -face meeting in the last October, that is October 2023, and this uh, correspond to only the four-month data. Uh, we anticipate uh, that this number will subject to change as we move forward with more face-to-face meeting. I would move to the lead office of granted meeting request. Before, talk, before talking about the data, I would like to briefly talk about what do I mean by the lead office. Lead office is the one who chaired the post-CRL scientific meeting when granted. However, due to the nature of this meeting, it is generally required collaboration across and within the offices and multiple offices are involved to address the question asked in the meeting request. In this regard, around 76% of the meeting requests were laid by Office of Bioequivalence, while OPQ led 18% of the granted meeting and OSC 6%. In today's presentation, I will use some of the case studies in which Office of Bioequivalence was the lead discipline, and I will categorize uh, for each of those examples. The first category is the drug product is for the complex product, and it meet the first criteria listed in the GADUFA 3 commitment later, that is a new equivalent study was needed, and the example is for the meter aerosol inhalation product. In the CRL, the agency communicated about the inadequacy about realistic aerodynamic particle size distribution and computational fluid dynamics modeling study. In the MR, the applicant proposed a detailed study design to address the deficiency communicated in CRL. The next example in this category is for the intravenous injectable product. In the CRL, the applicant was recommended to conduct a new pivotal in vitro particle size distribution study using adequate exhibit batches. In the MR, the applicant sought the feedback on the proposal of manufacturing three batches of taste product at commercial scale and utilize a modified approach to support bioequivalence following the recommendation in the PSG. 
The next category is for the complex product, and it meets the second criterion in the Garufa 3 commitment later, that is a different approach from submission in ANDAs. And the example is for the topical aerosol form product. In the CR, the applicant was recommended to conduct in vivo B study with clinical endpoint following the recommendation in the PSG. In the MR, the applicant proposed to pursue in vitro characterization based B approach. The next example in this category is for the topical lotion. The applicant was recommended to conduct one of the in vitro BE study, that is in vitro permeation test or IVPT, under characterization based B approach. In the MR, the applicant proposed a different approach that is physiological based pharmacokinetic or PBPK modeling to support the bioequivalence. The next category is a complex product and it met the two criteria listed in the Garufa 3 commitment letter, that is a new equivalence study was needed and a different approach from the submission in ANDA. And the example, this is a very interesting example of meter aerosol inhalation product. There were two different ANDAs for two different strengths for the same drug product by the same applicant. As the applicant utilized the similar study design, as well as the data are very similar within the scope, uh, within the scope of the bioequivalence assessment, similar issues were noted, which resulted in a similar deficiency communication to the applicant for both the application. In the MR, the applicant sought clarification and concurrence for a series of repeated or a new equivalent study to address communicated deficiency in a CRL for respective NDAs. To ensure the efficiency, a two-hour combined meeting was granted to discuss both the application. The next category is for the complex product with alternative approach, and the example is for the intravenous injectable product. In the MR, the applicant proposed an alternative approach for statistical evaluation of PKB study to address the deficiency in the CRL. The next example is for non-complex product with alternative approach, and the example is for the extended release oral tablet. In the MR, the applicant proposed an alternative approach that is utilization of population pharmacokinetic or POP-PK approach to address the deficiency comment related to T lag that was observed in the previously submitted data. The last category is for the non-complex product with the complex issue, and it is for the immediate release oral tablets. In the MR, the applicant sought the agency's input for utilization of alternative study design compared to the recommendation in the general guidance of industry for BCS-based biowaver and relevant challenges. Specifically, there were issues with the data due to the complexity and instability of API in the acidic media. I hope this provides a brief overview about the granted MRs. I would talk about some of the common observations for the denial of MRs. There were non-complex products, and the question asked in the meeting request were outside the scope of post-CRL scientific MR, and they were more suitable for the control correspondence pathway. There was an instance where more than one meeting request was requested to discuss particular or the same question at multiple avenue. In addition to that, request to reevaluate or reconsider the data along with dispute regarding the relevance of deficiency are some of the common observations for the denial of MR. With that, I would like to I would like to talk about the take home message from this presentation. I would start with the purpose. Uh, the purpose of the post CRL scientific MR is to provide a scientific advice on possible approaches to address communicated deficiency in a CRL related to establishing equivalence. FDA will not pre-review any specific scientific data submitted in the meeting package within the scope of post CRL scientific MR. However, it is encouraged to provide supporting data for the proposed approach as applicable. In general, the acceptability of any new approach along with study data is assessed upon submission of an ANDA amendment with relevant data and information. In my concluding remark, I would like to make a note that this is a great recently introduced platform to have a scientific discussion between the agency and the applicant to come on a consensus on a scientific issue to work towards the same goal, that is availability of a high quality generic drug product in a market in a timely manner. 
and we have received a tremendous positive feedback for this platform for, from the applicant who utilized this avenue. With that, it is time for the challenge question. If an applicant has an additional question after a post-CRL scientific meeting, the applicant may request a subsequent post-CRL scientific meeting or submit a control correspondence. Is it true or false? If you pick true, you are correct. The next challenge question is, since the applicant did not have product development meeting, the application is not qualified for post-CRL scientific MR, despite it is a complex product and meet one of the four criteria outlined in the GADUFA 3 commitment letter. That is correct. Uh, with that, I have some resources to refer and I would like to thank Drs. Nair, Vivian, Chiang, Zheng, Pai, and Roy. Um, and I would like to thank all biofuelant assessors for their efforts. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all of you to patiently listen to my presentation. Uh, with that, please keep sending your question, and I will hand it over to Captain Stodart for the panel discussion. Thank you. Okay, let's invite our panelists, our previous speakers for this session to join us at the podium. And we're also going to introduce an additional panelist, Karen Bengston, who is a Supervisory Regulatory Health Project Manager within the Office of Research and Standards at the Office of Generic Drugs. So we will do it like we did this morning. And I know that, you know, I did this quite unwittingly, but let's restrict ourselves to one question per person in-house. If you have more than one question, please feel free to go back to the back of the line. Should we have an opportunity, you'll get to ask that question. And we'll do mic one, mic two, assuming somebody's gonna come up to mic one and two. I know we had a lot of, I, I was speaking with people during lunch who had questions on, car, on control correspondence. Please come to the mic with your questions, anything through, through this um, session. And then we'll do in-house one, two, and then go back to online. Now, I know we have more than one person in the room with questions. Please come up to the mic. Let's get some energy here. You know, we, you know, we have put so much into this meeting, all our over almost 40 speakers, planning and everything for you. We've done it for you. This is the opportunity for you to ask those questions of our SMEs. This is the opportunity for you to get clarification and anything that we spoke about that has been bothering you, that you need clarification on, please, Take this opportunity to ask your questions. This is what we do. This is why we do it. We do it for you and this opportunity. I'm begging you to do it. Okay, let's start. Let's start over here for a change. Mike Kwan, in-house. Hi, uh, I have a question for the presenters of control correspondences. Uh, in case where we have control correspondences questions for dosage forms which are different from the RLD, uh, even though the final dispensing form is similar to the RLD, are we are we granted to submit a control correspondence, or do we need to go for a suitability petition, or can we like discuss it on a teleconference before we submit a CC? Um, just to clarify, is your question whether um, you can come in if you're not clear on the submission pathway? Um, sorry, whether it's a 505B2 or an ANDA? Is that the question? It's an ANDA, yeah. Oh, it's definitely an ANDA. Yeah. Do we need to repeat the question? 
Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, so I'll just give you an example. Like one would be a, a ready-to-use injection, and the RLD would be like a lyophilized vial for injection, even though they're different dosage forms, but the dispensing form would be an injection. So in this case, uh, can we still like uh, submit a controlled correspondence, or does it have to go through a suitability petition route? You mean the dosage form is different for the RLD and the ANDA? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the RLD is like a lyophilized powder for injection, but uh, and the and the ANDA proposed ANDA would be like a ready-to-use injection, but eventually it's dispensed as an injection. So that could be submitted as a control. It could be okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mike two, please. Uh, this is for the IID assessment of the excipient. Generally, as per the guideline says that for the topical drug product, we have to uh, do IID assessment by comparing percentage weight by volume or percentage weight by weight. But nowadays, I can see uh, MD uh, maximum daily exposure available for those excipients which are used in the topical drug products. So do we need to consider MDE or still percentage weight by weight is the uh, option? Yeah, I think in general, we still go with, uh, with by weight or with by volume, but for some, uh, for some drug products, we do go with uh, MDE for topical products. Oh, so some product means, is it related to the um, uh, um, API? Is it specific to API or some doses form kind? Yeah, so I mean, so if uh, I, uh, in the uh, controls, you request us to uh, evaluate MDE, then we will go with MDE. So that's general practice, I think. So, yeah. She doesn't seem convinced. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I think our current thinking is, um, Please submit as a percentage W by W. There are certain excipients which are a concern. So just from a conservative perspective, we do look at it, the amount perspective. But our kind of thinking is we are evaluating based on the percentage W by W or percentage W by V. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go online for a question, please. All right. This question is for Karen. A PSG issued for a drug recommending in vitro BE study later to be found by the sponsor during the clinical feasibility that it might take longer than expected. In such cases, would the agency be open to discussing alternative in vitro study suggestions under the product development meeting type? So thank you for the question. So if you're um, suggesting a study that's an in future study that's different than the study that's in the PSG and it's an alternative approach, there's a couple um, ways you could go. If it's within the same study type, you could also submit a control correspondence that the PSG is already posted. Uh, however, you could also consider a meeting and FDA will take into consideration whether as Maria mentioned in her presentation, there are several factors we take into consideration, whether the questions can be addressed in a control correspondence, whether the product is complex. Um, so all of those things will be taken into consideration and um, determine whether it should be granted or denied. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the house, please come to the microphones while we go to mic two. Hello, and thank you all for your presentations. Um, a question that I we kind of uh, deal with often is that you mentioned that in the frequently asked questions regarding fully packaging of a batch, but what does FDA advise <clears throat> for a dose proportional product where multiple strengths are manufactured from one master blend and there may be multiple packaging configurations? How What is considered in that case a fully packaged lot? Repeat the question for me one more time. Absolutely. Uh, so when there's a dose proportional product, so there's a master blend that is then, you know, uh, compressed into different strength tablets. Mm -hmm. um, so multiple are manufactured from one master blend and there's possibly, you know, multiple packaging configurations, maybe blisters and bottles. What 
what is considered a fully packaged lot in that case? So one of the exhibit batches will be packaged in both blisters and bottles, that's what you're saying? Yes. So then one exhibit batch should be fully packaged, however you're gonna do that. So if it's that exhibit batch has both blisters and bottles, then that batch has to be fully packaged with both container closures. But we also have the situation where it's a dose proportional, so there's multiple strengths from one master blend. Is that, and I assume we just submit a CC, but I was wondering what the overall feeling is from FDA on that. So are you gonna bracket some or are you, you but, bracket, if you're bracketing some, then the bracketed ones doesn't count. But for the ones that you're submitting stability on, one of those exhibit batches has to be fully packaged. Per strength. Say it again. Per strength. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Second question in house, please. Okay. Hi. So uh, we had an issue on uh, demonstrating the uh, equivalence on the non-complex project, but the demonstration of the approach is kind of complicated. Uh, we do understand that in this case is that it might not specifically qualify for all um, four, and it, it will depend on the department's resources if, if it's in, if capable to answer these kinds of questions. We did try to attempt on, uh, and furthermore, uh, there's no uh, PSG uh, issued, and also that's not in the upcoming list. Um, we do consider that it's uh, um, not complex due to the nature of itself. Uh, we did attempt um, to file a pre-dev pre um, um, meeting, but it was rejected because it's not um, considered as a complex project. We do understand that. Um, furthermore, we did try with the CC. Um, the uh, con consider of the complex of the question, it was quite briefly um, mentioned. It is answered, but we are we have some doubts on that. In this further cases, it's my only option just continue with an end of submission with this current approach. Um, so, if it's a non-complex product and they had decided it was not um, able to be submitted as a control, um, I think that if there's a, it was answered, just not sufficiently. No. If you have new questions, um, it, it, so a non-complex product could be granted at, at a product development meeting depending on the types of questions. So if those questions um, are more appropriate for control, um, then they would be, you should submit them as a control correspondence. Uh, the only way, um, sorry. <laughs> Somebody's drilling upstairs apparently. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think if, if, if if meeting is denied, they would tell you to submit a control correspondence if that was appropriate. Okay. You okay? Thank you. Before we go to the online questions, I do want to say if you're holding your questions because you think you're going to catch them at the networking event tonight, that may not be true. They may not all be there. So uh, please get your questions in when you can. Let's go online, please. All right, our next online question is from Marcia. Can controlled correspondence be submitted for inquiries related to post-approval changes for an approved ANDA? Thank you for the question. So controlled correspondence may be submitted for post-approved ANDAs related to, what was the latter part? Changes for an approved ANDA. Post-approval changes for an approved ANDA, yes, may be submitted as controlled correspondence. Thank you. In-house question, sir? Uh, an RLD that's been approved and available since 1973. Um, the active has remained unchanged. In 1997, uh, it's LIO. The active is LIO. In 1997, they changed the diluent and discontinued the original formula, uh, the original presentation. But the active is unchanged. We would like to use the existing active as our RLD, uh, we, this has been the, 
there was federal register notice that the product was discontinued, but it still had an excellent safety profile. We believe this is a controlled correspondence uh, communication to whom, and am I correct in thinking that that's controlled correspondence? Thank you for your question. You said, can you submit that as a controlled correspondence? Is that your question? We think it's controlled correspondence, but what type and to whom? Should it be to your group? Should it? Uh... Yes, it, it can come to our group. That's a no RLD, right? RLD not available, control correspondence? Correct. The RLD yes. that we will be referencing is because it was discontinued, but the active is the same as what is currently out there, just a different diluent. Yes, it can come to our group, or you can also send it to the Orange Book group as well. Can um, you repeat that answer, please, um, because of the drilling? Oh, repeat, oh, yeah. sorry. Okay, yes, I said for a no RLD control correspondence, you can send it to our group, Office of um, Pharmaceutical Quality. You can also send it to the Office of um, the Orange Book Office in OGD, and we work together with those ones. The ones we cannot answer, we send it to them. So either one would be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Next question in house, please. So, control correspondence guidelines says that uh, CC cannot be submitted for the impurity limit. Uh, recently, FDA has published a guideline for the ophthalmic drug products quality considerations, which have given some new thresholds for the qualification and unknown impurities. So, if you have any concern, like um, should we follow the uh, quality consideration of ophthalmic guidelines, or can we follow the ICH criteria still? Can we do CC for that? Kindly repeat your question. Yes, sure. yes sure. no worry. So there is a new guideline came recently for the ophthalmic quality consideration, which has defined quality th qualification threshold and identification thresholds, which are different than the ICH guidelines threshold. So like if any product is under development, it was with the ICH requirements, but now new guideline came up. So to get the clarification on the specification limit, that should, should we go for the uh, updated guideline or the still ICH is valid? For that, can we submit CC or it will be like a rejection? You can submit a CC. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yeah, we, because yeah, it says to that, find out which guidance to use since there's a new one out. Is that what you're? Yes. Saying? Yes. Yes. You can submit a control correspondence. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next question online, please. This question is for Zen Zhang. If we had a sub, if we had submitted a controlled correspondence for a topical product, can we submit an ANDA before receiving the response from the agency? Sorry, can you repeat? I cannot hear. <laughs> sure, I'll repeat that. Um, if we had submitted a controlled correspondence for a topical product, can we submit an ANDA before receiving the response from the agency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in that case, you have to withdraw the control correspondence. Yeah. Okay, nothing else in-house. Uh, next online, please. Sure, uh, another question for Marcia. Is it mandatory under GDUFA 3 to submit a cover letter attachment to a controlled correspondence? Thank you for the question. No, that is optional. The uh, cover letter attachment is optional and it should not replace the cover letter. So you have the option to submit both the cover letter and the cover letter attachment, or you can just submit the cover letter without the cover letter attachment. It can serve as a checklist to make sure that you've included all the information, but it does not substitute the cover letter. Thank you for that very explicit answer there. Um, next online, please. Sure. This question is for Karen. For a parenteral product, if the RLD has a pharmacy bulk package, but not an Im imaging bulk package, and the generic sponsor wishes to introduce an imaging bulk package, 
is this a question for a controlled correspondence or a suitability position? Please repeat the question one more time. Sure. For a parenteral product, if the RLD has a pharmacy bulk package but not an imaging bulk package and the generic sponsor wishes to introduce an imaging bulk package, is this a question for a controlled correspondence or a suitability petition? You could submit that as a control. I'm sorry, can you repeat that, Karen? Uh, that could be submitted as control correspondence. Suitability? No, control correspondence. Con control correspondence. Okay. Oh, we have another brave soul. Well, this soul has been very brave throughout the day. Uh, question <laughs> in-house, please, after the drilling has stopped. Okay, let's see if we could get that question in. So this is for one of the product which is under development and have some impurity concern. But RLD is like in the RX category, but we are not able to get the sample from the market. And there is no other generic approved in the market. So to resolve the impurity issue, what should be the way forward? Please come again one more time. Yes, yeah. Okay. So this is for the product uh, which is under development and that has one impurity issue, like it's crossing the ICH qualification limit. So as per MAPB, it says that the easiest way to justify the impurity limit is to compare your result with the RLD result. But RLD is not available in the market. I am not able to get the sample from the market. So how to get a or what sample should I request, or what should be the way forward to resolve this issue? I think my advice would be to submit a control correspondence and the experts will look at it and respond. respond. Okay, so as part of that control correspondence, what data should be needed? Like, um, can, because it will not have a, can I submit the safety data as part of CC? Just um, submit your question with everything, you know, every um, data that supports your question or, or background to your question, as much background as you can give possibly with your question. Okay, yes. thank you. Second, and so that, um, you do have a question, thank you. It's more fun when you get your own question answered, isn't it? Yeah, quick question in relation to uh, proper calculation of MDE. So we recently encountered a situation where we received feedback um, and the agency calculated an MDE uh, based on a withdrawn indication. So we were wondering if we could get sort of the agency, uh, you know, agency feedback on what the basis, what legal basis there is to calculate an MDE based on an indication that no longer appears on the labeling. And it, you know, if how we could potentially follow up on that to get that uh, addressed. Yeah, scientifically we should use, uh, so I, first of all, I'm not aware of your case. So scientifically we should use uh, most current uh, indication to calculate uh, uh, MDE. But if you don't agree with our uh, responses or have any questions, you can have a follow-up uh, control correspondence submitted to us. Thank you. Thank you. Online, please. Okay. We have a question for Maria. If I have additional questions that were not addressed during my meeting, can I submit a controlled correspondence or new meeting request? Thank you for that question. Yes, so if you have additional questions following your product development meeting, you may submit a control correspondence or a subsequent meeting. However, we do recommend one pre and the development meeting a year um, because the subsequent one should have new questions with new data or information. Thank you. Okay, next online question, please. Sure, question for Hiran. Based on your presentation, the qualification criteria for post-CRL scientific meeting requests under FDA's judgment are very broad. 
Would you please provide some insights on what falls under FDA's judgment? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think as, as rightly mentioned in the, in the question, it is it may be very broad in nature. Um, there is no ex explicit list on what falls under FDA's judgment. Uh, I would say there are several factors that are taken into consideration to possibly broaden the, the scope of post CRL scientific MR to help industry. And I just want to say that, you know, there are representatives from multiple offices are involved in making the decision of grant and deny across the application to assure we are making a consistent decision on that. And I want to go back to my presentation. I think uh, I mentioned then, and again, this is my personal opinion that, you know, factors like an alternative approach or, or a multiple equation or, or complex issue which require inter and intra office collaboration or as well as like we heard some of the presentation this morning uh, a drug shortage issue public health emergency those those are the factors that we take into consideration uh, under that category called fda's judgment uh, so i just want to make say i want to reiterate that these are not the sole factor and it's on a case by case basis but these are some of the factors that we do take into consideration to grant the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Next online question, please. Thank you. Another question for Marcia. When a pH waiver is submitted to FDA for review as a controlled correspondence, will FDA classify the controlled correspondence as a level one change? To clarify the question, thank you for it. For pH waivers that are submitted, will the control correspondence answer the question designating it whether it's a level one change? So they're asking for the answer to the, I, I, I'm unable to answer that at this time. I would recommend that they either email generic drugs at FDA.HHS or submit the specific, that specific question with their control correspondence because I wouldn't be able to provide the answer on how it would be designated. Thank you. Online question, please. Okay. All right. We have another question for Marcia as well. At times, we follow the FDA guidance, but our controlled correspondence is not considered substantive and is rejected when a minor typographical error is made. Is there a way to amend a controlled correspondence rejected for minor errors? Note the information is accurately entered in Cedar Next Gen. Thank you for the question. So the latter, the latter part, you said what is in the Cedar Next Gen portal? What part? It is uh, correct in the Cedar Next Gen portal? Yes, the information is accurately entered in Cedar Next Gen. But the documents submitted have typographical errors. Yeah, minor typographical errors made. Right. And so the approach for amending it, to me, just seems like resubmitting it. So yes, we welcome for you to resubmit it with the correction. So I apologize for the inconvenience. Um, but we just want to ensure that the reviewers have accurate information and we serve as the gatekeepers in that respect. So I apologize, but I would say the amendment would serve as the resubmission and we do welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Online question? Okay. We'll do another question for Maria. If I did not have a product development meeting um, but and want to present a novel idea to FDA, can I still submit a pre-submission request? Thank you for that question. Yes, you may still submit a piece of meeting request if you did not have a product development meeting. But just as a reminder, you need to, as part of your package, include why the piece of should be granted and the grant decision would be at FDA's judgment. Thank you. Thank you. I hope these questions and answers are uh, resonating with you. Uh, everyone online and in-house as well, and they are really helping everyone, even though it's not something that you specifically asked. Next online question, please. Okay, uh, well, we have a question for Zen. What occurs if an applicant addresses a controlled correspondence to an incorrect discipline? Yes, yeah, so, uh, first of all, we highly recommend that applicants to get familiar with 
uh, discipline review responsibilities described in the guidance and also write uh, clear and concise uh, questions in the control. Uh, we do understand uh, in some scenarios, uh, questions may not be, may be difficult for applicants to identify the, uh, the most appropriate uh, uh, review disciplines. In those cases, we do have internal uh, triage process to handle those situations. Thank you. Okay, let's see. We have time for one more online question. Okay, question for Jen. How many batches of drug products should be tested for split portions of scored tablets? One batch. That was the shortest and sweetest answer. <laughs> Okay, so we are getting ready to break. Thank you all for your questions and for the panelists. Before we scatter, for those of you who are parked in the hotel's garage, if you did not get your voucher, which allows you to get a discount, and that means you only pay $10 as opposed to $27, I believe, uh, ask at the registration desk outside. And so let's break now. We will return at 3.05. Thank you. A big round of applause for our panelists. You guys are marvelous.
I am, as usual, going to announce all our speakers at the same time, and then um, we start with our first speaker. And so to get the ball rolling on this last grouping, our topic, our next topic and presentation will be under program statistics. Uh, this presentation will provide the sources and meaning of key under program statistics. Our speaker here will be Edward, but he likes to be called Ted Sherwood, the Director, Office of Regulatory Operations at OGD. And after that, our next presentation will be under project management topics, pre-launch activities, importation requests, better known as PLAY, and cover letter attachments. And that will be given by Dr. Andrew Kim, I should say Commander Andrew Kim, Supervisory Project Manager within the Division of Project Management at ORO, OGD. And, and that will be shared with Andre Perloni, who is the Branch Chief of Imports Compliance Branch, Division of Global Drug Distribution and Policy in the Office of Drug Security, Integrity and Response at the Office of Compliance. And then the last, I believe, no, then the next, and that will be given with Dr. Tom Ching, Regulatory Project Manager, Division of Project Management at ORO OGD. And then the presentation following that will be quality and the submission best practices and communications. And here best practices from project management perspective will be presented. And that will be given by Lieutenant Commander Stephen Yang, Regulatory Business Process Manager, Division of Regulatory and Business Process Management 4, within OPRO at OPQ. So let's welcome Ted Sherwood, the first speaker of this group of presentations. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna take a different perspective here. We're gonna look at the program statistics. So for those who know me, you understand, right? They want me to work with numbers, not words, while we're up here. So what we're gonna do is go over a very high-level overview of the key statistics for the program. We're gonna be providing some insights. We're gonna look at how you can check on the performance of the program. And then we're gonna talk for a few minutes about an increased level of interest in supplements. As you've seen throughout the program, we have the key, so we'll be touching many of these points throughout today's presentation. We're gonna walk through the key statistical reports that the program publishes. This is for the entire ANDA program. We're gonna go through the monthly and quarterly reports. We're gonna look at the new fiscal year web posting, which is up and live. We'll talk about the historic GDUFA performance reports. We'll also briefly go through both the competitive generic therapy approvals and the FDA track reports that are out there. Quick note, the majority of the reports that the agency puts out, and certainly the very formal ones, are gonna be on the fiscal year. So just sort of keep that in mind as you look through, and certainly there's gonna be a difference between the fiscal year and the calendar year numbers for those who like to do a little bit of the comparison. Fiscal year aligns with all of the user fee programs, and it also aligns with some of the other non-user fee commitments that we have as a federal entity. So in going through the monthly and quarterly reports, this is your best source of information about what's happening within the program. It's gonna capture actions. That's everybody's favorite, the approvals, tentative approvals, complete response letters. We're gonna get into the submissions. What are you guys sending us? What's in the queue? We'll also, on a quarterly basis, update the approval times, and we'll give you a little bit more information about that as we go through this afternoon's presentation. So as you can see, both mean and median, time for the approval, and for the tentative approval are posted. In fact, the new quarterly reports are up there so you can see what's going on already into quarter one for this FY. When we talk about the approval time, very important to understand when it starts and when it stops. It starts with the accepted application. If we refuse it, it doesn't count. But when it's accepted, that submission date for that acceptance all the way through to the first approval or tentative approval, that's what we're counting. So that means when you look at the total time to approval for an application, it's both times with the FDA and times with the companies, time responding to information requests, time responding to formal complete response letters where it's totally off our clock, 
that still does get compressed within the start to finish approval time. So I'll certainly keep that in mind. Here's sort of a diagram outlining what we just spoke about. You can see all the different touch points that happen and how busy the team is sort of in the middle, making sure that everything is running right. And then we'll get into a little bit on these calculations. And the reason why we're gonna end it with the first action, whether it's approval or tentative approval, that stops it. Now that means there can be subsequent actions. Tentative approval, great example. We want there to be a subsequent action that comes in to convert that tentative approval into a full approval. There are certain cases after a full approval. Company can come in and get a new strength approval. Right? That can be part of the original application, just depending on how it's submitted from the applicant. So we do have split cases. That second approval is still going to go through. None of that's on the clock. It stops with that first one. Right? That's giving you the most meaningful information in terms of, I want to submit an application today. What does the landscape look like? And so as we go through to the next report, you can see a little bit more on the variation between the mean and median. We expect that. Lots of things happening, clusters of applications moving forward, different efforts on industry to clean house. Periodically, we see that. Company starts to move a particular set of applications through. That can all add to the variability. So we expect that deviation. We're looking at quarter to quarter. I want to point out that there's a big difference between the mean, the average, and the median time. We expect that too. What that shows is the level of effort that's going into the new applications that are being submitted under GDUFA 3. Pick those up, move them forward. What we often see with companies is making a decision. Do I work on an old application or do I continue to work on application that was more newly submitted? Are you gonna have a choice as a company? I have an IR or DRL that came from the agency. At the same time, I have a complete response on another application. Where do I move my resources? You guys will have to answer those questions, but we can see how that plays out. Companies are focusing their efforts on the newer applications. They're focusing on answering the IRs and DRLs because those have very tight response timeframes, and they're letting some of the older applications language. And so what we see with that big difference is there's a lot of old applications that industry is still interested in. They're just moving them through at a slower pace. We'll take anything. It's our job to deal with it. You send it in, we'll jump on it. If you're gonna be slow, then let us know. And of course, there's some other requirements if it's gonna take you longer than a year to submit your response. Let us know, we'll work with you. There's a depiction of the approval times and really a set of three of these we'll move through very quickly. I wanna highlight the impact of the user fee programs, especially wanna highlight the impact of putting in goals. As you can see, the goal is now driving the response. We take those goals very seriously a lot of effort and coordination. Typical government, a lot of just-in-time management, people scrambling around at the end to make sure that application is ready to go and all the pieces are in place. And so you can see right, our response is coming in right at that goal date. That's huge win for the program. Now we'll go to a challenge question. New application approval times, are they likely to be longer than prior years, the same as prior years, or faster? Vast majority of the time, they're gonna be flowing through much quicker. Obviously, there's exceptions, but if you take advantage of the different tools, the communications, you've already heard about the meetings, these applications can fly through. Now, shift gears a little bit into imminent action, or for those who've been around a little while, it used to be called the imminent approval process. We will miss the original goal date in certain situations where it's in everybody's best interest to move an application into that final tentative approval or approval. If it's an important product, we'll get it done. We'll skip the TA and go right into approval. We'll move products for big forfeiture dates. And so we will work with the company. Try to give us as much of the goal period as possible, but clearly denote in your cover letter, this has an ELI date of XYZ. We will work with you when it's feasible. The other one is to bring a small issue to approval or tentative approval. We're nearly done. We have finished our assessment on time. We could issue the complete response and meet the goal. But 
we want you to finish that application. Get it over the threshold, right? cross the finish line. And so we will send what often comes across as a very late cycle IR or DRL. Oftentimes these have even shorter response times. We're getting near the goal date. You may see a date a couple weeks in advance of the goal date. That's an indication that we may be trying to move your application towards the approval or tentative approval with this imminent action pathway as opposed to taking that hard time out and pulling together the complete response letter, which of course formally puts it back in your court and starts the whole new queue and all of those things. So provide a thorough response, that's the key. And then if you have any issues with the status of the application, you're not sure, is it moving the right direction or not, talk to the regulatory project manager and you're gonna hear from a couple of them in a few moments. Now, we wanna point out a couple things. There has been some criticism of the agency in the past that we're over counting tentative approvals. We count each time a package goes out the door with a tentative approval, it's as simple as that. This effort actually costs us. It reduces our tentative approval count because we will skip the tentative approval if we're very close to that full approval date. Because we know there's not gonna be enough time for you to receive the tentative approval, pull together the final conversion request, and of course get it back to us to do all the double checks. Is the facility still good? Is the DMF good? Is the labeling up to date? All of those kind of things. So if you're real close to getting it, we'll push you through. Talk to the project manager. They can help in these situations. We do that on purpose. Right? That's the win. You guys then get better business certainty. You know when your dates are coming up, you can start to monitor the communications from the team. It increases your chance of being approved on that early lawful approval date. Right? That's the earliest date we're allowed to take the official approval action. And it also takes the worry out of some of the submission timing, which we'll show you some examples of in a couple slides. First, you don't have to worry as much about the weekends. I know in the past I'd receive calls, oh, if I send it in today, the 90 day, it's gonna be on the weekend, what do I do? We got the big ELOD date coming up. This takes care of all of that. Send it in, give us a couple extra days in front of the ELOD, that's fine. Like you don't have to time it perfectly, you don't have to worry about leap day and other things. We've had companies call us, we're not sure what happens, or there's a holiday, or sometimes there's even unexpected government holidays. Don't worry. Give us as much of that goal aid as possible, err on the side of having that 90 days if it's a minor amendment conversion come a day or two before the ELOD. We will work with you to make sure we hit that date. If it's on a weekend, then obviously we're forced to take action the next business day. Right, we'll take that into account. Let me make sure everybody understands that. If there's no ELOD, then we'll work ahead of the weekend. But if there's an ELOD, we can't approve it before. And, and that's worth repeating because a lot of times companies will call me on Friday, the ELOD Saturday, we don't have the approval. That's not a failure. That's a sign of success. Our folks have managed the legal landscape and lined that application up for success. Then the goal dates before the ELOD, we talked about that a little bit. That's fine, we'll work with you. We'll use this process to move that application past the goal date, give you the approval on the ELOD. Do this to help you, and we do this to help the patients. They are getting access to this product. That's part of our mission, safe, effective, high quality generic drugs available to the patients. This helps get that into the hands of the patients. Imminent action statistics. This has caused a little bit of sort of double counting by people. When we show this statistic, 57 approvals, six of them are imminent actions. That means out of those 57, those actions occurred. We're not lining up and counting potential things in the future. These are real. We took an action that month that was an imminent action. It was a full approval. We worked past the goal date to get you that full approval. Then we have a physical year web posting. This is new from Gadufa 3. Lots of data captured on all different aspects of the application cycles, the originals, the amendments, supplements. A lot of information on meetings, DMFs, statistics on the imminent actions that we just spoke about. will help you understand how to read the report. And in this case, very simple. 
we have to do this based on the data that's available at the time. So oftentimes, the preliminary numbers are going to be just that. These are long goal dates. Some of the goal dates are 10 months, not even counting imminent actions or other type of extensions. So certainly an application submitted in one fiscal year can cross over into the next fiscal year. At the end of the first fiscal year, we've got to do a preliminary report. How many did we answer out of all those that came in? How many of those answered were on time? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you data as close to real time as possible. We are not waiting for that last application that's fully baked years from now to work its way across. That's too late for you to figure out what's going on. We do this too to help keep all of the user fee programs lined up and messaging consistently. Now what we did with the web report is we took sections out of the historic performance report and put them into the web version. We tried to mimic the physical sort of layout as much as possible. The old performance report actually has its origins into a paper format. What we've done here is try to modernize a little bit, go right to the web page, get it out into the public hands sooner. But it's the same information. We've actually just taken sections out of the old performance report, put them on the web so you can see it sooner. We are still going to leave the key information in the formal performance reports. But this helps you. You can see what's going on. You can measure how your company's doing against sort of the aggregate of information that we're capturing on these reports. And very important, too, for industry, that it helps to focus other government agencies on goals that really matter. We are graded on the official performance report. And so we will put the high level goals in there. And if we fail those goals, then shame on us. Now, we will work very hard not to. And we have a great track record of meeting the goals. At the same time, there are all sorts of different sub goals that are out there. Amendments, supplements, amendments to supplements, PFCs, right? sending the facility information in advance with a supplement, without a supplement, with an amendment, without an amendment. By the time you map those out, even though we deal with thousands of applications, there are certain cases where the total pool is less than 10 applications. We miss one, somebody like GAO can come in and audit. So let's take that off the table. We'll focus on the high level metrics. You will still get to see data on all of those smaller metrics. That's what will be captured in the web report. You'll know whether the amendment with the PFC, did we do six out of seven? But you don't want us having to report that to GAO because what that means is GAO lands Everybody gets wet. We've got to stop doing our work, educate them on what's going on in the program, show them that it's a one-off type of issue where the other hundreds and hundreds of applications are moving through successfully. And in case of supplements, thousands of applications moving through successfully. And it keeps us from having to publicly report the reason we missed. Sometimes it's us. We all know that. Sometimes it's not us. And you don't want us to say it was a facility that had data integrity issues. It was a facility where we we're waiting for another federal agency to take an official action on. That doesn't help you, and it doesn't help the larger generic industry. So we think this is a responsible way of still sharing all of the information we had done, but keeping the spotlight on what really matters. Then there's a potential range that's included here. Gives the absolute worst case, absolute best case. If we miss everything else from today or we make everything else, that's what it comes out to. So when we look at this, there's an imminent actions column. That's what really matters. That should be your takeaway from the report. In the commitment letter, it allows us to go through past the goal date, as long as we follow these rules, and get an approval or tentative approval action to you within 60 days. And so if you see a metric percent completed on time, sort of the gray here in your chart, looks like it's below the 90% commitment. That's because we're turning a majority of these into real approval actions. Go to the green, that little circle at the end, we're at 90%. That's not a failure, that's a success. We could have given you the complete response in the majority of times and gotten credit for the goal, but we will work towards the approval. So challenge question. Imminent actions reported as a subset of the approvals and tentative approvals, additive, or future ones. It's a subset. We're only going to report what actually happened. We're not getting into the prediction game. Does an imminent action count as meeting the goal if it's approved in a second cycle? 
if it's done prior to the goal date, if it's done within 60 days of the goal date, or with 61 days or later, 60 days. If we approve it on day 61, you get the approval, we take the miss. So we work very hard to hit that 60 days. Then there's the official performance report. This has been out for many years, so we don't need to, to walk through that. Competitive generic therapies, if you're looking to see where we need to align together to work to move applications to help, take a look at this. FDA track, it's got a lot of information. What's very unique is it gives you a little bit more insights into how the first cycle performance is looking. Did all this work to compile the application? I sent it to the agency, how are they doing? So what to watch for? Fewer complete response letters. That doesn't mean there's a problem. It means we're using the extensions. It's in the commitment. Industry asks, oh, we're close to the finish line, work it through. We're doing that. Fewer minor amendments being received. It's not that industry is shutting down. It's the fact that we're sending out the extensions. If you're refused to receive rate lower than average, you're doing it right. You're getting fewer complete response letters. You're doing it right. You're approved on the ELOD. We're both doing it right. Your approval time is low. We're both doing it right. We're working together. Then I want to end with some information on supplements. We're seeing more and more interest on these. People asking what type to change, getting status requests on CBEs at an alarming rate, much more than we have historically. Over 10,000 submitted. Right? Divide that number by the number of people we have, a staggering amount, especially if you're a project manager. An application's an application. A supplement has all the same features. Triage, letter prepared, all of those kind of things. You may have to advance. I'm stalled out here. Story of my career, right? All right, record year for approvals. When you combined everything that's come in on the supplements, right off the charts, we approved more than we received. And as we talked about more interest from companies, it means they're calling their congressman, they're calling the commissioner. So we're seeing more interest from other people at an alarming rate. I think we're back on here, thank you. Now here's some statistics, right? You can sort of see the trend up and up. And here's a great one. Prior approval supplements. Look at the difference when we took the fee away at the beginning of FY18 and the growth since then. So lots and lots of data is available out there. You can gauge the success of Gadufa 3. You can look at the health of our program. You can look at the health of your company. How are you stacking up with other companies that are out there? And it's a great time to submit the ANDA. You submit it, you take advantage of some of these opportunities we've been talking about at this conference. It will sail through very quickly. And we'll work on the supplements. You don't know how many times I'm called, hey, can you hurry up and approve it because we need to then send in our supplements because we got a bigger launch date coming up later on. We will work with the application, pre-approval, post-approval, whatever it takes to make the product available. So with that, thank you guys very much. And I will turn it over to Andre. He's going to talk a little bit more. Hi, um, good afternoon. My name is Andre Perloni. I'm the branch chief for the Imports Compliance Branch in the Division of Global Drug Distribution and Policy in the Office of Drug Security, Integrity, and Response in the Office of Compliance. I will be talking about, uh, provide an overview of the pre-launch activities importation request, or as we call it, player. Learning objectives. Um, player overview and product eligibility, define when and how a player can be submitted, list the information that should be submitted to FDA in a player, and explain the circumstances under which FDA intends to grant the player and the import process. Why player? Section 505A of the Food and Drug and Cosmetic Act prohibit the introduction into interstate commerce of any new drug unless an approval of an application is effective. 
Section 801A3 of the Act, in part also say that the drug being imported is subject to refusal of admission if it's in violation of Section 505 of the Act. The player allows under certain circumstances product sponsors anticipating approval of a drug application to import the unapproved uh, new drug to prepare for market launch. What products are eligible? A finished dosage form drug product that is being imported to prepare for US market launch based on anticipated approval of a pending NDA, ANDA or ANDA, or a BLA regulated by CDER. A finished dosage of um, bulk product that may require minimal further processing such as final packaging and or labeling or being a final package form. The player does not apply to APIs or active pharmaceutical ingredients or drug products subject to a supplement. When to submit a player? A player should be submitted at least 30 days prior to the proposed entry date of the shipment to allow, allow time to process the submission. Additional time frame considerations. NDAs, ANDAs, and BLA subjects to standard review no more than 60 days before the user fee goal day. NDAs and BLA subject to priority review uh, up to 120 days before the user fee goal day. And a subject to priority review up to 80 days before the user fee goal day. How to submit a player? FDA has developed an electronic submission system through the CEDAR Next Gen Portal. The CEDAR Next Gen Portal permits an applicant or authorized US agent to submit a player request to FDA electronically. It provides real time communication with receipt confirmation, two way communication. Uh, and communication history in a centralized location, a multi-factor authentication to ensure data security. What must be included in a player? The drug product name and how it's supplied, the name of the CDER Office of New Drug and Office of Generic Drug Regulatory Project Manager assigned to the pending application, the NDC number if one is assigned, uh, the name and address, registration number, and telephone number of the foreign manufacturer of the finished dosage form drug product. The name and address, registration number, and telephone number of the US consignee. Application number of the finished dosage form product pending the FDA approval. A letter from FDA officially documenting the user fee goal day. And the precise quantity to be imported. Please note that only one import shipment will be allowed under a granted player. Um, name, facility identification, and telephone number of where the finished dosage form drug product will be stored pending approval. And for cases where there's uh, minimal processing, right, information about the facility and the description of what that minimal uh, processes is. Um, the authorized representative applicant will also acknowledge that the product is an unapproved new drug and that the player represents the applicant's request to recondition the product under Section 801B of the Act and, the 20, and 21 CFR 195 by obtaining product approval within the specified time frame. What actions FDA will take? Once a player is submitted, CEDAR player program will confirm receipt of the submission through the CEDAR Next Gen portal. CEDAR will review the submission and assess completeness, timeliness, and among other things, foreign facility inspection history and conformity with applicable CGMPs. Following this review, the CEDAR player program will notify the applicant whether the player has been granted or denied through the CEDAR Next Gen portal. We're good. We're, now we're going to go to the importation process. The importer will upload the granted player le letter into the import trade auxiliary communication system or will email the import ORA division where the entry is presented. Uh, it will use 
the affirmation of compliance for player in the and the application number in the CVP's automated uh, commercial environment system. Ensure that the foreign manufacturers is registered and include all non-importers in the registration prior to importation. Um, the importer will uh, upload the information of oh, I already. <laughs> FDA will detain the product six months as an unapproved new drug and authorize the recondition in the manner and the conditions that were set forth in the granted player. How you secure, how you secure release after detention when the application is approved. You will upload the approval letter into ITAX and the CEDAR uh, NextGen portal or, e, or you will email the FDA import district where the product is detained to secure release. No FDA Form 766 is required. Uh, the player coverage that will be done to bring the product into compliance. FDA intends to refuse the unapproved drug if the application is not approved or six months has passed since the detention. The unapproved finished dosage form drug must be exported or destroyed within 90 days if it's refuse of admission. Here are some resources that are available. We have the player guidance that describe what I just uh, uh, described in this presentation. We have our uh, human drug import web page, right? And some useful links to some of the information that is needed by the importer. Uh, how to contact us, you can email us at cdrocplayermailbox at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Kim, and I'm a supervisor for the Division of Project Management in the Office of Generic Drugs. Andre gave a great presentation on Player from the Office of Compliance perspective. Today, I'm going to zoom in a little and focus specifically on PLAIR for ANDAs and give you the Office of Generic Drugs perspective. So there are three main points I want to cover, which are one, describe OGD's PLAIR process for ANDAs. Two, explain OGD's goal for PLAIR. And three, I want to leave you with some tips to maximize your chances for the FDA to grant the PLAIR. As Andre covered earlier, the player request begins with the Office of Compliance evaluating the player request and assigning it to the Deputy Director for the Division of Project Management. DPM's role is to decide if the player should be granted or denied. The player guidance provides request submission timeframes, or what I'll call the 30-60-80 rule. So all requests can be submitted no less than 30 days prior to the goal date or action date. For standard review applications, player requests can be submitted 60 days prior to the goal date. And for priority review applications, they can be submitted 80 days prior to the goal date. The deputy director then checks the database, and if the outcome is unclear, they'll request the regulatory project manager, or RPM, to evaluate the likelihood of the disciplines being adequate or inadequate. The RPM will then consult with discipline PMs, and if the outcome is inadequate, they'll recommend denial of the player. If the pending disciplines are likely to be adequate and other disciplines are adequate, the RPM will recommend that the player be granted. Finally, the deputy director will then communicate that grant or deny decision to the Office of Compliance. So in an effort to mature the player program, OGD's goal is to maximize the usefulness of player by granting in advance of the goal date while also avoiding a granted player that inaccurately indicates an upcoming action. So as a result, there will be more players granted independent of a formal adequate decision. And, as, and finally, there will be more time required to grant the player. So for example, as I had mentioned earlier, for a priority review application, which 
the player can be submitted up to 80 days prior to the goal date. In these instances, sometimes the decision making on players may be deferred until an assessment of the disciplines, uh, until, the, until the assessment of the disciplines which are still pe pending may be made. So the next two slides here are a little wordy, but I wanted to provide you um, specific examples so that you can uh, refer to it later. So for players submitted in a pending original ANDA or major amendment, OGD will now delay its response to a player if OGD believes an assessment decision is coming soon. So this is in contrast to previous practice where OGD would immediately recommend denial in the absence of an ANDA assessment being complete and adequate for relevant portions of the pending application. By deferring decision-making on players in this situation to later on in the review cycle, the goal is to allow for more players to be granted. For players submitted in a pending minor amendment, if the discipline or disciplines have not yet completed their assessment when a player is received, OGD may now recommend granting the player an absent of a signal of a potential deficiency. So this is a paradigm shift where previously a grant decision was only made when the disciplines had completed their assessments and found their portion of the application to be adequate. It's important to note that FDA granting of a player does not represent an implicit or explicit statement of the approvability of the ANDA. And if FDA does not approve the application, the product is subject to a refusal of admission into the United States. We try to balance the industry's desire to grant more players while balancing avoiding too many granted player that inaccurately indicates an upcoming action and potential for the product to be subject to refusal. However, there will be some inherent risk and in certain situations where a granted player will not lead to an approval in time, leading to a refusal of admission into the US. Finally, I want to leave you with some tips to maximize your chances that the FDA will grant your player. If you follow these tips, the odds will increase of a player being granted. First, complete your amendments, meaning address all of the comments from a CRL, IRDRL, with your amendments. Number two, address your IRDRLs on time. However, don't violate the first tip by racing to respond on time without addressing all of the comments or questions, which may lead to more cycles or an incomplete response. Number three, assure facilities are adequate. Having facility problems is one way to guarantee a player denial. Four, assure DMFs are adequate and, aw and be aware of the ANDA action timing. Be in communication with your DMF holders so that there are no unsolicited DMF amendments submitted close to action, which could delay approval due to DMF amendments having to be reviewed. Number five, and I think this is the most important, but work with your regulatory project manager or RPM. While they cannot provide you a specific approval date, they can provide you the current discipline review statuses, a rough estimate of action dates, provide you an advice on when to check back on the status, and also provide confirmation of imminent action dates. Finally, subsequent players are allowed but be reasonable on the timing of subsequent player. While it's allowed to submit after denial, you should communicate with your RPM, and if you just had a player denied, think about some of the reasons why it may have been denied before you resubmit a player. For example, if you didn't address a CRL or facilities have issues, you should not expect that player to be granted if you didn't address that. It's always good to reach out to the RPM and have a conversation on a reasonable timing to submit a subsequent player. So for our challenge question today, when should a player not be submitted? A, no more than 60 days before goal date for ANDA subject to standard review. B, at least 30 days prior to proposed entry date of shipment. C, up to 120 days before goal date for ANDA subject to prior review. Or D, up to 80 days before goal date for ANDA subject to priority review. I think I heard C, that's correct up to 100 days before goal date. And this is actually um, the time frame for NDAs and BLAs, which we didn't, I didn't cover today. 
So in closing, remember the 30, 60, 80 rule when submitting a player. Work with your RPMs and follow the tips, making sure to submit amendments that are complete, responding to IRDRLs on time, making sure DMS and facilities are adequate, and this will allow your player to be granted and successfully import unapproved finished drug products to prepare for market launch. Thank you, and I'll hand it over to Tom for the next presentation. Thank you, Andrew and Andre, and your presentation on players. Hi, my name is Tom Ching, Regulatory Project Manager in the Division of Project Management in the uh, Office of Generic Drugs, and today I'll be presenting on information to include with a cover letter. The learning objectives for today are to explain the purpose of the cover letter as well as the cover letter attachment, examine the FDA-issued guidances related to cover letters, evaluate pertinent information to include with the cover letter based on the submission type, and to discuss available resources for applicants to draft an effective cover letter. So what is the purpose of a cover letter? It's to summarize the contents and identify the purpose of the submission, to highlight key elements of the submission, to provide required regulatory statements, such as the MMA verification statement, and ultimately is to help the FDA route and manage the submission effectively. This first guidance I'll be discussing is called the ANDA Submissions Content and Format. What's useful about this uh, guidance is it provides recommendations on forms and information to include in a cover letter. It also provides a suggested cover letter template for your use. Now, as you all know, a cover letter is included in Module 1 in the ECTD submission. This guidance provides cover letter header recommendations to clearly state if any major changes are made to please include it in the header. Um, these major changes can include anything from changes in strength, concentration, Rx to OTC changes, just to name a few. Applicants are encouraged to use this template that's in the uh, ANDA submissions content and format guidance. They can adapt their cover letter to meet their specific needs and the submission type. The second guidance called ANDA submissions amendments to ANDA's under GDUFA provides useful information on recommendations for content to include in a cover letter for ANDA amendments, such as a statement indicating whether the amendment's unsolicited or in response to an FDA assessment, um, or the amendment classification is major or minor, just to name a few. Cover letter components. So every cover letter should have the company letterhead, the submission type, date, heading, and reference, including the ANDA number, generic product name, and, st and strength, as well as the ECTD sequence number. Here's an example of a heading and reference with the relevant information, uh, including the ANDA number, ECTD sequence number, and the generic name and strength. The cover letter should have a statement of how documents were submitted in the file structure, a name, signature, and contact information of the person submitting the information, a responsible official or a U.S. agent for the submission, including their email address, and reference to, if any, relevant FDA action letters, emails, or correspondences. Very importantly, cover letters should have the MMA verification statement, a regulatory description of the submission, including the appropriate regulatory information hyper and hyperlinks to submitted information, a technical description of the submission, including the approximate size of the submission, and a statement that the submission was virus-free with a description of the software used to check for the virus. Now, um, now that we've discussed uh, cover letters, let's discuss the purpose of a cover letter, cover letter attachment. It serves as a guide or a checklist to prepare the cover letter it facilitates accurate processing of the submission, so it serves as a tool to optimize cover letter sufficiency, and this helps the RPM triage more effectively. It ensures that all relevant information outlined in the checklist is addressed in the cover letter, so this serves as a backup in case an applicant forgets to men mention any um, <clears throat> important or unsolicited information in their cover letter. And this also helps the FDA triage and manage submissions effectively. So not only does this help the RPM triage more effectively, it also helps the disciplines 
during their assessment to locate and incorporate needed information more effectively. And this guidance called Cover Letter Attachments for our Controlled Correspondence and Into Submissions contains a cover letter attachment template for controlled correspondences, originals, amendments, as well as supplements. Applicants can modify the cover letter attachment template to meet their submission needs. Now, it's important to note that this does not replace the cover letter. It's intended as an add-on to assist the FDA in identifying and routing submissions correctly. It's highly recommended to prevent delays in review time. An example of how a cover letter attachment can be used to prevent delays in review time is oftentimes requests for reconsiderations and facility-based requests for reclassifications are difficult to differentiate and will benefit with the use of a cover letter attachment as the applicant can just check off the appropriate box uh, on the checklist that's in the attachment to signify that the submission contains one or the other requests. <clears throat> Information that's commonly omitted in a cover letter. Again, you see the MMA verification statement. Priority requests on every resubmission, even after priority was previously granted. Unsolicited information, new or revised patent certification, litigation, or carve-out updates, facility-based major to minor reclassification requests, and what's important about these are that the uh, CGMP downgrade letter or withdrawn facility statement is necessary with the additional statement stating that the facility did not manufacture batches to conduct analyses to support the approval of the application. The major amendment information that are commonly omitted in cover letters include new batches and or studies, changes in manufacturing sites, reformulations, changes to DMF, as well as changes that would require an additional filing review. Another uh, commonly omitted information we've been encountering in cover letters and in submissions in general are the identifications of a combination product. Under Section 503 G8CV, sponsors are required to identify their products as combination products and seeking agency action with respect to that product. This can be identified in the cover letter attachment, but it must be identified in Field 24 of the 356H form. <clears throat> and this is because combination products are under uh, re re regulatory requirements, such as current GMP manufacturing practice requirements and post-marketing safety reporting requirements. So as a general review, what is a combination product? It is a product comprised of two or more different types of medical products. So a drug, or, drug with a device, drug biologic, device biologic, or all three together. And for a more exhaustive list of what constitutes a combination product, please see 21 CFR 3.2E. For any questions regarding this topic, please contact the Office of Combination Products. On to best practices. Please include all new or major change information in the heading and or reference, especially if combining submissions. In this example right here, uh, this is a major CR resubmission with uh, new strength information as well as new bio studies, clearly stated in the heading and reference to make it easily identifiable and easier for the FDA to triage. Now, although not required, it's highly recommended to include a cover letter attachment with your cover letter. Please highlight significant elements of your submission in the beginning of your cover letter. Highlight, bold, circle, uh, anything to make it prominent and easily identifiable. Same goes with lab labeling carve-outs. Please separate each item in its own paragraph and use keywords versus vague or lengthy descriptions, such as reformulation versus changes to composition of product. So we have one challenge question for you. What are the commonly omitted information that should be included in the cover letter? Please choose all that apply. New batches or studies, changes in manufacturing sites, mention of unsolicited information in the submission, and priority requests on all submissions if applicable. And the answer is actually all four of these. So in summary, a cover letter should be used to help the FDA identify the purpose and route the, the content of the submission. It should clearly state any significant changes to the application are in the heading and or reference, as well as the body of the cover letter. 
And a cover letter attachment should assist the FDA in identifying and routing submissions correctly as well, and is highly recommended to prevent delays in review time. And these are my resources for your reference. Thank you. Steve. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stephen Yang. I'm a regulatory business process manager from the Office of Program and Regulatory Operations, uh, OPRO. I'm in the Office of uh, Pharmaceutical Quality. And I'll be um, briefly just talking about uh, some best practices from a regulatory business process manager perspective in communications. Our objectives, um, three of them, are we're going to you know, discuss the form FDA 356H, um, the guidance for industry, some common errors, and some best practices. Also, we'll briefly touch on the withdrawal of approved ANDA supplements. And for communications, we'll discuss, uh, again, briefly, four-part harmony and quality-related information requests and deficiencies. So for the form FDA 356H, guidance for industry, common errors, and best practices. Uh, from guidance to industry, uh, we have the identification of manufacturing establishments in applications submitted to CEDAR and CEDAR questions and answers. Uh, this provides um, instructions on facility information to include in the form FDA 356H. It's not binding, um, so alternative approach can be used if it satisfies the requirements of the applicable statutes and regulations. And also we have the good ANDA submission practices guidelines for industry. Now, for resources, we have the abbreviated new drug application forms and submission requirements. Instructions to complete for completing the form FDA 356H and the form FDA 356H. Uh, these resources and guidances are all available on our FDA website. Now, for some um, common errors that uh, we as regulatory business process managers um, do see on the form FDA 356, and this is just you know a polling of of um, regulatory business process managers. Um, you know we do, we sometimes we do see the official responsible is no longer with the company. Uh, it's under, it's understandable uh, people you know tend to move uh, from location to location. So it's important that you update this information on your form FDA 356H. Also, incorrect phone numbers and or fax numbers. Again, uh, stating the importance of you know updating this form uh, whenever there's, there are changes um, to the phone number or fax number. Now, the next common error we do see sometimes are misspellings or inadvertent spaces on email addresses. This is kind of silly in some ways, but it does happen um, sometimes. And uh, so just you know, be extra careful when you're completing the information for your form FDA 356H that your email address is correct spelled properly and no spaces in between. Um, I've had on occasions where, you know, once or once or twice where um, when, um, when confirming if a information request um, communication was received by an applicant, um, it turns out it was never received and just upon, you know, careful inspection, I've noticed that there was a misspelling that was in the, the um, form FDA 356. So again, very common, so it's a, a silly um, error. However, it does cause some you know, unnecessary delays. Um, also, you know, please use that. Please um, don't use the outdated version of the form FDA 356. Uh, we do have a new one. Um, in addition, to some other uh, common errors that we do see: uh, incomplete establishment information. Uh, no DUNS numbers provided. Um, FEA numbers um, do not match what we have on record. And boxes in established information are not completed. Um, this just kind of takes time from uh, regulatory business process managers to you know, verify this information, just to make sure the information that you are supplying is correct and matches what we have. Again, uh, taking time from, um, from you know, doing more important parts of your application. Um, submission subtype and supplement category, if applicable, are not checked. Again, please check all boxes if appropriate. Um, all drug substance manufacturing facilities referenced in the drug master file are not included in the form FDA 356H. So it's, it's important to remember that if you are referencing a um, drug master file, 
that you should include the facilities, appropriate facilities that are responsible for um, um, product manufacturing and testing. So um, now I'm going to go to some best practices. And first, of course, you know, provide up-to-date contact information. It's a very important, you know, make sure you have the most up-to-date phone and fax numbers so that we can contact you in case we are in need of, of um, providing information to you or you providing information to us. Um, provide secure email address. Um, we do have to check. Uh, we do check email addresses if they are secure before we issue any letters to applicants. Um, if it's not secured, um, then we'll have to fax, fax, these, um, fax these letters, which means your fax numbers should also, you know, make sure your fax numbers are all up to date. Again, it just um, takes just a little bit more time to fax rather than email. Um, if you want to establish a secure email address, if you don't have, um, you can send requests to secureemail at fda.hhs.gov, and they'll get you set up with secure email. Also, use the most up-to-date FDA form 356H. And you can tell just by looking at the bottom of the form, it has the most, up, most recent edition, also in the case that the previous in, uh, editions are obsolete. I'll continue with best practices. Um, provide detailed explanation and reasons for submission section. Uh, in particular for supplements, you know, include all changes, not just the type of change. I have an example where, um, where an applicant uh, indicated you know, it was a CB30. However, just provide the location uh, in the application uh, so for us to kind of search and determine the reason. It'd be nice if, if that was already included in this section. Also, complete establishment um, information, complete the establishment information completely. Uh, make sure you check new if establishment is new um, for supplements. You know, check yes or no if an establishment is involved in the change. If it's left blank, it may be interpreted as no. So it's, it's nice to, you know, make sure you check all the boxes when appropriate. Uh, indicate if an establishment is active or withdrawn. So it goes, without, it goes without saying that, you know, checking all the necessary boxes leads to less confusion. And of course, less confusion just means that we're able to process your application in a much more timely manner. It's important to include all establishments for manufacturing and testing drug substance and drug product, but also include drug substance intermediate facilities. Uh, while, it's while it's obviously that the manufacturing sites for drug substance are included, Sometimes uh, the intermediate facilities are not. So it's important that you include that in your form FDA 356H. Include sterilization and micronization sites um, for your sterile products. Include facilities used for storing drug substances in process material and commercial drug product under quarantine prior to disposition, a disposition decision. Include facility information, information contained in the DMF properly incorporated by reference. So going back, um, you know, make sure if you're referencing the DMF, make sure you include the appropriate manufacturing and testing um, information in your 356H. Um, include facility withdrawals uh, submitted in DMF in a DMF amendment. Also, for best practice, include establishment information with each amendment and supplement uh, for combination products. Uh, include the facilities manufacturing and constituent part of the co-package or single entity combination product or drug device combination product. If you're adding a new facility, remove one, please include in the form FDA 356 submitted with the amendment. Also, include DMF research and development or testing sites that generate release data to support an ANDA. Excipient testers do not need to be included unless it's critical to the drug product performance. While equivalents and testing sites uh, do not need to be included, container closure manufacturing and testing sites uh, may not need to be included also. Also, um, please provide updated FEI number and DUNS information. And facilities, again, facilities associated with the DMF should be included in your 356H. If an approved facility is withdrawn before the application is approved, keep it in the 356H and check withdrawn. 
Um, also, for if the site is ready for inspection, please indicate the correct boxes in that just to let us know if your facilities is ready for inspection in any appropriate boxes. Now our first challenge question. The FDA will send an information request by email if the applicant's email address is unsecured, true or false? No, it's false. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's very important that you have a secure email address, um, and if you are in need of that, you can contact us and we can get you secure email address. Otherwise, um, we'll be, you know, we'll have to fax your information request letter. And again, that tends to take a little bit longer than actually getting the information by email, which is instantaneous. Now, my next topic, uh, briefly, we'll just touch on withdrawing approved AMDA supplements. Now, we have the guidance from industry changes to an approved NDA or ANDA, um, changes to um, guidance, I mean, uh, for submitting and post approved changes. changes. Um, applicants, um, when you're, you know, withdrawing an approved supplement, uh, you should, you should um, submit this withdrawal of the approved supplement as a supplement. Um, because, because, uh, because, you know, withdrawing an approved supplement is actually a change in a change, a change. So as such, um, you should refer to the guidance, um, as I mentioned earlier, changes to an approved NDA or ANDA for submitting post-approval changes in accordance with 21 CFR 314.70. And as a side note, um, you know, regulatory business process managers, um, we, we will be, you know, contacting uh, applicants if um, if if um, withdrawals of uh, approved uh, supplements are not submitted as a supplement. My next challenge question: Withdrawing an approved supplement is considered a post-approval change. True or false? So it's true. Exactly true. Um, again, refer to the guidance um, to the guidance for post approval changes for a NDA or ANDA. Now, the last uh, topic I like to discuss is four part harmony in deficiency communications. Um, just a little bit of a background. Um, this is a map. This, this pertains to a map five zero one six point eight revision one uh, using four-part harmony in quality-related assessment communications. Um, this map is intended to promote efficient and effective communication between assessment teams and applicants. Um, by clearly stating deficiencies and information requests with a rationale in such requests, help applicants address the issues successfully. Now, an applicant's lack of understanding of the issue may lead to a greater number of assessment cycles. So, you know, hopefully this is what this four-part harmony will address, uh, reducing the number of assessment cycles. Of course, continuing improvements on communications, uh, IRs and deficiencies are in progress. So, you know, this is a, this is a work in progress. However, it is agency-wide. So, you know, hopefully you'll be seeing um, communications and deficiencies and information requests following this four-part harmony. Um, incidentally, this came as a result of, um, of a PDUFA, PDUFA um, commitment, but now it is agency-wide. So elements of four-part harmony. Um, so the first element is what was provided. And this is just an acknowledgement of the information uh, submitted and provide reference to relevant modules, sections, pages, or tables. Element two is what is the issue? And that's identifying missing information or information that FDA considers inadequate. Three is what is needed. And that's requesting, requesting additional information or recommend an alternative approach to the addressed issue. And the last element, element four, is why is it needed? And this is to state the basis for the information request or deficiency and should include the impact of the issue on the overall regulatory decision and references to all or part of applicable regulations, statutes, guidances, and or FDA recognized consensus standards as appropriate. 
Now, I have an example of a four-part harmony in a quality um, related communication. Um, so basically, you know, for this example, we have for your drug product, we acknowledge the X month accelerated and Y month long-term stability data provided in section 3.2 P.83. This is considered element one. Uh, the provided stability data do not support the proposed shelf life because insufficient long-term data were provided to support extrapolation to two years. This is uh, element two. Uh, provide updated stability data or support your proposed shelf life, otherwise revise your proposed shelf life, element three. And for more information, see International Council for Harmonization for Guidance for Industry, Q1E Evaluation of Stability Data, June 2004, including appendix, which provides recommendations for evaluating data to estimate a drug product's shelf life. This is element uh, four. So again, as I mentioned, this is part of this example is actually in the map and it is available in the FDA's website. So after receiving deficiencies, these are some of the expectations uh, we have, and these are nothing new. Um, you know, number one, provide complete responses to all deficiency within the indicated time frame. Uh, include information or data that has been requested. And remember, unsolicited information will alter the goal date. Uh, if extension is needed for your response, please notify FDA as soon as you know the extension is needed. This allows us to discuss whether or not it is possible to provide such an extension. And of course, after receiving your action letters, CR letter, um, applicants can request a post-CR clarification meeting for clarif clarifying questions or for uh, applications which are scientific, in, which meet the scientific um, type of application, uh, a post-CR um, scientific meeting for scientification, I apologize for um, complex products. So my last challenge question. Which of the following is true regarding four-part um, regarding four-part harmony? Uh, a, it is intended to promote efficient and effective communication between assessment teams and applicants. Uh, B, what is the issue? Is an element of four-part harmony? Uh, C, clearing clearly stating deficiencies in information requests and including a rationale in such requests helps applicants address the issue successfully. And D, all are true. Well, it's D, all are true. And these are the references um, I've used for my presentation, and they're all available on the um, FDA website. Thank you, and I'm gonna turn it over to Brenda. A lot of these questions are so application specific that it's very difficult to answer these questions without the context of more information. But we are doing our very best to give you good direction, even if it is to come back with control correspondence or something like that. Okay, so let's start with our panel. And um, okay, you guys like me to beg, don't you? Okay. <laughs> In the house, one question, please. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so how long would you recommend that we leave a withdrawn facility on the 356H? Is it in per per perpetuity, or can it be removed after it's acknowledged or approved? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, if it's still, um, if the facility, I'm, Looking at um, if it if the approved facility is um, withdrawn before application is approved, then you still want to keep it. So, based uh, on that, can I ask a clarifying with that? Uh, so, like post approval, if a, if a facility is withdrawn, right, right, can it eventually be removed yes. from the 356H? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Second question in house, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, this question is for Ang. Uh, on 356H, 
uh, the form itself says it's an application for manufacturing a drug product and, and our NDA. So what is the logic in asking us to include the information of the intermediate manufacturers API and their testing facilities where we don't have any contact with them? Sorry, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> See, 356H form is for manufacturing, application for manufacturing a drug product, right. okay? And you are asking us to include the information of API manufacturers, contract test laboratories, as well as their key intermediate providers. What is the logic of this? Because the as an end applicant, I don't have a contract with any of those uh, facilities of the API manufacturer. Well, if you're referencing these, um, these, if we're, if we're referencing these um, man, these drug master, um, if you're referencing this drug master file, um, you're responsible for the facilities that are involved in that drug master file. Uh, if it's involved with you know manufacturing or testing of the product, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that you know you you should you should you know be aware of what facilities your master file, drug master file is using. Is it not the DMF holder's responsibility because you're reviewing the DMF as well? Well, but it's also your responsibility to know what the DMF um, provider is using for your facility. Okay. So can I ask another question? You asked me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so regarding the supplements like you know, CB0 or CB30, what is the expectation of the agency for us to hold the product before we distribute it when we file a 30 or CB0? Can you repeat that question again? CB0 or CB30, what is the agency expectation for us to hold back till we make a decision on the release of the product or not? So CB30, how many days do you want us to wait? Before. 30 days only or beyond that? If for, I'm sorry, for what? <laughs> the CBE 30, if you file, mm -hmm. how many days you want us to wait for a decision to be received from FDA? Is it 30 days or beyond 30 days? Um, hmm. Tony, would you like start to start the answer for this? If it's a CBE 30, yeah. it's baked into the definition. You're telling us that you're going to be making the change and you're going to be implementing that change at the end of that 30-day period. After that, then the gamble's on you. If you've done your homework correctly, you can go ahead. And of course, for the majority of the quality ones, we're actually seeing OPQ ahead of the 30-day response. So many times there won't even be ambiguity. But that's what the difference is between a PAS, a CBE 30, and a CBE 0. But we, we get an email that CB30 is granted, but no action letter comes. Even sometimes, you know, we receive after eight months, nine months. That approval of the CB30. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, we, we grant them within the 30 days. Yes. Um, but as Ted mentioned, it's, it's upon you to make sure that, you know, you follow whatever regulation. and. And yeah, I understand you're saying you don't get the approval for later on um, because there's no uh, goal date for, for a CBE. Um, but again, it, it's upon you to make sure that, you know, even though we're granting it, to make sure, you know, it's going to be, you know, everything's okay with the application. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, online question, please. Right. First question is for Ted. Our experience is that FDA is using the late cycle amendment provision of the GDUFA 3 commitment letter and moving the goal date 90 days from the submission date of the response amendment, even for minor questions when approval is received by the original goal date. Can you please explain the decision making for FDA as to whether to apply imminent action versus moving the goal date for late cycle amendments? Or will goal dates always be moved for late cycle amendments? I don't know how many questions were in that one question. <laughs> That's okay, I can go ahead and start. And if I miss something, then please chime in. Uh, first of all, not every late cycle amendment results in 
in extension. And we talked earlier about the imminent actions, right? That's a great example. We're using that 60 day period. There's a whole nother type that we didn't have time to discuss today. And that's where we do late cycle, but we still honor the original date. And so there's a whole host of issues that come into play, including what we think your response time will be, how much effort it will take us to respond, the criticality of the product, if it's a drug shortage or public health, then obviously we're gonna to try to do everything we can to fast track that. And so those are all the variables that have to be factored in. And then each discipline is sort of responsible for making their decision on when to go for the formal extension, the imminent action, or do it within the goal date. And of course, alternatively, and this is one, don't forget, we could issue the CRL, and for those who've been around a long time, in the old days, that was the only choice. If you missed dotting the I, we had to issue the formal complete response or the not approval letter for those who go back a long time. And so we implemented these changes to help keep the momentum of the review team in place and try to minimize some of the more bureaucratic effort that goes into making sure that the complete response letter is very formal, it's an official document versus the informal IRs and DRLs. And so really, it's a successful program. I know that sometimes companies struggle with not knowing what type of change is gonna be resulting in an extension or an imminent action. Work with your project managers. In certain cases, you may have to talk to the discipline project manager, but always start with the regulatory project manager and he or she will direct you accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Let's go in-house with the mic closer to me here. Great, thanks. A uh, question related to the scope of the, the players. In the, um, in the presentation, supplements were specifically uh, excluded from the player process, which conceptually I get for the vast majority of supplements, but I guess where, where I, I don't necessarily understand whether it's a P FDA policy decision or there's something in the statute that prohibits it is, why are new strength supplements also prohibited from the player process? Thank you. Let's go to the mic at the far end of the room, please. Um, so I have a question regarding supplements. Uh, in case where we can't decide if uh, the change is CB0 or CB30, can we have like a formal discussion with FDA, uh, the PM? Or do you suggest that we just go ahead and file the supplement and wait for a response? Can you repeat the beginning part? It was hard to hear your initial statement. So in cases where we are unable to decide if the if the manufacturing change for an approved and uh, would be a CB30 or a CB0, uh, in that case, do you suggest that we go ahead and submit the supplement or we have a formal discussion with the PM? Well, I mean, you may have discussion if you like, you mean we're always available. Um, if you submit it as a you know CB zero, and our reviewers you know deem that it is not, then you know we'll contact you and notify you that you know it is you know it is being elevated to a to a CB thirty or a PAS. Mm -hmm. So you know regardless, if you submit it as a particular supplement, and our our reviewers you know feel that it is not in that category. Uh, we will notify you of the change. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask another question? I, I think Ted had some, Ted, were you going to add to that? Ted, were you going to add this, to, no? Uh, I can add one more comment. The, the starting point too is look at the Code of Federal Regulations 314.70 where they give you some examples of what would qualify for all three types of supplements, but they do call out the difference between a CBE zero and a CBE 30. And then there's also some series of actual guidances too that get into other examples. So use those as a starting point before contacting the team. But certainly, as Stephen said, the team will be glad to work with you to help get you into the right path. And if you submit it incorrectly, then there are mechanisms in place to reroute that as the correct type of submission. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. If you have another question, let's go to the online first. You can stay there. Uh, online, please. Okay, a question for either Andre or Andrew. Will a player be denied if submitted less than 30 days from shipment date, even though the goal date is within the 60-day allowable timeline? No, the, the player won't be denied, but that was a recommendation to submit it no less than 30 days. Okay, thank you, Mike. Closer to me, in-house. Hi. <clears throat> so regarding the cover letter attachments, is there a threshold where you would expect this to be used? We've previously only used something like this on, on larger PAS or <clears throat> new applications. So it was a little bit of a surprise to hear that you recommend it. It sounded like for almost everything. Yes, for the cover letter, letter attachments, we recommend to uh, use it for all submissions, all amendments. Even annual reports and such? No, not with annual reports. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mike Chu. Um, this question is regarding 356 edge forms. So in case where uh, we're no longer using an API manufacturer, uh, can we remove this from our 356 edge form if it's a pending ANDA? Can you repeat that question, please? So if you're using, uh, for a pending ANDA, we're no longer using an API manufacturer, uh, can we remove it from a 356 edge form? And we already have another API manufacturer which we're using. I'm sorry, I still could. She's asking if it's, if they're pulling a facility off, do they have to keep a listing on 356 H? If there's another replacement facility in place? Um, you should include that you're withdrawing that facility on your 356, even though you're adding an addition, you're adding an additional facility in its in its place. So we need to formally uh, write a, in a cover letter saying that we're withdrawing the API manufacturer, and then we can submit that in the 356 H form. Yeah, you should include okay. you should include you should include an amendment. Okay, thank you. Okay, online question, please. Question for Stephen. When should we contact the RBPM versus the RPM? Um, well, the um, for original applications, um, the RPM is the um, the owner of that project, so so um, they are always the the first point of contact. But for any quality information, um, you can always contact the RBPM, and also for supplements which are uh, managed by. Um, um, by RBPMs, you can always contact us. Thank you. Mike, at the far end, please. Hi. I have a question regarding the plier process. Can you, can you come a little closer to the mic, please? Okay. This question is regarding the plier process. So following the grant of a plier decision, if a CR is issued and it gets classified as a major, either at the time of issuance of the CR itself, it gets classified as a major, or following the submission of the response agency, uh, like reclassifies it as a major, then what happens to the product that is already uh, like, you know, shipped in? Because the goal date would be an eight month, it's not a priority application, then do we have to destroy the product? <clears throat> if um, if had, if six months have passed and your product is not approved, then it will have to be either destroyed or exported. The, if we, you if know, we get those... an eight month, sorry, mm -hmm. if we get an eight month goal date, is there a provision for us to like reach out to to you and you know see if some exception could be made, considering that? So um, the the import process is very tied to the import bonds with the custom and border patrol, so um, you know there, there's no exceptions to that. So that basically means that it's truly a risk importing the product unless you know that grant decision is based following adequate review status and not just anticipated. Uh, like Correct. That, that's what you know. Ted, um, um, mentioned, I think it was Kim mentioned that it's very important that you maintain communications with your with your RPM because you don't want to take that risk, right? Yes, uh, because a lot of times uh, of late we kind of hear that you know the review discipline is not yet closed out, so the project managers cannot really give you a firm uh, status, and they just say that you know at this point of time no major 
uh, issues are identified. So based on that, a grand decision is made. But then later we see that you know there are questions that get reclassified as major. Do, do you have anything to add? I would say, you know, as I mentioned earlier before, you know, recently we were trying to kind of juggle that kind of stance that you were saying um, in terms of allowing for more maximal, you know, granting of players while at the same time understanding that, you know, while we do grant more players, you know, there is potentially situations like you mentioned where, you know, we could potentially grant the player but may not be approved in time. So I think kind of what Andre was saying, I think, your best bet is to kind of communicate with the RPM, understanding the timeframes that we've set out. And, you know, in the, I haven't seen that many cases in those cases of a major. I mean, I think more, more than likely for minors, I mean, that rarely happens where you're kind of stuck in that situation. Um, but I would say that kind of stick with that time frame. And my best advice would be to kind of talk to the RPMs and make sure to understand those time frames before you kind of you know, submit that player and then um, that you don't have to, you know, fall into that, that situation. Thank you. Online question, please. All right, question for Ted. Are you tracking the percentage of original and uh, submissions that are first cycle approvals? And if so, where can this information be found? All right, so the question has to do with first cycle approvals. The actual, there's two sources of information. If you go to the standard OGD, which is monthly and now quarterly report, we will list the information. And then there is a specific subsection of the FDA track that goes into more data on first cycles. Next online question. Sure. A question oh. for... Oh. Go ahead. In-house? In in Sorry. Let's do the in-house. Sure. So I have one question for Ed. Uh, Ted, Can you step uh, up to the microphone? I have one question for Ted on the median approval times. I think slide number 14 of your presentation talks about the median... Uh, this is regarding the presentation that you made on the median approval times. Slide number 14 refers to the percentage of... Uh, like, approvals with different median approval times. Is that the number of approvals that have happened based on the year of receipt, or is it 50% of the applications received in a certain year are approved? How do we interpret that percentage? All right, hopefully I'm, I'm hearing this right. It's, it's very hard to hear up here, so I apologize if I'm not answering the right question. If you're looking to find out where we get the mean and median data, we're looking at the approval actions for that quarter and, and taking all of those. And, and that's why it, it fluctuates so much from quarter to quarter. Not the quarter one, but there was one more slide about based on the year of receipt. I think from 2010 onwards, you have given what's the percentage okay. of median approval times. For that slide in 2022 also, I see there's something listed for 50% as uh, like maybe 15 months as the median approval time. So is that the number of applications that got approved? in that fiscal year versus the uh, year of receipt? If you're asking about the sort of set of three approval charts all in a mm -hmm. row with, with different sort of extrapolations, right. that's tracking from the cohort of receipt of the original application. So if our first exposure, then we start to look, how long did it take us to approve sort of the fastest 5, 10, 25, 50%? And so it's by cohort of receipts. So you can look at the raw submissions for the year. That's what we're doing. OK. Thank you. OK, thank you. Online question, please. Question for Andre. If importation of drug product is planned in two separate shipments, is one player enough for both, or should we submit two players? You only get one shipment. So it's only one player per application. Next online question, please. Sure. Another question for Andre, actually. Uh, please confirm if players are only indicated for medications for which the product is manufactured outside of the United States. It's for finished dosage form drug products pending approval of the application from a foreign uh, manufacturing facility. 
Do we have any more online questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question for Andrew this time about player. If a player can be granted before the ANTA is approved, it could happen that the product is already imported, but not in the final labeling, as this review is potentially not completed by the labeling division. How can this be managed? I understand that I have to repack the goods with the approved labeling, or is there any uh, derogation that applies to goods imported under player? So um, as I discussed uh, pre uh, during the presentation, uh, we allowed for product to be minimally uh, further process that will include uh, labeling, changes to labeling, right? And that will all have to occur uh, within that six month period where the product has been imported and receiving actual final approval. Thank you, online question? Okay. Either for Andrew or Andre, what teams are consulted before a player is granted or rejected? So as I mentioned earlier, um, when a player is, before a player is granted, um, the deputy director will consult um, with the regulatory project manager as well as the discipline project managers who also um, speak with the individual discipline review assessment teams to kind of make that determination whether a player should be granted or denied. Thank you. Let's go to our in-house question. Yeah, question for uh, Ted. Uh, this is regarding uh, uh, the goal date, the Gadufa goal date. Uh, before the goal date, project manager updates that all the disciplines are complete and adequate. Uh, then uh, there's a question about RLD labeling update, and they ask us to update the labeling. And we update the RLD labeling, and the goal date is immediately pushed by another three months. So is there a mechanism to redress and to reconsider uh, this push? All right, if I'm understanding the question, what we're seeing is an application that's sort of maturing its way through the cycle, and then we're getting a late reference listed drug, the new drug, updating its label. Correct. So what we normally see in those situations is the applicant's responsibility, obviously, to make sure that the application has the most recent new drug approved sort of replicate labeling. Obviously, there's permissible differences, but you're responsible for matching the RLD. So the vast majority of time, you're going to be sending us an unsolicited amendment to do that update. They classified it as a solicited amendment, not unsolicited. Even if, even if we ask you, which we will do if people are slow to pick up on it. The, the burden is always on the applicant to have the right one. Now, our labeling team does shift in the proactive mode and they will reach out and remind people that there was a recent update and you need to get your labeling in. The vast majority of time that it's gonna result in an extension, there's very limited circumstance where we're allowed to approve an application where the generic drug label is different than the brand. There, there is a little bit of wiggle room. You can go into the regs. It's called the J10 provision, uh, but it's something that's historically seldom been used just because of all the different pieces have to be in place before the agency is empowered to make that change. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have a second question in-house, please. Hi, thank you all for your presentations. They were very helpful. I have a question regarding one of our NDAs recently. The goal date was missed, and the reason was given that there are some complex regulatory questions or issues that are being worked at, and we will be informed later. It's been almost a month since then. We haven't heard anything, so what, what do we do? We keep on reaching out to RPM, or agency will tell us something at some point. How does this work? Certainly, if you're in a space where you're past the goal date and you've been communicating with regulatory project management, it, and you're sort of left with there's a oftentimes you'll hear complex or like to also call it thorny regulatory issue that has to be untangled before the agency is able to take an action. Uh, you can communicate with regulatory project manager 
always that's your best place to start. If it's something that seems to be languishing with the agency for an extended period of time, then you can talk to the regulatory project manager and they can help you sort of navigate internally escalating those. And we do have mechanisms where people more senior in the organization, myself included, will have frequent communications with the company and explain what we can. Oftentimes in that situation, there's very little that the project manager is allowed to say. It could be a case where there's something that has to potentially be changed with the reference listed drug. And so we have to resolve that issue first and, and then of course, there's confidentiality issues. We can't disclose it until the reference listed drug owner understands it and has made the change and updated the label or whatever the appropriate fix may be. And then that goes into the other part of the equation because it's outside of the immediate control of sort of the OGD OPQ team, then the timing gets a little bit more nebulous. And that's why they're not able to say on June 1st, we want to be very cautious with giving people a date past the goal date. We're only going to give a date if we're 99.9% .9 sure that it can be met because we know how important that is for folks. And we also know how complex things are on the agency where one meeting may lead to another meeting, which may lead to another. And so it's not uncommon, unfortunately, that we do get into those places. So if you've talked to the regulatory project manager a couple times and you still need traction or your management is coming down on you to show that you're elevating it, talk to them and tell them that you would like to. They are not going to be offended. We don't have a lot of these cases. We miss a small percent, but certainly in a program as big as this is, there's always several misses at any given time. They're experienced, they're used to navigating in this space. They will not be offended if you ask to elevate it. We will always work with you. And then if you think that you're not getting the traction that you want, another source is you can go outside of the generic drug program to the Cedar Ombudswoman. She's very good. She'll be the detective, go in and, and sort of sort out the root cause analysis. If we've done our job right on the OGD OPQ side of things, then she may come back with almost identical answer because that's as much as we're legally allowed to say. But she will give you an independent assessment of the issue and whether or not the program is in fact doing everything in its power to move your application forward. Thank, Thank you, you so much. We have time for one last question online. Okay. Question for the panel. For applications granted a priority review designation, should applicants include a request for priority review on all responses to discipline review letters and information requests? Uh, a priority request should be included in uh, each resubmission if uh, an applicant is looking for a priority review. Um, with three exceptions, drug shortages, public emergency drugs, and pet for drugs. Thank you. So that's the end of our question and answer session. But before we adjourn, I've got a couple of reminders. You, we will issue that email this afternoon to all our t attendees. It will have the claim, CE Healthcare Professional CE claim code, and the survey link. Please continue to do the survey for us. We take your feedback very seriously. We, that informs us as to how we design the next year's event. Do your healthcare professional CE as soon as you get it so you don't forget because we can't help you if you missed a two week um, deadline. We also have the five, well, 4.45 uh, happy hour. No, it's not a happy hour. It's a networking downstairs at the lobby. <laughs> And um, if you don't get that email, give us until tomorrow, Eastern time. If you do not get that email with the codes, please contact us, SBIA, that's CEDARSBIA at FDA.HHS.gov, sooner than later. Don't wait until the 15th today to contact us, please, because that won't help. All right, uh, tomorrow. 8.30 a.m., bright and early. See you there. Thank you very much for your attention and your engagement. I, I think we finally woke you up in the room. Online people, thank you so much for all these questions. Remember, if your questions are not answered, they are definitely being taken into consideration. It helps inform us of the gap where we're missing that connection with industry, where we need to step up a little bit and make you know better outreach and in guidances and things like that. So thank you to all our panelists who stayed for the last and see you tomorrow.